The old married couple is hiding, terrified, under their bed, and a hand reaches underneath, grabbing for them. In the intruder's other hand, the silvery glint of a knife. It looks like this is curtains for them. It's just a little bit after 8 p.m., and the old woman has just finished brewing a pot of fresh coffee, filling the kitchen with its warm, rich aroma. Most people associate coffee with mornings, with breakfast and newspaper, a hurried bite of toast on the way out the door to work or school. But she prefers to prepare her coffee in the evenings, just as darkness and quiet have settled over her neighborhood and wrapped the house in a cozy blanket of night. She pours two cups, watching the steam curl up into the air, and carries them into the living room, where her husband is waiting for her on the couch. It's a familiar ritual, one they've repeated most nights together since their daughter left for college so many years ago. It may seem simple, but it's part of a collage of little, simple things that make their house into a home. Home has meant a lot of different things to the two of them over the years. Nervousness and possibility when they first married and bought the house, Chaos and joy when their daughter was born, ripping through the structure of their lives like a tiny, lovable tornado. And now, contentment, peace, safety. Throughout it all, home has been a sanctuary, and as they sit together on the couch, flipping through the TV channels and sipping their twin cups of coffee, it never crosses their minds for a moment that this sanctuary might be invaded. They certainly don't look over their shoulders at the dark shadow in the window, the silhouette of someone standing there between the bushes, watching them, waiting. The couple doesn't even have an inkling that something is wrong until they hear a soft rattling sound coming from the front door. Is someone there? When they turn, they don't see anyone outside, can't see who might have been jiggling the knob. How strange, they must have heard wrong, or whoever was there must have realized they had the wrong place. They turn their attention back to the TV, back to their coffee. They don't see the same shadowy figure scuttle up the wall outside, creeping up onto the roof. They hear it, though. The uneasy thump of something heavy settling onto the tiles up there. Someone walking where they shouldn't. The couple freezes, staring up at the ceiling, listening to be certain they didn't miss here. There it is again. The unmistakable drag of footsteps. The husband sets his coffee cup down, his face settling into a determined grimace. He has a baseball bat in the hall closet now seems like a good time to grab it. His wife isn't about to let him handle the situation by himself. She grabs the half-full coffee pot from the kitchen, still piping hot. It isn't much, but she hopes it will be able to do some damage in a pinch. They're both so preoccupied with arming themselves for the potential confrontation that they don't notice that the footsteps on the roof have gone silent. They don't stop to ask themselves a very important question, one that the citizens of this famously safe neighborhood rarely ever do. Did they lock the back door? The unasked question gets its answer in the form of a slow, nauseating creak of a door inching open, letting in the cool night air and a stranger in a black hood. The couple reconvene in their living room with their makeshift weapons, in time to watch the shadowy figure stalk in front of the kitchen, their wide eyes locking on the menacing glint of the kitchen knife in the intruder's hand. The intruder lurches toward the wife, and in a flurry of panic, she throws the coffee pot, splashing hot liquid all over the stranger and knocking them in the head with the pot. They don't do so much as flinch, continuing to advance toward the couple, brandishing the knife. The man raises the bat, preparing to swing it as hard as he can, but just as he's about to, he falters. The bat drops from his hands, clattering to the floor. He gapes at the stranger in utter horror, as if he's just seen his worst nightmare realized. He stands there, frozen to the spot, eyes filling with tears, as the stranger pulls back their arm, knife's point trained on his chest. His wife leaps into action, grabbing his arm and yanking him back. She wants to ask him what on earth made him stop cold like that, but she'll have to wait until they're both safe again. In all the commotion, the intruder managed to place themselves between the couple and the front door, so the wife looks for a better option. The closest way out of immediate danger is up the stairs, so she tugs her husband's arm so hard she worries it might dislocate and leads them both up to their bedroom. She slams the door shut behind them, locking it, and jams a chair up under the handle for good measure. With a moment to catch her breath, she turns to her husband and asks what he saw that shook him so deeply. He shakes his head, struggling to speak. He manages to get the words out. The attacker, the person who broke into their house and came at them with a knife, is someone they know. Not a neighbor, not a disgruntled co-worker, 
but their own flesh and blood. It's their daughter. At first, she doesn't believe him. That can't possibly be true. But the look in his eyes convinces her that he's telling the truth. She doesn't have a chance to ask any of the questions she wants to, because the doorknob begins to rattle. With nowhere else to run save for a window that's much too high to jump from, they have no other choice but to hide. The wife quickly opens the window, hoping to convince the intruder, her daughter, that they decided to risk the fall and jump. Then she and her husband slide under the bed and hold their breath. For a seemingly endless moment, the only sound is the rattle of the doorknob and the pounding of their pulses in their ears. Then, with a sudden burst of shocking, seemingly impossible strength, the intruder splinters the door into pieces. They watch helplessly, covering their mouths to keep from making a sound as a pair of black boots walk into the room, stalking through it, searching for them. The footsteps make their way over to the window as the intruder notices that it's open. Did it work? Are they safe? It's beginning to look like they just might be. But then a hand reaches beneath the bed, grabbing the husband by his shirt and yanking him out from under the bed. He screams as the intruder raises the knife, and a spray of blood stains the wallpaper red as the knife finds its target. The wife scrambles out from under the bed, making a break for the window, ready to risk the fall if it means survival. But a hand grips her shoulder, hard enough to bruise, and drags her back into the room. The only thing she sees is the knife, slick with her husband's blood, and, beneath the black hood of a cloak, the expressionless face of her own daughter. By the time the police arrive on the scene, the killer is long gone. All they find is a terrible scene, a broken door, two bodies, and danger invading a peaceful town. This isn't the first call they've gotten about a home invasion this month either. All over town, five different families have been terrorized and murdered, and every time, the perpetrator escapes the scene before the authorities can arrive. This is the sixth, just the latest in the line of horrible mysteries. Meanwhile, a woman walks down a side street, casually stripping off her bloodied cloak and tossing it into a dumpster. Beneath it, she is dressed in plain black clothes with one curious accessory, an iron collar. She stops suddenly, just outside of a dilapidated old house. In the practiced manner of someone who has been there before, she walks around to the side of the house, then tugs open the rusted storm cellar door. She climbs down into the darkness and disappears inside. Once the woman has entered the basement, she is met with the glow of flickering candles dripping red wax onto the floor. Their eerie light illuminates the dusty room and the menacing sights within. There are six people waiting for her there, standing in a circle, all wearing dark robes. Five of them have matching collars around their necks, the same as hers. At the center of the circle, standing before a pile of bloody knives, is a man holding a rectangular remote control. His face is friendly, plain, almost aggressively ordinary, but his eyes are dark and cold, ringed with dark circles from an untold number of sleepless nights. The floor is smeared with arcane symbols painted in blood, littered with the bones of animals. The whole room reeks of iron and rotting flesh. Still, the woman does not react, her eyes as dispassionate as they were when she butchered her parents only a little while ago. As the man with the remote control, the leader, presses a series of buttons, the woman takes her place in the circle, tossing her freshly bloodied knife onto the pile. He smiles at her, a broad, warm, beatific smile, like an owner celebrating their new puppy performing a trick for the very first time. He congratulates her on a job well done, then hits another button on the remote placing her in a static position, arms at her sides. He addresses his group of acolytes, holding his arms up to command the attention of the room. Not that he needs to do much to command their attention. Their eyes are trained on him, unblinking. Their expressions vary, however. Some look unfazed, like the woman who entered the room most recently. Others stare at him in awe, some with an undercurrent of fear, and others gaze at him with pure, naked hatred. Still, they do not move. It is, the leader announces, time for the next phase of their transition into their new lives. Now that they have all eliminated their families and nothing ties them to their lives before they found him, they are prepared to sever all connection to their former selves. They've quit their jobs, abandoned their relationships, and eliminated their blood ties. And now it is time for them to shed their previous physical forms. It is time to evolve. 
He points to one of the more eager acolytes, calling them forward. It's a young man, no more than 21, a college student most likely. He should be holed up in a library, cramming for his midterm exams. Instead, he's here, in this blood-streaked basement, eagerly approaching the man with the remote and kneeling at his feet. The man doesn't even need to control this one's movements with the remote anymore, but still he raises it and presses a new series of buttons, one the acolytes have never seen him use before. All of a sudden, the young man's back arches at a disturbingly sharp angle, an angle that should be impossible without snapping his spine. His eyes roll back in his head until only the whites are showing. His lips curl back from his teeth in an expression caught somewhere between a snarl, a smile, and a scream. The leader hits another button, and the young man's eyes begin to widen. It isn't just that his eyelids are opening further to reveal more of his eyes, but the sockets themselves are widening, the eyeballs expanding to fill the additional space. His arms begin to stretch at the same time, forearms extending longer and longer until his arms are as long as his legs. His fingers extend in the same way, growing additional knuckles as they do, bending in so many more places than ordinary human fingers should. As the acolytes watch the transformation, the woman who killed her parents earlier tonight becomes aware of a sudden sensation, one she hasn't felt in months. At her sides, her fingers begin to twitch. She swallows a lump in her throat. Her eyes sting with tears. She can move on her own again, and she is terrified. The reality of what she has done crashes over her in a wave of grief, regret, and rage. He made her do it, but now, with the power of the remote focused on reshaping the young man in the center of the circle, she is tasting a moment of freedom. The leader hasn't noticed yet. She just has to decide what to do with it. As the leader punches another button, twisting the young acolyte's feet around until they point backward, tendons popping and bones snapping loud enough to fill the room with a cacophony of horror, the woman's eyes settle on the remote in the leader's hand. That damned thing. It's the cause of all of this. It's the reason she's standing here. And the two people she loved more than anything in the world are lying dead on their bedroom floor. It and him. The leader. She doesn't even know his name. But she does know one thing for certain. She's going to kill him tonight. With the feral determination of someone with nothing left to live for, the woman leaps at the leader, knocking him to the ground and knocking the remote out of his hand. He roars with rage at this interruption, at this show of defiance from one of his acolytes, and scrambles to grab it off of the ground. But she gets there first. She doesn't know how to operate it, but she presses buttons at random, hoping to free the others. All around the circle, the acolyte's limbs begin to jerk wildly, their feet moving of their own volition. Some of them are screaming, some laughing, some weeping. The transformed young man on the floor hisses and grabs at the woman, clawing at her hand and trying to rip the remote from her grasp. As she smashes as many buttons as she can, the leader picks up one of the knives from the floor and charges at her, the room plunging into a chaotic blur of violence and fear. When the police burst into the house the next day, when they discover the secrets in the basement, everyone in it is dead. The unusual circumstances of the case attract the attention of the SCP Foundation, who take over the investigation and bring the strange items at the scene into custody, giving them the official designation SCP-010. SCP-010 consists of six visually identical cast iron collars, each equipped with a numbered metal tag, as well as one remote control that appears to go with all of the collars. The collars have been designated SCP-010-2 through 010-7. Each collar contains intricate electronic components and is powered by small rechargeable 100-volt batteries. The remote is a heavy black box that resembles an old-fashioned handheld radio transmitter receiver with a primitive blue-white cathode ray screen and over 100 buttons, in addition to a frequency tuner. These buttons are all unlabeled. Through a great deal of trial and error, the Foundation research team was able to identify the frequencies of all six collars. The metal is stamped with a label in Russian, as well as a logo that resembles workers building a pyramid. If one of the collars is placed around a person's neck and secured, and the remote is tuned to the corresponding frequency, the user will be able to use the remote to control their every movement. In addition to their movements, the remote can also control their adrenal response, as well as the sympathetic nervous system, which helps to activate the body's fight-or-flight response to stress. 
the remote is able to activate or deactivate this system, causing the person to experience extreme stress or preventing them from experiencing this response even when the stimulus they are exposed to would normally cause it. The most unusual and unexpected feature of these already unusual collars is their ability to affect the physical morphology of the person wearing them. The extent of these potential changes has yet to be measured, but seems as if it would be nearly limitless for someone with complete command of the remote's programming language. SCP-010 was first discovered in the basement of a man in the Midwestern United States after being connected to a local missing persons case. When the police raided his house, they found the bodies of several missing persons, as well as the man himself. They also found signs of a struggle and SCP-010's remote and collars. After the SCP Foundation got their hands on SCP-010, they conducted an experiment in the hope of better understanding its functionality. Researchers took SCP-010-2 apart piece by piece, labeling each component and photographing it. After it was reassembled, SCP-010-2 resumed functioning as normal. With a new understanding of the parts that make up these collars, the researchers attempted to build one of their own from scratch, creating the closest approximations possible of its components. Some were impossible to replicate, but the team did their best. In spite of their efforts, the new collar, SCP-010-8, did not function. However, when the unreplicable components of SCP-010-2 were removed and placed into SCP-010-8, it began to function as intended. Of course, this came at the cost of SCP-010-2's functionality, and it would not work again until its components were returned. For the next test, the replicable components in SCP-010-2 were replaced with replicas at random. When activated, SCP-010 was still able to function, and the swapping of replicable components did not affect functionality at all. All SCP-010 objects must be kept in numbered locked boxes at Site-19. They may not be worn by anyone except approved test subjects, and may only be removed from storage for testing. Any unauthorized use of SCP-010 is grounds for termination. When I most recently checked, one addendum had been added to the official file for SCP-010. An anonymous Foundation doctor wrote, SCP-010 has been demonstrated to work more effectively in creating unskilled labor than for any other task. The logo is apt. No further explanation of what that unskilled labor might be was included, and if there is one to be found, I don't have the clearance to access it. As far as anomalies go, I find SCP-010 to be uniquely disquieting. Free will is one of the most sacred things we have. It's the very essence of our humanity. Our ability to make our own choices, to govern our lives, to have ownership of our bodies and minds, this is something that should never be stripped away. I can't think of a greater violation than to be forced into one of these collars. My only comfort, and there is very little to be had as long as SCP-010 exists, is that there are only a few of these collars out there, and whatever makes the collars work, the Foundation currently has no way to recreate it. Though I'm sure this is frustrating for their researchers, I will personally sleep a little easier at night knowing they can't build as many of these collars as they want, creating an infinite army of powerless slaves. At least, they can't yet. The boy and his father have spent the entire morning cleaning out the basement of the boy's grandfather, and the boy is absolutely exhausted. After yet another trip up those rickety cellar steps, the boy collapses onto the old living room couch. He can still hear his father puttering around downstairs, yelping and gasping in surprise every time he finds some memento of his childhood stashed among the debris. The boy sighs in annoyance. He doesn't really know his grandfather, so he doesn't feel any sense of loss as they tear through the boxes and bags in the basement. His father, however, insisted that the boy come along. It'll be good for us to spend some time together, he said, and the boy suspects that his father is trying to deal with his own guilt about his strained relationship with the boy's grandfather. Perhaps he hopes that a day of father-son bonding is just what they need to make sure that they don't grow apart as his father did with his grandfather. The boy, however, doesn't think that cleaning out a musty old basement should qualify as effective father-son bonding. It's super boring. Worse, it turns out that the boy's deceased grandfather was an absolute hoarder who couldn't throw anything away, so the house is filled with all sorts of worthless garbage. The boy groans, his feet ache from traipsing all those stairs, and his back aches from carrying boxes. He thinks that he deserves a little break. He pulls a small handheld gaming console from the pocket of his hoodie and turns it on. I'll just play for a couple minutes, he thinks to himself, then I'll go and help Dad some more. 
You won't mind if I take a short break to recover. The boy is sitting on the battered couch in the living room, playing the latest game on his handheld game console, when his father lurches into the room, carrying a gigantic white plastic box in his arms. Check it out, sport, says his dad, a wide grin on his face. Look what I just found in the basement. The boy briefly looks up from his game, resisting the temptation to roll his eyes at his father's annoying enthusiasm. His father is always getting excited for the dumbest things. As for that white box, the boy's never seen anything like it. It's a Sega Dreamcast, the father says as he sets the white box on the living room floor and starts to untangle the massive wires protruding from the back of the object. This was my favorite video game system when I was a kid. I guess your grandfather just couldn't throw it away. What else is new? mutters the boy under his breath. Buddy bites his tongue as he watches his father studiously pick apart the knots in the tangled wires. Obviously, this hunk of junk has big sentimental value for his dad. Reluctantly, he slides off the couch and takes a seat next to his father on the floor, and together, the two of them set up the Dreamcast. This had all the best games, continues his father. Soul Calibur, Sega vs. Capcom, oh, you're gonna love these. After a few minutes, his father has the wires plugged into the television and the hand controller's ready. He nudges his son in the side with his elbow. What do you say, champ? You ready to go mano a mano against your old man with some real video games? I'm about to school you in what real games are like, none of this silly, what's it called, Among Us junk like you played today. It's not called Among Us, Dad, mutters the boy under his breath, but his father is already distracted pulling out old games. His father holds up a CD clamshell and pries it open, revealing a stack of silvery discs. And look at this, all my old games too. The boy tries to contain his boredom as his father rattles off a list of his favorite old video games, none of which are familiar to the boy. But eventually, his father reaches one disc that isn't familiar. Eurythmics? He says, squinting at the title embossed across the disc. I don't remember this one. I wonder if your grandfather got it after I moved out. The father pauses as if overcome with emotion. The boy can imagine what his father is thinking. Did his grandfather buy this disc knowing how much his father loved his Dreamcast video games and hoping that maybe it could serve as a reconciliation present between them? That's exactly the sort of dopey, sentimental thing that his dad would think after spending all morning going through his grandfather's junk and reminiscing about what could have been. Uh, it looks like it's some sort of dance game? Prompts the boy, hoping to get his father to focus more on the game than his feelings of nostalgia and loss. Oh, right, right, says the father. I wonder why Grandpa had this when he didn't have a dance mat to connect. Maybe you just have to hit the control buttons in rhythm? Hmm. He holds it up, the reflective disc shining brightly in the light of the overhead lamp, and the boy stares at the silvery disc in confusion. He's seen pictures of CD-ROM discs before, in old catalogs or even movies, but he's never seen one in real life. Who even uses discs like that anymore? Everything's just downloadable from the internet these days. What is that anyway? asks the boy. A CD? This is not a CD, says his father, a slight edge of annoyance in his voice. The boy rolls his eyes. His father is always acting like he should be familiar with the outdated dinosaur technology of his father's youth. When will his dad learn? Just because this junk was important to his father when he was growing up doesn't mean that it's still important to the next generation. The boy holds his tongue, knowing that his father will probably start to sulk if he's reminded that time marches on, and that he's no longer as hip and with it as he likes to think he is. It's a GD-ROM says his father, as if those words are supposed to mean anything to the boy. It stands for Gigabyte Disk Read-Only Memory. The boy has no clue what that means, and he hopes that his father isn't about to start a lecture on the different kinds of obsolete video game tech that he's suddenly decided are so vitally important for his son to know about. Luckily, his dad doesn't launch into a long-winded talk. He's too curious about what's on this mysterious disk to bother about that now. The father shoves the disk into the Dreamcast and settles down on the floor, gripping the controller with both hands. He's as excited as a kid in a candy store as he waits for the screen to boot up. The boy can't remember the last time that his father has been so eager for anything. But his excitement is short-lived as the first loading screen boots up. A cheerful, happy melody plays from the Dreamcast's speakers. The game title, Eurythmics, flashes on screen with options for one or two players listed below it. The father clicks over to two players, nodding for his son to pick up the other controller. The boy does as he's told. He can't imagine that this game is going to be any good. How old is it anyway? It's from when his dad was a kid, so that's all the way back in the 90s. This game might as well be 100 years old for all the boy cares. Immediately when the father chooses two players, the screen starts to glitch. The father yells in frustration, throwing his controller to the floor, but the boy sighs in relief. Thank God, at least now we won't have to pretend that this dinosaur game is anything good. I guess it's busted, says the boy, ready to turn away from the Dreamcast. 
but his father is insistent. No, no, it's just warming up. Watch, I'll fix this. He grabs his controller and tries to click on two players again. The screen only glitches more. Okay, okay, just give me a minute, says the father. If this doesn't work, I'll just take the disc out and blow on it. I'm sure that'll work. The boy stares in confusion. It's a disc, not a cartridge. He doesn't see any way that blowing on it will have any effect. His father is just desperately grasping at straws, upset that his attempt at father-son bonding is being thwarted. Meanwhile, the cheerful loading screen music starts to fray, stuck repeating a single reverberating note that gradually degenerates into a tuneless cacophony. The pixels shimmy and wobble on screen, the image fracturing worse and worse as the father struggles to get the game console to respond to his commands. The boy watches the screen with disinterest at first, but then… wait, what's going on? The more he stares at the screen, the more the random noises and broken graphics seem to form into something strange, something unknowable, but also something vaguely coherent. He blinks in confusion, his jaw dropping. He wants to call his father's attention to the bizarre formations on screen, but his father is too busy wrestling with the controller to notice the effect that he's having. Dad, Dad, look at the screen, says the boy, grabbing his father's shoulder and pointing. Huh, what is it? Did it work? What the? The father furrows his brow in confusion as he notices the wildly oscillating image on the TV screen for the first time. That doesn't look like a Dreamcast game at all. It's all broken, I... I think? The colors swirl around the screen in hypnotic, psychedelic patterns, and both father and son find themselves mesmerized, unable to look away. The boy is only vaguely aware of what computer graphics in the late 90s would have looked like, but he's reasonably sure that no underpowered 90s console could produce something this wild. The boy feels himself getting groggy, his brain fogging over as he stares at the wildly oscillating shapes on the screen. He feels like he could almost make sense of them if he just tried hard enough. It's like looking at one of those old-fashioned magic eye pictures, where the image only collapses into sense if you cross your eyes just right, but these strange swirls of color are something far beyond that. The swirls spiral into distinct vortex patterns, to the point that the boy might almost believe that he's looking at… eyes. Yes, that's it, he's sure of it. He wants to panic as he becomes aware of the sensation of being watched. He feels like something beyond the screen, some malevolent entity, has somehow gained access to his world via this video game, and is now watching him, sizing him up like a predator would size up its prey. He can't think of anything except those staring eyes with their rotating pupils. He wants to fall forward and disappear into the eternal nothingness of those awful eyes. Next to him, his father is silent. Like the boy, he's also enraptured by the infinite eyes on screen. Oh my god, he mutters, so quiet that the boy can barely hear him. Do you… do you see the eyes? It's your grandfather. He's watching us. From… beyond. I know that's him. The boy doesn't know whether his father is right. His father is probably just letting his guilt color his perception, because the boy doesn't feel like there's human intelligence on the other side of the screen. Whatever is out there, whether it's an alien mind from beyond human ken, or simply a computer program given awful sentience by a freak accident, it's not something that the boy can even begin to comprehend. He feels his mind shutting down in the face of that terror, as if his brain simply cannot take the strain anymore. He's only vaguely aware of his father hitting the floor in a dead faint, that should worry him. He should be frightened. He should want to rush to his father's side and try to shake him back awake. But his brain can't make his body respond. He feels his arms and legs getting weak and his eyelids getting heavy. It isn't long before his eyes drift shut and the boy collapses onto the floor next to his father. Hours later, after the sun has already set, a car pulls up in front of the house and the boy's mother gets out. She frowns as she looks at the front of the house, noting that the lights are on inside, and the front bay window casts a yellow square of light across the front lawn. The boy and his father must still be inside. They were supposed to have finished moving all that junk hours ago. She's tried calling both of their cell phones to remind them that they should be home for dinner, but neither father nor son has answered any of her calls or texts. She's not worried, though. They often ignore their phones when they get really involved in an activity, and she suspects, rightly, that her husband probably found some childhood relic in the basement that's distracted him from getting the task done. She's willing to bet that the two of them probably haven't even finished cleaning the basement. She walks up the garden path and puts her hand against the doorknob. The door creaks open. She frowns. Nothing sinister about that, right? 
Of course, they wouldn't bother to lock the door if they were still working inside, right? Nevertheless, she feels a strange chill run up her spine. Why is she suddenly so nervous? She pushes open the door and fumbles for the light switch. The foyer is dark, as is most of the house. The only light comes from the living room, and she can see that something within is throwing dancing shadows against the far wall. She hears a toneless, mechanical drone emanating from the living room. Are they watching television? That would be just like them to turn on the tube and completely lose track of time. But what TV show would make an awful din like that? She storms into the living room, ready to read her husband and son the riot act. But then, she stops dead in her tracks. Her husband and son are here all right, but they're lying in crumpled heaps upon the floor, staring glassy-eyed at the ceiling. She screams as she rushes to her husband, praying that she's wrong, that they're just playing a prank on her, that they just got tired and lay down on the floor to rest. But as she presses her finger against his wrist, she feels that he's cold and lifeless. He's dead, and has been for hours. Her son, pale and cold and lifeless, lies next to him. She looks up, her gaze connecting with the television screen. It continues to flash vacillating images in an erratic loop, nonsense static that she can't understand. But if she didn't know better, she might almost feel like it's watching her. The strange, swirling eyes stare back, unblinking and eternal. What started as a misguided attempt at father-son bonding time ended in tragedy, because those GD-ROM discs weren't ordinary discs at all, but rather instances of what the SCP Foundation has dubbed SCP-4904. SCP-4904 is a set of seven modified GD-ROM discs manufactured by the Sega Corporation. SCP Foundation agents have been able to pinpoint the date of manufacture of each disc sometime between 1997 and 1999. The GD-ROM was a proprietary format originally used for the Dreamcast video game console, developed by Yamaha as an answer to fighting the piracy that was rampant among more standard compact discs, and to offer increased storage capacity without the expense of the fledgling DVD-ROM. The GD-ROM seemed promising at the time, as it had a storage capacity of a full gigabyte, 42% higher than conventional CDs. Ultimately though, GD-ROMs failed to catch on and were quickly outpaced by DVD technology. The seven discs in the SCP Foundation storage are visually indistinguishable from non-anomalous GD-ROM discs, except for their serial numbers. The serial numbers give some indication of the mystery behind their origin, revealing that they were created by Sega's enigmatic R&D Zero division during the height of the 90s console wars. It is estimated that R&D Zero produced a total of between 60 and 100 experimental GD-ROM discs similar to those in SCP-4904, but the rest of the production line is currently unaccounted for. Each SCP-4904 GD-ROM contains one Sega video game, including Sonic Adventure, Sega Rally Championship 2, House of the Dead 2, Sega Bass Fishing, Godzilla Generations, Virtua Fighter 3 TB, and an unreleased 3D rhythm game by the name of Eurythmics. But the result when anyone tries to play any of these different games is always the same. When an instance of SCP-4904 is fed into a Dreamcast console, it causes the optical disk drive's reader to move in unpredictable ways, accessing disk data seemingly at random. At first, the game boots up as expected and seems perfectly ordinary, but when a player progresses past the loading screen, the game very quickly becomes illegible. Sprites and assets blend into each other in asymmetrical chunks, maps recursively render onto other maps, and soundtracks transform within seconds into incessant, oscillating noise. A perfunctory glance at the result seems like absolute chaos, but eventually, observers will start to notice patterns within the noise. These eventually coalesce into complex renderings of landscapes and figures wildly inconsistent with the content of the original games, and computationally impossible for 1990s-era video game hardware to render. Repeated tests by SCP Foundation agents have turned up a recurring motif in the images shown by SCP-4904, spinning disks that resemble malevolent eyes. SCP agents hope that research into R&D Zero and the man responsible for the disk's creation might help to explain the reason or the purpose of SCP-4904. R&D Zero's former lead hardware programmer Ken Matsuya has said on record that the team encountered numerous problems in implementing the disk's anti-piracy encryption measures. The result was unplayable. Frustrated by this failure, Sega ordered that the encryption project be abandoned and the prototype disks quietly destroyed. However, it does not appear that Sega's orders were carried out to the letter. Matsuya himself rescued seven of the disks, hoping to learn more about the issue on his own time, and it's possible that other disks not currently known to the Foundation also survived. 
With the help of improvised Sega hardware, Matsuya spent the next four years trying to understand the cause behind the disc's erratic behavior. Notebooks recovered from his apartment contain numerous sketches of the disc-generated visuals. Depicting fractal combinations of landscape and figures seemingly drawn from places outside of the game data themselves, and stylized spinning discs in the shape of eyes. Matsuya himself met a strange and untimely end when he was found dead from a heart attack in his apartment in August 2003. Stranger still, an autopsy revealed that large portions of his brainstem and limbic system were missing. His death puzzled authorities since there was no evidence of any human, or even non human, intrusion. Matsuya had apparently loaded one of the SCP-4904 instances in his possession into his home Dreamcast before his death, because the distinctive psychedelic visuals were playing on his television screen at the time that his body was discovered. Foundation agents suspected that the visuals might have some connection with Matsuya's death, leading to the disc's subsequent classification and containment, but intensive tests on SCP-4904 by Foundation personnel have failed to shed any light on the situation. Both the disc's strange behavior and Matsuya's death remain complete mysteries. Is SCP-4904 a gateway into some other dimension, and its bizarre images a signal from another world? Could it be a message from beyond the veil? Or is it all just due to a simple computer glitch and Matsuya's death just a freak coincidence? Whatever the case, the Foundation is doing its best to uncover the truth. SCP-4904 has been given the object class safe, but should be stored in conditions comparable to those needed to keep non-anomalous disks viable. All seven instances of SCP-4904 are kept in a climate-controlled safe class storage locker at Site-15. Long-term tests lasting over an hour should only be conducted on reinforced, modified hardware to prevent disk deformation or explosion. A young woman is spending the morning in town, completing a few errands she's been meaning to get to for a while. She picks up a few items from the supermarket, gets the cracked screen on her smartphone repaired, and decides to treat herself to a Danish from a local bakery. It's a relatively idyllic Tuesday, until she turns the corner into a narrow side street and sees them. It can often be a little disconcerting to suddenly find yourself staring at a crowd that is gathered for seemingly no reason, but something about this one makes her particularly nervous, and she quickly realizes why. Each person in the tightly packed together group is grinning, as if they are all in on a particularly cruel joke about her. At face value, they all seem to be very different people, a collage of ages, races, genders, in different clothes with different styles, and yet they're all walking with perfect synchronicity, one perfectly timed footfall at a time. This is enough to seriously creep her out. Whatever this strange group of people is doing, she wants no part of it. Instead, she turns and heads in the opposite direction, fast walking and stealing discreet but frequent glances over her shoulder. She can't help but notice, even when the crowd exits the small side street, that they remain huddled together, like security guards packed tight around some invisible VIP. And even worse, they seem to be following her trajectory, getting faster, getting closer, still perfectly in sync with one another. How are all these people gaining so fast, she thinks to herself. When she's around a corner and out of sight, she does the sensible thing and breaks into a sprint, eager to put some distance between herself and them. Even though they haven't shown any signs of overt aggression, she can tell on some visceral level that they mean her great harm. She knows if ever they get close enough, within grasping distance, something terrible will happen. She's soon back at her home and locks herself in, bolting the door behind her. She breathes a sigh, but she's not relieved, not really. Maybe she's paranoid, but she feels like she isn't out of the woods just yet. Those eerie smiles, those perfect footsteps, she can't get them out of her mind. She slips into her kitchen and slides a knife out of the block. She tells herself that doing this is a little crazy, but having some kind of weapon in hand makes her feel at least a little bit safer. But whatever the feelings of comfort the knife gives her are shattered when she hears the doorbell ring. She hadn't ordered anything, she wasn't expecting anyone. Who could that be? She hides the knife behind her back and makes her way towards the door. Ding dong, it rings again. Whoever is on the other side is getting impatient. She opens the door slightly, but leaves the chain in place. There's a smiling man in a business suit on the other side. She's racking her brain, trying to remember. Is he one of the people from the crowd? Or is she just imagining things because she's freaked out? She can't tell anymore. She can feel her palm getting sweaty around the knife's handle. The man at the door clears his throat and says, Excuse me, ma'am, I won't take up too much of your time, but I wanted to ask, have you heard the good word? 
She shakes her head and tells the stranger that she isn't interested in hearing his pitch, but he just keeps smiling and presses on. Do you ever feel lonely, dissatisfied, unfulfilled? Don't you ever wish that you could become a part of something bigger than yourself? It'd be a real weight off your shoulders. She's starting to run out of polite ways to deny him when she hears a faint tapping against the nearby glass. The young woman turns her head and looks into her living room. There's a smiling woman standing at the window, rapping on the glass with her knuckles, grinning. The chill sets in immediately. She recognizes that face with absolute certainty. It's one of the people from the crowd, and now she knows for sure that the man at the door is too. But when she turns back to him, all she sees is his hand reaching through the gap in the door for her. She screams and backs away, instinctively slashing the knife at him. Two fingers fall to the floor, but there's no blood, just thick, flesh-colored pus dripping from the two stumps. The hand doesn't even flinch. It keeps reaching, and soon the gap in the door is crowded with the faces of even more grinning human figures. She turns and runs as the sheer collected momentum of the crowd forces open the door. They spill into the hallway, tumbling over each other, but still smiling. She notices something trailing out of their clothes, long, sinewy ropes that look like they're made of living flesh, wriggling and pumping with each passing second. This whole situation seems to just be getting worse and worse. Thinking quickly, she decides to flee up the stairs. If she gets to her bedroom fast enough, she can lock her door from the inside, open the window, and climb down the trellis into the yard before they can break in. In that moment, it seems like the best course of action, but only because she has no idea just how quickly the crowd can close the distance. In an instant, the crowd is up onto the stairs and following her, extending their grasping hands in unison. Who are these people? Why are they doing this? The questions that flood her mind are soon forced out by the shock of the grinning stranger in the business suit, pulling her into a powerful bear hug. He squeezes hard, and she can feel it in her muscles and bones. She wriggles for her life, but she can't resist his strength. The rest of the crowd reaches for her. She spots those awful fleshy cords again, emerging from the backs of all these terrifying strangers. And now she sees what they're all leading back to, a giant, formless blob of flesh, like some corrupted, unknown organ, a huge, monstrous tumor. It pulses and throbs. Just looking at it makes her want to be sick, and she can feel the most horrible energy coming off of it. Whatever this thing is, it wants her. It's reaching for her. Fight or flight kicks in, and this time flight isn't an option. The stranger in the suit has a good grip on her, in spite of his missing fingers, but she's still got the knife. She can see the cord trailing from his back into the giant flesh blob, and with one decisive strike, she severs it with the kitchen knife. Immediately, the man in the suit lets go of her. Both ends of the cord flop down, spraying more of the flesh-colored pus, but the effect on the man himself is even more drastic. He flails around, making the most horrible, guttural gurgling noises she's ever heard. He heaves and vomits out gallons of the pus. It sprays from his eyes and nose like a fire hose. It oozes down and out of his pant legs. His body deflates like a punctured balloon as the awful substance cascades out of him, until all that's left is a wet, vacant sack of skin and clothes, quivering on the floor. But she doesn't have time to dwell on the horrors she's just witnessed. She needs to get out of here, now. She turns and continues running up the stairs as the crowd regroups and begins chasing her. She can hear their perfectly synchronized footsteps sloshing through the liquids of their fallen member. They've barely even slowed down. She keeps running. She just needs to keep running. A number of hands close around her body. Several of them clamp around her wrist, squeezing tight until the knife falls from her hand and clatters to the ground. They've learned already. The crowd rises up and closes around her. No matter how hard she struggles, they won't budge. They just keep huddling in. She can hear the giant, pulsing mass of flesh closing in behind her. She feels one of those long, fleshy cords slithering up her back, its fibrous strands easing their way into her flesh until the connection is made. Her eyes roll up into her head as it pumps the fluid into her body, melting away everything inside and congealing it into the same nightmarish slop that she'd just seen splattering out of the man in the business suit moments ago. Little by little, everything that was once her is hollowed out, filled in, and painted over. Once the transformation is complete, she smiles, just like all the others. But she's not she anymore. She's just another part of it, its newest addition, a replacement for the man in the suit. The crowd leaves shortly after, keeping perfect step, looking for some new friends. At some point, everyone has felt the desire to fit in, but one anomaly takes the desire to join the throng to its ultimate extreme. This is SCP-428, also known as The Crowd. 
In its purest state, SCP-428 is an amorphous mass of flesh connected to a number of human hosts with organic tendrils, similar to umbilical cords. The central mass is obscured by its multiple human hosts, numbering 14 at the present moment, and it is an extremely dangerous entity. Once an individual is assimilated into its mass, they are to be considered lost. Upon assimilation, all of the victim's complex internal structures – bones, musculature, organs, nervous system – are instead replaced by material similar in composition to the amorphous mass that controls them. All that remains is their skin and vague shape, being piloted by the SCP-428 hub. When not actively seeking new victims to assimilate, SCP-428 enters a dormant state, its assimilated victims standing in a circle around the hub, audibly mumbling to one another and swaying gently. SCP-428 and its crowd will enter a hostile state if anyone travels within two meters of it. With surprising speed and ferocity, members of the crowd will try to mob the unfortunate victim in a sudden ambush, bringing them into the proximity of the hub. If they remain in this state for over 10 seconds, a cord will attach to their body and their vital systems will be replaced, and they will be assimilated into the crowd, just like the other victims of SCP-428 were before them. If, however, the victim somehow manages to escape before the process is complete, this will not be the end of their ordeal. Should someone evade its attention, SCP-428 and the crowd will enter a period of active hunting behavior to seek out the escaping victim. Failing that, they will try to assimilate any human wandering into their vicinity. There is no safe way to approach SCP-428 or any of its members under any circumstances. To do so is to court a fate worse than death. When a victim is assimilated, SCP-428 and the crowd will return to a dormant state until another victim presents itself. Foundation studies have determined that SCP-428 seeks to add at least one person to its crowd every month, and if a person is not provided, then it will engage in hunting behavior, putting everyone in the area in grave danger. SCP-428 isn't controlling a gaggle of mindless zombies, though. It is an extremely intelligent hive mind, made all the more frightening by the fact that it absorbs the knowledge, memories, and skills of each of its victims, and can reapply them through any of the others. Because of this, it appears to have incredibly adept knowledge of the human mind and will happily resort to using tactics of psychological manipulation to gain an advantage. Despite being a large crowd, tests have shown that SCP-428 and its assimilated victims can move terrifyingly fast. This is because, due to the very nature of the perfectly attuned hive mind, they can walk or run in perfect synchronicity. To best understand this, picture a centipede skittering at great speed across a wall so many legs, but all sharing a perfectly coordinated nervous system, working together to move the creature with military precision. Even individually, each member of the crowd is a formidable foe. Once they become part of SCP-428, they exhibit greatly increased strength, they show no signs of feeling pain, and also have the ability to quickly heal any injuries. Wounds also do not seem to impede function whatsoever. A member of the crowd getting shot in the leg won't slow it down in the slightest. However, while this creature is incredibly intelligent and dangerous, the same can be said for the SCP Foundation, and in the time since they discovered it, they have ascertained a few weaknesses, even though some of this knowledge came at a heavy cost. Though members of the crowd appear significantly resistant to damage, the SCP-428 hub itself appears to be vulnerable to attack and more than capable of feeling pain. If the hub is damaged in a manner that would cause pain, every member of the crowd is able to feel it often collapsing and writhing around in agony. When the creature collects itself, it will retreat, guarded by its human shields. The Foundation has used this method to corral the creature back into containment during breaches, with the controlled applications of fire or electricity being favorite methods of Foundation security forces. Severing the connection between a member of the crowd and the central hub is also a surefire way to weaken the overall ability of SCP-428. A severed crowd member will immediately collapse, the SCP-428 material inside it liquefying and excreting from every orifice. This may intensify SCP-428's drive to discover a new victim, but it can also be used as a method of population control for the crowd itself. There has been one major incident concerning SCP-428 since its containment at the SCP Foundation, and it acted as a painful reminder to all staff that one should never underestimate the abilities of the anomalies they contain. Evidently, one of the people assimilated by SCP-428 in the past was skilled in the art of lockpicking, as SCP-428 had absorbed this skill. It took apart one of its members' belts and used the pieces to pick the lock of its containment chamber from the inside. 
It then positioned one of its female victims, crouching just outside the door, the cord slithering through the crack in the door behind her. She fell to her knees and began to weep loudly, attracting the attention of a nearby researcher. Naturally, when you hear a distressed person crying, it's human instinct to go investigate and help, and this particular researcher hadn't been briefed on the nature and abilities of SCP-428, which left him completely unprepared for the horrifying fate that awaited him. As he leaned in to comfort the crying woman, the rest of the crowd immediately emerged from the containment chamber's door, mobbing him. One forced its hand over his mouth, stifling his frightened scream as he was pulled in and quickly assimilated. While SCP-428 could pick locks, absorbing a member of SCP Foundation staff, both giving it access to the Foundation site layouts and inner workings as well as a presentable frontman to assuage suspicion, was like getting its fleshy tendrils on a kind of master key. SCP-428 and its crowd, with the assimilated researcher at the head, progressed through the building, avoiding key security checkpoints and absorbing several other researchers and guards along the way. This was a particularly frightening development, as it allowed SCP-428 to further expand both its knowledge of the SCP Foundation and its skills in everything from science to armed and hand-to-hand -hand combat. With every new person it took in, it grew significantly stronger and more dangerous to Foundation personnel. Thankfully, it drew the right kind of attention before it had a chance to escape the containment site proper. A mobile task force was dispatched to contain SCP-428 and the crowd, and force it back into its containment chamber. However, being an extremely persistent creature, this minor setback didn't do anything to quell its desire to escape. Given that several members of its crowd were now ex-Foundation staff members, it tried to leverage this in order to manipulate the people guarding its chamber. This became such a problem that a researcher appended a note to its file, reading, People, these casualties are gone. They are SCP-428 now. No matter what it might say or do, they are not your work colleagues nor your friends anymore. Remember this, it may save your life. SCP-428 and its crowd is currently contained in a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter cell, with walls electrified to 30,000 volts to discourage attempts by members of the crowd to break or climb them. The cell is accessed via an airlock, and entry is restricted to level 3 researchers and below, while escorted by two armed guards in order to eliminate the risk of SCP-428 absorbing a valuable asset to the SCP Foundation and coming into possession of truly catastrophic knowledge and skills as a result. Just imagine the disastrous results if, say, a member of the O5 Council were suddenly a part of SCP-428. Researchers are to remain a minimum of two meters away at all times, and it is mandatory for at least two armed guards to stay posted at the chamber's entrance at all times. SCP-428 is to be given one member of D-Class personnel to assimilate every single month in order to prevent it from engaging in hunting behavior. Due to SCP-428's frightening ability to absorb memories, skills, and intelligence, all D-Classes given to 428 are screened for low intelligence and a lack of valuable skills to ensure that the anomaly isn't being given any new aces up its sleeves. However, continually giving SCP-428 new victims is going to increase its overall size and thus necessitate gradual containment upgrades. The possibility of permanently neutralizing SCP-428 is being explored, but in the meantime, it has been given the Euclid Object class, because of its intelligence, skills, and unpredictability. While the SCP Foundation is all about sacrificing the individual for the greater good, this is one frightening collective that they couldn't endorse becoming a part of. Two teenagers cautiously approach an old, decrepit house. The house looks like it was built hundreds of years ago, and from the outside, it appears to be in a serious state of disrepair. The walls are cracked and weathered, the roof looks to have holes in it, and one of the decorative columns has completely collapsed. The teenagers have heard rumors about this dilapidated home, though, and they have heard there are riches still to be found inside. One of the teens starts walking up the stairs onto the porch, but his friend seems reluctant to follow. Is he sure that no one lives here? The braver of the teens tells his friend that he's been watching the house for days and hasn't seen anyone come in or out. The only signs of life have been a very faint light visible between the cracks of the house's boarded up windows, and he's not even sure if he actually saw any lights or not. If there is anyone in there, it's just some crazy old person. They can easily scare them off and loot the house at their leisure. His friend still doesn't look sure, but the other teen proceeds to take out a lockpick. He tells his friend to keep a lookout while he works on the door. He doesn't need to keep watch for long though, since the lock almost immediately opens with a loud click. He opens the door carefully but it still squeaks loudly. Through the crack, he can't see much of anything inside. It looks very dark. Come on, 
he tells his friend as he slips inside. His friend looks nervous as he watches his friend disappear into the house. Suddenly, there's a loud crash. Oh no, we've been caught, he thinks as he spins around. But he doesn't see a police officer coming to arrest them or a nosy passerby. Instead, he watches as a cat chases a rat into some trash cans, knocking more of them over. He breathes a sigh of relief as he watches the cat come out of the pile of trash, holding its prey limply by the tail. He turns to follow his friend into the house, but is stopped when the door snaps shut in his face. He tries the doorknob, but it's locked. He taps quietly on the door. No response. He taps a little louder, whispering, Hey, what's going on? But still no response. What is going on? Inside, his friend is also pulling on the doorknob, but it's no use. The door won't budge, and the lock won't turn. He also tries tapping lightly on the door, but there's no signs from outside that anyone has heard him. He's trapped. He looks around the darkened room. Just like the outside, the interior looks like it hasn't been updated in hundreds of years. Dust and cobwebs are everywhere, like no one has set foot inside in decades. And yet, on several small tables and shelves around the room, are lit candles. With no other option, he decides to move deeper into the house. He creeps into the next room, which is in much the same condition as the first, dusty and old, but with several candles placed around that give off just the faintest amount of flickering yellow light. Not only does someone still live here, but they've lit these candles recently. He takes a folding knife out of his pocket and opens it, holding the blade out in front of him. Just then, he hears something, a noise like footsteps and it sounds like it's coming from upstairs in the room right above him. They might be coming down to look for him. He needs a place to hide. He spots a sofa near the corner and tries to get down behind it as much as possible. As he grips the edge of the sofa with one hand, he suddenly drops his knife to the floor and uses his now free hand to stifle a scream. He looks at the hand that was just gripping the sofa and sees a long sewing needle plunge deep into his hand. Was this stuck into the couch? He pulls the needle out of his hand. It nearly went all the way through, and holds the bloody wound up to his mouth, trying to stop the flow of blood as he waits and listens. The sound of footsteps finally stop. Whoever is walking around, it doesn't sound like they're coming down the stairs to find him. He has to get out of this house, though. There must be another way out. He picks up his knife and quietly moves to the next room. Once again, it's in the same condition as the last. But wait, what's that in the corner? Is that a person lying there? Outside the house, his friend is looking through the same trash that he saw the cat hunting in. Aha! Just what he was looking for, an old wire hanger. He runs back to the old house, untwists it, and inserts the thin wire into the lock. Inside, the trespassing teen gets closer and closer to the thing in the corner. It's so dim, though, with the only light coming from the candles that he still can't make out what it is. But he feels strangely compelled to find out. He picks up one of the candles off of a nearby table. Outside, he still can't get the lock open, but he's got to keep trying. He can't leave his friend trapped inside. He's standing right over the thing in the corner now. He kneels down and brings the candle close to see what it is, and screams. His friend throws down the hanger in frustration before sitting down on the porch. He can't figure out why his friend was able to open the lock so easily, and now it won't move. Did something in the mechanism break? He doesn't know what he's going to do, though. Should he call for help? The police will arrest them both if he does. How long should he wait, though? It feels like his friend has been stuck for a long time, and he hasn't heard anything from inside. What could possibly be happening in there? Should he just leave and hope that his friend is able to escape on his own? Just as he is wondering what to do, he hears a click behind him. He turns around and tries the door handle, but it's still locked. He looks down and sees the wire hanger. Maybe he'll give it one more try. He sticks the hanger into the lock and hears the lock pop open almost instantly. He tries the door handle, and this time, the door swings open. He stands there looking through the cracked door into the dark house. He's terrified at the thought of going inside, but he can't leave his friend in there. If he's in trouble, then he has to save him. Gathering up all of his courage, he enters the house and sees the same thing his friend did, a dusty old room. He takes a step into the candle-lit room and freezes. There's something in the middle of the room. It's a chair that's turned away from him, but he can see that someone is sitting in it. But wait, is that his friend? Hey, he calls in a loud whisper, but his friend doesn't respond. Come on, let's get out of here. Still no response. He starts walking toward his friend, but stops when he hears what sounds like footsteps coming from the room above him. 
He's got to get his friend and get out of this house. He checks over his shoulder to make sure the door is still open before starting to quietly move towards his friend again. He's close enough that he can reach out and shake his shoulder, but his friend doesn't react. He walks around to the front of the chair and sees his friend. Except it's no longer his friend. Staring back at him are two empty eye sockets. His mouth has been pulled back by stitches of thread into a horrifying permanent grin. But worst of all is what he hears. It's the sound of the front door slamming shut. Privyet! Today's file is a special one and comes from the Russian branch of the SCP Foundation. It's SCP-1098-RU, also known as the Theater of Living Puppets. SCP-1098-RU is a two-story house located in a small Russian city which appears to have been constructed in the Baroque style, which was popular in the 17th and 18th centuries, and is characterized by its exuberant details. The house is likely several hundred years old and is in an advanced state of disrepair. The local government administration has marked the house for demolition multiple times, but for reasons that remain unknown, these plans are always scrapped or indefinitely delayed. All of the doors that lead into SCP-1098-RU are locked and the windows are all boarded up. Anyone who attempts to damage the house, even just by removing the boards from the windows, will experience an odd anomalous effect that compels them to instead protect the structure and cause it no harm. This effect only wears off when the subject moves at least 50 meters away from the house. The only way to enter SCP-1098-RU is through the front door, which even though it is locked, is easily able to be picked open which causes no harm to the house and prevents the anomalous effect from overcoming the subject trying to gain entrance. Once someone has entered the house, they will find that the door closes behind them and locks itself. The lock cannot then be picked open again for one hour. The interior of the house matches the exterior stylistically, also appearing to have been designed in the Baroque style and in a poor condition. The house is quite dark since there are no electric lights present and all of the windows are boarded up, blocking any outside light. The only illumination comes from the lit candles that are placed around the house, which appear to be constantly replaced and lit again when they burn out. The sound of slow footsteps can be heard inside the house, but the room they are coming from seems to change. The entity producing the sounds has been classified as SCP-1098-RU-1, and it is thought that it is also responsible for the placing and relighting of candles around the house, as well as several other anomalous effects. The Russian branch of the SCP Foundation first became aware of potential anomalous activity related to SCP-1098-RU after the disappearance of multiple teenagers was linked to the location. In interviews, many of their friends and family reported that their last known locations were near the site of the old Baroque-style home, and several had expressed a desire to investigate the house before they disappeared. Local police investigated the house, which only led to them disappearing as well. After learning of the strange activity connected to the house, the Foundation took over the investigation, planting a cover story that totalitarian sects were responsible for the disappearances, while Class A amnestics were administered to all relatives of the missing teens. The Foundation immediately began investigating the house, but carefully, since they had already seen how easily people could go missing inside. In the first excursion into the house, a remotely controlled robot fitted with a camera was sent inside. Just like when a person enters, the door closed and locked behind the robot, but its camera feed continued to broadcast images to the researchers outside. As the robot explored the rundown house's rooms, it found something much more disturbing than just lit candles. In several of the rooms, corpses were discovered, which were later identified as being some of the missing teenagers. All of the bodies found had their eyeballs removed and thick threads had been sewn into their arms and legs, as if they had been turned into giant living puppets. Some of them also had stitches in their chest and face areas. The face stitches appear to have been made to force the face to have a certain expression, while the chest stitches may indicate that organs had been removed. No signs of decomposition were present though, despite some of the bodies likely being many months old. Several objects were also found next to the bodies, including surgical knives, needles, thread, and at least one artificial eye. Exactly one hour after the robot entered the house, the camera ceased broadcasting images and all contact was lost. For the second excursion into the house, the Foundation decided that a human being would be more effective at gathering information than a robot. A Class D personnel was given a flashlight, a camera, and a radio, 
and sent on a mission to attempt to remove objects from the house and to locate the robot from the first research mission. The D-Class entered the house, and researchers noted that from what they could see on the video feed, that the layout of the house hadn't changed. Candles were still present around the room, though it was clear that they had been replaced by fresh ones. As the D-Class explored the first floor of the house, he reported that he could hear footsteps coming from different parts of the house, and on one occasion, that they sounded like they were coming from a room he had just left. But when he returned to that room, no one was present. He wasn't able to locate the missing robot, but did find the same corpses that the robot had. He was ordered by the researchers to pick up one of the surgical knives and try bringing it out of the house, but the moment he picked it up, all contact was lost. A third mission into the house was then tried, this time with another remotely controlled robot, though this one was more advanced and equipped with a thermal imager and audio recording equipment. This robot was also better suited for exploration and was capable of climbing stairs so that the Foundation could finally find out what was on the second floor of this strange house. The robot entered the home and ascended to the second floor. As it explored the rooms, it found one particularly strange one that appeared to be operating as a kind of sewing workshop, with huge amounts of thread, needles, and other sewing supplies spread across multiple tables. Dark red stains covered many of the tables, but no bodies were discovered in the sewing room. The robot continued to explore the second floor, though, and soon discovered many more corpses, accounting for nearly all of the missing teenagers, the police that had vanished, as well as the missing D-Class personnel. All of them had been dressed in 18th century style clothing, and their eyes had been removed and replaced with artificial ones, giving them a perpetual glassy-eyed stare. Long, thick threads had been sewn into their arms and legs as well. The sound recording equipment on the robot captured the same sounds of footsteps that the D-Class had reported, but the thermal imager didn't locate any signs of life. The researchers decided to call an end to the experiment and began guiding the robot back out of the house, but just as it reached the front door, the connection was lost, and the robot has never been located. One final expedition into the home was approved, this time using another D-Class personnel whose mission was to explore the entire house, including the second floor, before attempting to leave the home. The D-Class entered the home as normal, but immediately reported feeling a strange feeling that the other D-Class hadn't mentioned. He told the researchers listening that he was experiencing an intense headache and pressure in his ears, and that he could hear what sounded like someone crying in another room. None of the equipment picked up the crying sounds, and the D-Class was ordered to investigate further. He approached the room that he claimed the sound was coming from, but still nothing was detected on the audio recording equipment. He was ordered to enter the room, and though he seemed scared and reluctant, eventually he did so. Once inside, he reported seeing a young girl wearing an 18th century style dress. The girl was dancing, but crying as she did so. Just like on the corpses that had previously been found inside the house, threads were connected to her arms and legs, but these ones were pulled tight and stretched up towards the ceiling. The D-Class followed their path up but they disappeared into the darkness, reporting that it looked like there was no ceiling at all, just an inky black void where something was manipulating the strings attached to the girl, forcing her to dance. None of these visuals reported by the Class D could be seen on the video feeds the researchers were watching. As far as they could see, he was staring into an empty room. The D-Class was ordered to continue watching this strange recital, though, and after five minutes, all of the communication devices ceased working. The video feed was lost, too, but the audio continued to record for a few more seconds, during which time a sharp clap noise was heard. The D-Class began screaming as a deep male voice spoke a phrase in Latin, et perficiendi sit pretium. The performance must be paid for. No further signs of the D-Class were ever found. SCP-1098-RU has since been fenced off to prevent the general public from being able to enter it. A patrol team of four security guards is always on site, and anyone who attempts to gain entry to the house is to be detained, interrogated, and administered Class B amnestics. Additional research into SCP-1098-RU is ongoing, but requires approval from at least two members of the O5 Council, and to date, no further expeditions inside this anomaly, which has been given the object Class Euclid, have been authorized. It is still unknown who or what exactly the entity inside of SCP-1098-RU is, but it has been designated as SCP-1098-RU-1, and some in the Foundation have taken to calling it by a nickname, the Master of Puppets. Honestly, no. It doesn't feel like anything is working. 
the woman tells the man who is seated across the room from her. She's been coming to see him for several months now, but she doesn't feel like she's made progress on any of her issues. The man listens and nods as he jots down some notes on his pad of paper. He has something he wants to discuss with her. She may feel as though she's run out of options, but there is one other thing they could try. He's seen lots of success using this with his other patients, though it's a technique that many would deem to be rather… unconventional. The woman is unsure. Unconventional techniques don't exactly instill her with confidence. But at this point, what did she have to lose? The man stands up and motions for the woman to follow him. He leads her out of his office to a section of his practice that she's never seen before, where they stop in front of a closed door. On the door is a window covered by a curtain, and she notices that there are a set of strong locks as well. He unlocks the door and ushers her inside, where she finds that it is a small room, maybe ten feet across at most, with thick padding on the floor and walls, and bright white light set into the ceiling. He tells her to wait there just a moment and to make herself comfortable before he excuses himself. The woman looks around at the padded room, wondering just what it is that she's agreed to. The man returns, and now he's holding something. A garment bag. He unzips it to reveal a dark piece of clothing inside, but when he takes it out, she sees now that it isn't clothing at all, at least not any normal kind. It's a straitjacket. The woman is scared, unsure if she wants to go through with this, and he does his best to put her at ease. If she's uncomfortable, she certainly doesn't have to do anything she doesn't want to, but he reiterates that he has had great results using this with some of his other patients. It's been something of a miracle cure. Well, no, cure is the wrong word. He corrects himself and explains that this won't cure her in the way that she's probably thinking, but rather, what he's found is that this therapy is able to provide a momentary relief from symptoms, a chance to see what life is like without being plagued by the issues that have led her to seek his help. Once she has gotten a glimpse at what life is like without these burdens, they can work towards bringing her back to that point through other therapies and techniques. This might be just the breakthrough she needs to finally make something work. The woman is still skeptical, but she is desperate to find anything that will help her escape the thoughts constantly plaguing her mind so that she can get back to being the person she wants to be. And after a moment of thought, she agrees to go through with the procedure. The therapist tells the woman to hold her arms out in front of her and places the straitjacket on her. She can see and feel now that it is made of black leather and it fits her perfectly, almost as if it were made just for her. She turns around and he pulls the straps tight before fastening them in place. The woman, standing in a small padded room and fully constrained by the black leather straitjacket, turns to the man and asks, Now what? Now we wait he tells her, before backing out of the room. A warning, though. Now a warning, she says. This is a one-off procedure, you can only do it once, he tells her before closing the door. She's confused. Is this the procedure? He's locking her in a cell? What is going on? She never should have agreed to this. Her mind starts to race, filling with bad thoughts, and they get even worse when the lights suddenly go out. She starts to panic, breathing heavily in the dark from both fear and from being constricted by the leather straitjacket. She calls out that she has changed her mind, she doesn't want to do this after all. No response. She's serious, she wants to end this right now and leave the room. It isn't working, it's actually making her feel worse. All the fears and anxieties that plague nearly every moment of her life come rushing in at once. Her mind races as she can feel all the telltale signs of a panic attack starting, a million little issues pulling her apart at the seams, leaving her stretched out and helpless to do anything to stop it. But then suddenly, there's a change. Like a cool breeze blowing across her face, the feelings of hopelessness and despair start to dissipate. Her anxieties feel as though they are melting away into the dark, leaving her with only the comforting embrace of the straitjacket. It isn't that she feels happy necessarily, she simply feels… normal. Content with herself and her situation. It's an incredible feeling, and she basks in the joy of not feeling bad. She doesn't know how long she's in the dark room feeling content. Minutes? Maybe hours? But eventually the door opens and the lights come on. Her session is over. She leaves the office with a new perspective on life. Most of the feelings of satisfaction have gone away already, but still she feels renewed, ready to tackle her issues so she can feel what she felt in the straitjacket again, so she can feel normal. By the next day, though, her new lease on life is completely gone, and she is on the phone with the man pleading with him to let her come in immediately and wear the straitjacket again. He warned her, though, that it was a one-off procedure. Too much exposure is dangerous. She needs to focus on other treatments instead. 
The woman only wants to come wear it for a little bit, though, just a few minutes to feel that way again. He tells her it's impossible, though. She should be happy it was so successful and move on to new techniques. And besides, he's leaving for a conference and won't be back for a week. They can discuss things again when he gets back. It's raining that night as a figure in a dark coat breaks the glass on the front door and reaches through to unlock the door. The woman enters the office and hangs her wet jacket on the wall. Her flashlight illuminates the room they have their sessions in. No one is there. She walks deeper into the building and spots the door to the padded room. She passes by and goes even further to a back room that she's never been in before. In the room, against a wall, is a metal trunk. She opens it to find the dark garment bag with the leather straitjacket inside. What do you want me to do again? The young man asks. He was just supposed to be delivering a pizza, and his boss would be angry to learn that he allowed a customer to invite him in. This is my office, she tells him, and I'm working on some new techniques for my patients, but I need to try them out myself first. That makes sense, right? Well, uh, sure, I guess, he responds. But for this particular one, I need some help. It's a secret, though, so I can't get any of my colleagues to help me. But you can help me, right? The young man nervously swallows the soda she's given him and nods in agreement. She explains that all he has to do is help her tighten the straitjacket, close the door, turn off the lights, and listen. In a little while, when she's finished, she'll ask him to come inside and take it off her. That's it. The young man still seems a little wary of the request. What happened to your door? He asks, but she ignores his question and pushes a wad of cash into his hand. The young man shuts the door to the padded cell, and a moment later, the lights go out. The woman is almost immediately taken back to the same mental place she was before. All of the thoughts that constantly repeat in her mind, the ones that she's never able to turn off, suddenly go quiet. She sighs with relief in her dark, safe space. But then, huh? she feels something. Not in her mind, but on her face. A twitch, just a little facial spasm. But then another. There's something wrong. Her face suddenly feels very tight, like it's being stretched. Her eyes grow wide. Her mouth pulls into an unintentional sneer. The young man hears the woman's muffled cries from inside the room and opens the door, but what he sees causes him to emit his own scream before he turns and runs out of the office into the stormy night. What the heck? The man thinks as he looks at the broken window on his office door. He enters to see that the door is still unlocked and that there's glass on the floor inside. He walks inside his office and looks around and doesn't see anything. But in an instant, there's a moment of realization. He runs to the back, to the door to the padded cell. The door to the room is ajar, and he listens. Is that breathing inside? He opens the door to the dark cell and turns on the light. The black leather straitjacket is sitting in the middle of the floor, except it isn't the floor anymore. Now, instead, a stretched layer of skin is spread across the padded room, with the outline of flattened bones visible underneath. The man's mind can't comprehend what it is that he's looking at, but then he sees it. In the far corner of the room, is the stretched out face of the woman, her eyelids pulled too tight to blink, leaving her eyes staring up at him. Through a stretched, contorted mouth, she whispers, Help me. Is there anything crueler than an object that is able to treat your mental health issues, yet has some of the most devastating side effects imaginable? In this humble doctor's opinion, no. And today's anomaly is just such an object. Designated SCP-482, it is perhaps better known as the Mentally Mutating Straitjacket. SCP-482 is a black leather straitjacket that is quite similar in appearance and construction to a mass-produced version, though as you'll see, it is completely unique. Although the straitjacket is comparable in size to other medium-sized versions, it is somehow able to fit virtually any and all body types and sizes. A tag inside contains the words, Made in Xiaoyan, hand wash only, no Acerahena powder, in faded text, though neither the city nor Acerahena powder appear to exist in any records that the SCP Foundation has been able to locate. There are no signs of wear on SCP-482, but there are several cuts on the straps that cinch the garment closed, and testing has shown that it is able to be further damaged, though any additional investigations of the extent to which it can be damaged have been suspended due to the lack of viable duplicates. The real anomalous effects of SCP-482 occur when the straitjacket is worn, and the two main effects, which occur one after the other, have been designated as Time Point Alpha and Time Point Beta. Time Point Alpha is used to refer to the initial stage of a subject wearing SCP-482 and can last a varied period of time, though it is most often between one and six hours of wear. 
During this period, the subject will report feeling mentally better, and any negative mental afflictions that they suffer from or are forced to deal with will appear to disappear completely. Additionally, any medications that they may be on will have their effects negated entirely, leading to them returning a result on Foundation Standard Psychological Tests that is consistent with a baseline mentally stable individual. The effects of Time Point Alpha are temporary, and once the subject is separated from SCP-482, any mental illnesses they are living with will be seen to return, but they will disappear once more if the straitjacket is worn again. However, the amount of time a subject spends experiencing the effects of Time Point Alpha are cumulative and given enough time inside of the straitjacket, they will always eventually reach the second stage of SCP-482. Time Point Beta refers to the subsequent time period that passes if a subject is still wearing SCP-482 once Time Point Alpha lapses. During this period, the changes to the subject will no longer be mental, and instead, they will begin to experience physical effects. The exact nature of the physical changes will vary though they do seem to be related in some way to the subject's own mental health issue, with the degree of the change also seemingly related to the severity of their issue. Through the testing of SCP-482 by Foundation researchers on D-Class personnel, a number of different manifestations of the straitjacket's anomalous effects have been documented, and they're recorded in a file designated Experiment Log SCP-482. In the first test, a male D-Class diagnosed with schizophrenia was placed inside of the leather straitjacket, he immediately reported feeling eerily calm, and he was observed to simply sit and stare at the wall with a blank expression for 2 hours and 49 minutes, a period which was later determined to be his time point alpha. Time point beta began one minute later at 2 hours and 50 minutes when the subject's body began to contort, and he remarked that he was in a great deal of pain. Various parts of the subject's body began to increase in mass and size, including his head, as his eyes began to bulge out. He called in agony while attempting to make eye contact with the researchers who were observing through a glass viewing window for 34 minutes until a termination order was given. Subsequent examination of the subject's body revealed that his body mass had increased by roughly 180% due to rapid bone and muscle growth. It's unclear what physical process caused this, though genetic tests showed that his DNA had abnormally shortened telomere strands. The observers also reported they experienced an unnatural feeling that rendered them unable to move in a normal manner while the subject was making eye contact with them. For the second test, another male D-Class, though one who had been diagnosed with a paranoid personality disorder, was placed in the straitjacket. During his alpha exposure, he reported a satisfying quiet in his head, with none of the disembodied voices that normally plagued his thoughts speaking to him. He still appeared content after two hours and was taken out of the suit, though after requesting to be placed back inside, he was allowed to return to wearing SCP-482. After an additional one hour and thirty minutes, though, the beta exposure began. Visible bulges appeared on his neck and shoulders, and after four minutes, he began screaming for someone to stop talking and get out of his head. More bulges appeared on his body, and audio recording equipment in the room picked up mysterious sounds that analysis has revealed to have been as many as seven distinct voices speaking in an unknown language. The termination order was issued 25 minutes later, and a later autopsy revealed that each bulge actually contained a fully formed mouth and voice box. Observing researchers also reported that during the test, they had seen flashes of movement in their peripheral vision subsequent review of the taped footage revealed small shadows appearing and disappearing in the room throughout the test. Next up was a female D-Class who had been diagnosed with hyperphagia, which is a disorder that can cause an extreme increase in appetite and can remove the ability to satiate one's hunger. Upon being placed in SCP-482, she remarked that, for the first time ever, I am actually full. She felt this way for an hour and 58 minutes, after which she began to feel a pain in her abdomen. The D-Class fell into the fetal position as the pain increased, and her limbs were observed to begin retracting into her body, accompanied by loud snapping sounds as presumably the bones started to crack and break. Oh god, it's eating me! Oh god, it hurts! She cried out, and a termination order was immediately issued. The autopsy that followed revealed that the woman's body had somehow formed a second digestive system that had begun to consume her own body mass, and if left unchecked, would have eventually digested it in its entirety. Following this test, the observing researchers reported that they were unable to satisfy their own hunger cravings with normal amounts of food, and several of them actually had to be restrained by security staff in the on-site cafeteria. Luckily, these urges appeared to fade after several days. In the final test, a D-Class personnel with pyromania was placed in SCP-482. 
Despite the impulse control disorder normally causing them to start fires whenever given the chance, they now ignored all of the flammable materials offered to them by researchers. After one hour and 33 minutes, though, thermometers in the testing room noted a sudden sharp rise in temperature. This was followed by a powerful explosion of heat and flames when the D-Class spontaneously ignited. The testing room was completely destroyed, and nearby hallway A13 suffered catastrophic damage. All observing researchers were also lost in the conflagration. SCP-482, though, survived. Surprisingly, the body of the D-Class was also able to be recovered, and though the autopsy was made difficult due to the heat it still exuded, a discovery was made. Inside the body, a new organ was found, one that appeared to be sustaining some type of constant reaction that produced heat, as well as strong magnetic waves, and this organ has been placed in containment for future study. SCP-482 is currently being kept in a containment locker at a secure site, with access restricted to level 2 personnel and above. The maximum time allowed for testing is one hour after mutations manifest, and any test subjects who reach time point beta are to be terminated. Following termination, SCP-482 is to be removed from their body prior to autopsy. The straitjacket is then to be thermally cleansed and all biological traces of the prior subject removed before it is used for testing again. Now I bet you are telling yourself, well this sounds pretty easy to contain, I bet this is a safe class anomaly, and normally I would agree with you. But perhaps you noticed something strange in the experiment log. Did you pay attention to the reports from observing researchers that they too had begun to experience some rather unusual effects simply from watching SCP-482 affect a subject? Did it seem to you as though the mentally mutating straitjacket was somehow projecting the mental illnesses experienced by the subjects onto those observing it? It appears that there may be more to SCP-482 than first meets the eye, and this mystery only deepens when one reads the containment procedures on this anomaly's file and realizes that the person overseeing SCP-482 research is none other than SCP Foundation legend Dr. Bright. Is the actual testing of SCP-482 not actually taking place on the D-Class personnel, but on the SCP Foundation researchers? A convoluted experiment designed to discover the true extent of its anomalous effects. When it comes to this Euclid-class anomaly, only Dr. Bright knows for sure. The car screeches to a halt, the door swings open, and the doctor tumbles out. He lands on his hands and knees in the dirt and throws up the few remaining drops of stomach acid left in his system. He's put his hand in something sticky. He can feel an insect wriggling under his palm. Behind him, the door slams, and a pair of boots walk around to his side of the car. The translator accompanying him does not offer a hand to help him up. It had been a long car journey with many similar stops. Fortunately, this was the last. The doctor gingerly gets to his feet and takes in his surroundings. He finds himself in a small village hidden amongst thick trees. He's not sure what time it is anymore. The flights, time zones, and car journeys wrought havoc on his circadian rhythms. He knows he is in China, somewhere very remote and very rural. He'd tried to look it up with the maps on his phone during the journey, but he'd lost signal a long time ago. One thing is clear, however. It is the middle of the night. The car's headlights are the only light source in the village. No one comes out to greet them. The doctor brushes himself off and turns to his translator. The man nods towards a small hut near the back of the village, just beyond the headlight's reach. His translator is a man of few words, both ironic and deeply unhelpful. The doctor does not know a word of Mandarin himself. In silence, the two men approach the hut. The doctor reaches out to knock, but his translator has already pushed the door open. Inside, there is just the dim light of a lamp. Almost everything is covered in shadow. It is almost dark enough that they can't see the cobwebs. Almost. Silken strings drape themselves over every surface, wall, and item in the little hut. It's impossible in places to even see what item of furniture is hiding beneath all of the webs. The translator reaches out to touch one of the webs in fascination, but the doctor grabs his hand, shaking his head. He hands the translator a face mask and a pair of disposable gloves. Annoyed, the translator takes them, but does not put them straight on, choosing instead to walk deeper into the hut. After a second, the doctor follows, only he can't help the feeling that something's not right. Something's missing. Here, says the translator. It is the first word he said in hours. He's standing behind a little curtain looking down at something, as the doctor joins him there and almost wretches from the stench. Lying in the bed is an emaciated man. He looks like he hasn't eaten in days. His wrists and ankles are bound tightly to the bed, so tightly, in fact, that his circulation has been cut off. 
The doctor can see right away the telltale signs of gangrene spreading across his palms. But they're too late. The man isn't moving. His bony chest isn't rising or falling. Worst of all, he must have been dead for a while now. There are sheets of spiderwebs draped over his sallow skin, like some kind of deathly funeral shroud. The translator mutters something in Mandarin. It doesn't take a PhD to pick up on the evident frustration in his voice. A whole night of driving out to the middle of nowhere for nothing. The translator kicks over a wooden stool. The sound is muffled by the thick layer of cobwebs as he storms out of the hut. But something is wrong here. The doctor can't walk out just yet. Toxicology. That's his field. Poisons, toxins, infections, bites. But that's the thing. There are no bites anywhere on this man's body. Head to toe, under the layer of spider silk, there are no welts, bruises, or puncture marks. The only darkened veins standing out are on his fingertips as they rot away from stagnant blood. Nothing to do with poisons. But there's something else, too. A hut holding a dead body, full of spider's webs, but yet, no spiders. A scream fills the hut. The bed rocks violently. The doctor looks down in horror to see the dead man is not as dead as he'd appeared. He thrashes this way and that, straining against the ties on his limbs. The doctor calls out for the translator, who appears at his side almost immediately. The translator shouts something in Mandarin, trying to be heard over the dying man's screams, but it's no use. The man throws his head this way and that, trying to bash his chin into his own chest or hit the top of his skull against the nearest wall. It is no use. The man opens cloudy eyes that stare wildly around the room, searching for something, anything that could help him break free from his restraints. Without thinking, the doctor grabs the man's head and holds it steady. He peers into the man's weeping eyes. Bizarre. If he didn't know better, he'd say they almost looked as if they had spider's webs built up beneath the eyelids, clouding out the man's windows to see the world. Small, silvery balls of thick liquid gather in the corners of them, too dense, too murky to be tears. From somewhere beneath the haze, the man's pupils find the doctor's. In an instant, his body falls still. It is almost as if he relaxed completely. A guttural murmur comes from the man's throat. The doctor looks to the translator for help. Free me. The doctor looks down at his patient. This is the part of medicine he had always hated the most. At what point do you let someone go? At what point do you say it's too late? Is it even right for him to make that decision? Looking at the man lying in front of him, a wave of sadness washes over him. His initial assessment had been right. It is too late. Even if he could treat the gangrene in the man's limbs with amputation, there's still starvation and dehydration to deal with. And then, the apparent venom from the spiders. Except, there are no signs of venom. Perhaps it isn't too late after all. With the right treatment, there may be a chance to... The man's wrist snaps, becoming a loose glove of broken bone that's easily pulled from the restraint. A foul stench of exposed rotten flesh hits the doctor like a slap in the face. He reels back in horror as the man pulls his other decimated hand free too. Unbound by his bed, the man lets out an animalistic roar. Sitting up in the bed, he tips his head back and starts pounding at it with what is left of his hands. Jagged wrist bones, barely housed by paper-thin skin, slam repeatedly into his forehead, harder and harder with each hit. The doctor is frozen to the spot, staring as the man smashes his own head. Skin splits, revealing white bone. Bone cracks. Then, with one last effort that seems to take every remaining morsel of the man's energy, he turns and crunches his fractured skull against the wall, caving the front half of his head in like a deflated basketball. Silence, more terrifying than any sound, fills the hut. The doctor stares at the body. An almost comical image pops into his head. The head looks like just a red plastic bag that someone had left on the floor, full of shards of broken pottery. He almost smiles. But then, the spiders appear. Just one at first, then ten, then a stream, then an eruption, spewing out of the gaps in the man's head like water shooting out of a collapsing dam. The tiny pink spiders flood the room, shooting up the walls into every crack and crevice, writhing and rippling around their feet. That breaks the doctor's paralysis. He and the translator sprint for the door. They crash through it and cover the length of the village in seconds. Grabbing the door handles, they haul themselves up into the 4x4. The translator slams it into reverse and almost crashes into a tree as he turns them around and back onto the dirt trail. They drive all through the night, not talking. The doctor gets control of his breathing, but his heart does not stop hammering the whole time. He cannot shake the images that fill his head. Spiders. Tiny pink spiders. Everywhere. The sun is just rising when the driver suddenly pulls over sharply. His eyes are wide, his face deathly pale. He doesn't say a word as he sits forward, reaches down the back of his shirt, 
and pulls out one tiny pink spider. The doctor yells in shock and hurriedly grabs a sample pot for the man to throw the spider into. The two men sit there in the front of the car in the warm morning light, staring through the glass at the arachnid. It looks soft. That's the most bizarre thing about it. Rather than having a hard, dark exoskeleton like other spiders, this one looks fleshy. No, that's not quite right. It looks fatty. It looks squishy like parts of the body that get exposed in traumatic crashes. Wrinkles and folds of pink, mushy cells with fatty deposits. Except it cannot be made from those kinds of things. It's a spider. As they watch, the spider seems to recognize their attention. It stands up on its back four legs and raises the remaining ones in the air. It looks almost as if it is doing some kind of mating dance for them. It turns its back to them, revealing a pattern of brightly colored dots across its abdomen. The doctor drags his eyes away from the dance. The sun is gone. Night has fallen again. His stomach stabs at him in hunger. But that can't be right. It was sunrise only a few seconds ago. The headache had started as he sat down on his flight. Now, five hours in and somewhere over an ocean, he knows he is not going to sleep tonight. He can't get the image of all those spiders out of his mind. He needs to report this. And he will, definitely, but not yet. A spider crawls up the seat in front of him. His heart stops, and he sits back violently in his seat, eyes wide. On the floor of the plane, pink spiders everywhere. They're not real. They're not real, just his imagination. He needs some rest. That's what he needs. He'll fly home, wait for the headache to pass. Then he can call someone. But right now, he just feels too groggy to do any of that. The adrenaline of his hallucination passes as quickly as it had come. He can feel the glass pot in his pocket tapping occasionally, begging for his attention. His head aches. He runs a hand through his hair. That can't be. Is he really growing gray hairs already? In frustration, he reaches up and taps at his forehead. Much to his surprise, the headache disappears almost instantaneously. If anything, it feels... good? He sits there for several minutes, drumming a couple of fingers against his forehead, and before he knows it, he's fast asleep, all his fears and anxieties long behind him. Only they are not behind him. Once he touches down, he goes straight home to his apartment. No spiders to be seen. Why not? Shouldn't there be more spiders? He certainly wants more spiders. His headache comes back, he drinks water, takes some medicine, goes for a nap, and turns off all of the lights, but nothing seems to work. Even the tapping stops working more spiders. A call lights up his phone screen, an international number. He takes a long time to answer it. It's his translator. The man's voice is shrill, panicked, far beyond what the doctor had ever heard before, even when they'd been running from the spiders. The translator is not making much sense. His words are slurred, and his sentences stop and start seemingly at random. None of it makes sense. The doctor turns the volume on his phone down. It's too loud for his headache, way too loud. Government knows. Should have worn gloves. Too late. The pain. The pleasure. Using a hammer. Huh? None of it makes any sense. The doctor looks down at his phone screen. The call is gone. His phone is dead. Hadn't it been on full a moment ago? What time is it? And where are the spiders? He punches himself in the head. A smile spreads across his face. He is in bed now. Something red around him. His pillow. It is soaked red. Could that be from his head? The sample pot sits on his bedside table. Only now... It's empty. How did that happen? Wasn't he standing in the kitchen a moment ago? He's losing time. He runs a hand through his hair. Webbing clings between his fingers. He sits under his desk with a hammer in his hand, euphoria washing over his body. Just once more. Eight more times. He hits the hammer against his forehead. Endorphins flood every cell of his body, so powerful he almost passes out as the pleasure chemicals crawl inside of him, oozing silk through the pores of his skin. Webs hang all over his apartment now. Just one more hit. Eight more hits. That feeling, it's just so... His wrists, his ankles. How many limbs? Four. Not enough. That light. Where is he? Figures crowd around him. It is hard to see them. Something's in his eye. Everything looks blurry and far away. The pain. The pain is back. His head. Someone, please. He screams and pulls against the bindings on his limbs. The pain. It's... It's impossible. He needs to make it stop. Just one hit. Just one more hit from the hammer. That'll be enough. Something is behind his eye. He can feel it. Something crawling on the back of his eyeball. But that doesn't matter. None of it matters, except getting his pain to stop. No more headaches. 
Just one more hit. That's all he needs. The hospital staff have never seen anything like this before. They're out of their depth here. In the dead of night, they arrange for the doctor to be transferred to a specialist facility in the back of an ambulance. It is a challenge to get him out of his bed, as the spider's webs secreting from his skin have all but tied him to the linen. As fate would have it, a drunk driver gives the doctor his final wish. Not seeing a red light, the driver plows full speed into the side of the ambulance, sending it spinning off the road and down a hill, killing everyone inside, including the doctor. When police arrive at the scene in the early hours of the morning, they find the driver sitting on his own, staring at some small insect by the wreckage. The driver is unharmed by the incident. His only complaint as he spends the following night in police custody is that he feels a mild headache coming on. Anyone experiencing that headache is likely already too far gone from their exposure to SCP-632, an anomalous species of cognitohazardous arachnids nicknamed intrusive arachnid thoughts. Unconfirmed reports of mysterious spider colonies have been springing up across Asia, particularly in rural China, for several decades in connection with this anomaly. In 1972, the population of an unnamed town in the Anhui province were found to have been almost entirely wiped out. An entire town of corpses, each with their heads caved in, brain matter missing. With 106 dead, with 23 injured, this case is to this day the deadliest confirmed SCP-632 breach. Strange as it may be, physiologically speaking, SCP-632 could be considered cute. Their bodies are squishy in texture, bright pink, and are in fact made up of human tissue, brain tissue to be exact, coated in a layer of protective fat. As happened to our unfortunate doctor, SCP-632 reproduces parasitically within the human skull. The exact mechanics of this process remain unclear. It is believed that SCP-632 infects its human host through a selection of sensory triggers. Those infected have each testified to having been exposed to the following. Firstly, viewing the pattern on SCP-632's abdomen, exposed during the dance that the spiders often do under observation. Secondly, making physical contact with SCP-632. And lastly, through exposure to as yet unidentified chemical compounds secreted by the older SCP-632 instances. This is where luck was not on our doctor's side. He was smart enough to wear gloves during his encounter with SCP-632 in China, which may have been enough to protect him from being infected. However, upon his arrival as he fell out of the car, his hand landed directly in an SCP-632 web, housing a solitary live spider. If he had remembered his car sickness tablets, this could have all been avoided. Within three hours of initial exposure to SCP-632, the subject will start to experience mild headaches, followed by an uncanny sensation that their skin is growing silk. During this period, MRI scans have found that small filament-like structures start to form within the host's brain tissue. As these filaments multiply and spread throughout the brain, the subjects report developing an obsession with spiders. The brain tissue steadily deteriorates, leading to changes in personality and mood, as well as irrational behavior. Over the coming days, the headaches grow more severe as the filament cells press against the blood vessels lining the inside of the skull. Subjects find that they can relieve this sensation by tapping or hitting their forehead, replacing it with a pleasurable feeling as the filaments release endorphins upon impact. This is part of the sinister final act of SCP-632's reproduction. After six to seven days, as the host's headaches worsen, they find they have to hit their skull harder and harder to alleviate the pain and get that chemical high. Eventually, driven mad by the pain inside their head, they crack through their own skull. At this point, all of the gestating spiders that have been forming within the filaments in their brain, estimated to number between 80 and 200, can escape through the opening. Because of its unique containment difficulties caused by its cognitohazardous properties, SCP-632 has been given the Euclid object class. There is currently one live colony of SCP-632 stored in the biological containment wing of Site-52. The colony is housed in a small enclosure measured 20 cm by 40 cm by 20 cm and sustained on a diet of insects and water supplied through a vacuum chute. All personnel that work in proximity to SCP-632 are regularly screened. Physical contact with any SCP-632 is strictly prohibited, and all personnel are required to wear protective equipment and respirators at all times while handling live or deceased specimens. They keep a close eye on anyone developing any symptoms especially headaches, the feeling of silk on the skin, or intrusive arachnid thoughts. A truck pulls up in front of a quiet suburban home. The faded sign on the truck's flank reads, Exterminator. It's not the most glamorous job, but hey, someone's gotta do it. In all his years of extermination work, 
This exterminator has seen it all. Ants, termites, rats, but he's never taken a job that he couldn't handle. As he looks out at this sprawling suburban home, he can't help but notice the nicely manicured lawn and the beautifully sculpted topiaries. The trash cans are neatly stacked on the curb, ready for pickup. It doesn't look like the sort of home that would have a vermin problem. But then again, this exterminator knows better than anyone that looks can be deceiving. People often think that only run-down slums will attract vermin, but he knows that even the cleanest kitchens can still have a problem with unwelcome invaders. He jumps from his truck and walks up to the front door, carrying his equipment on his back and a clipboard in his hands. He quickly reviews the specifics of this job from the paper on his clipboard. A woman called his company complaining about a major cockroach infestation, demanding that they send someone right away. He remembers that she sounded downright frantic on the phone, much more agitated than you would expect from a little cockroach problem. Then again, he thinks, some people just really don't like bugs. He rings the doorbell and waits. A crabby-looking old woman answers the door. It's about time that you got here, she snaps. There's a huge cockroach infestation in the basement, hundreds of them. I want you to go down there and do something about it. Absolutely, ma'am, says the exterminator politely. Part of his job is assuaging frantic customers. He's used to this sort of thing. So many homeowners are absolutely terrified of insects that they fall to pieces at the sight of a spider or a cockroach. He's accustomed to dealing with all manner of creepy crawlies, so he's not at all worried. He's sure this will be an easy job. You're in good hands with us. We'll kill those roaches dead, he says, recalling the company slogan that he's required to repeat. They're in the basement, says the old woman. I've tried to kill them, but there's too many of them, and they're too fast. I'm way too old to be running after a bunch of bugs. It tires these old bones out. I was down there with a spray can myself, but I just keep getting too tired to keep it up. It's almost like those bugs were making me sleepy. Of course, ma'am. The exterminator can barely keep from rolling his eyes as this old woman continues to rattle off complaints about the cockroaches in her basement. Of course, there's an easy explanation for all of this. This woman is very old, so she wouldn't be able to run around much without tiring herself out. That's much more plausible than believing that the cockroaches were somehow magically draining her energy. But again, he's used to listening to all sorts of crazy stories from frightened clients, so he doesn't give it much thought. Then I'll take a look and see what kind of problem you have. The exterminator opens the door to the basement and peers down into the darkness. He gropes blindly for the light switch, and eventually his fingers connect. He flips the switch, and a bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling flickers on. The stairs leading down into the depths of the basement are warped and rickety. He makes a mental note to watch his step as he descends. The boards ominously creak under his feet. The basement is filled with junk, all the accumulated debris of the owner's whole life. He sees piles of cardboard boxes overflowing with old books and raggedy clothes. Paint cans are stacked in the corner in defiance of any pretensions to fire safety. The boiler rattles and wheezes. It sounds like it might need to be replaced fairly soon. The air smells damp and musty, and he wonders if the old woman has ever cleaned this basement. Looking at this mess, it's no wonder that she would have a problem with cockroaches. The exterminator can't help but think about how messy and decrepit this cellar looks compared to the immaculate facade of the house outside. The exterminator pulls out his flashlight and flicks it on. He aims it into the corners, hoping to see some evidence of this insect invasion. He sees nothing. The old woman described a basement infested with hordes of insects, yet he doesn't see a single one. He stifles a yawn. Why does he feel so sleepy? This job must be more draining than he thought, because he's already feeling spent. Could it be that the old woman was right? Is there something in the basement that is making him sleepy? Could it be something about those cockroaches that she blames? No, that's just ridiculous. He knows enough about cockroaches to know that can't be the case, and he's not about to start believing fantasies now. He's a rational guy. He knows that you can't lose your head and expect to do well in this line of work. Besides, he reminds himself, he still hasn't actually seen any evidence of a cockroach problem at all. He continues to poke around the basement and still finds nothing. He frowns. This is really concerning. First of all, he doesn't relish the idea of explaining to the old woman upstairs that she doesn't actually have a cockroach problem at all. She's probably not going to take kindly to him telling her that she is delusional. But also, he was hoping that this would be a big job. If he can't find any bugs, he won't be able to justify charging the old woman for this visit. What a waste of his time. Suddenly, he catches movement out of the corner of his eye. He spins around, aiming his flashlight into the corner, just quick enough to see something scuttle through a crack in the wall. Did he imagine that? No, he tells himself. He definitely saw something. Great. He approaches the corner, his spirit suddenly buoyed again. He's happy that he'll actually have something to report to his upstairs client. Maybe he'll find a whole nest in that crack. That would be great. He could justify recommending a full house fumigation then, and that would bring some much-needed cash into the business. 
He narrows his eyes and peers closer. Even with his flashlight being trained on the crack, it's so dark in the basement that it's hard to see. He can see the wooden boards of the house's superstructure through the flaking paint on the wall, and if he squints just right, he thinks he can just see something squirming right there between the boards. Whatever it is, it stops moving when his flashlight beam washes over it. That's very unusual. He knows from experience that when you turn over a rock, bugs will always race for cover. They aren't smart enough to play dead, yet that's exactly what it looks like this insect is doing. He rubs his eyes with his free hand, trying to blink away his sudden sleepiness. He's feeling even drowsier than before, but he really needs to finish this job. He moves in closer, and the cockroach decides to make a break for it. The insect skitters away, desperately trying to worm its little gray body between the boards to escape. The exterminator moves fast. He pulls a pair of tweezers from his pocket and pinches them closed on the squirming insect's abdomen before it can wriggle away. He holds it up close to his nose so that he can get a better look at his prey. The exterminator laughs. He's seen every kind of insect in his time and he can recognize a cockroach when he sees it. This is no cockroach. He can tell from a glance that he's looking at a perfectly harmless cricket. Like so many people, that old woman must have just panicked at the sight of a bug and assumed it was a cockroach. That's good. Most people don't mind having crickets in their home, so this old lady will probably be happy to hear the news. Then again, is it a cricket? When he looks closer, he sees that it's got some unusual features. There are strange barbed hooks visible on the underside of its abdomen, sharp enough that even an experienced exterminator like him thinks better of holding this thing too close to his face. Are those stingers? Could this bug be poisonous? And even stranger, if he looks closer, he thinks he might even see metal wires protruding from its exoskeleton. The exterminator yawns again, rubbing his eyes. He suddenly feels so sleepy. What's wrong with him? Did he not get enough sleep last night? I should have had a second cup of coffee this morning, he tells himself. Why can't I keep focused? His words trail off as, all at once, sleep overtakes him. He collapses to the floor with a thud, dropping his tweezers. The cricket bounces free as the tweezers fall from his hands. The cricket drops to the floor and quickly rights itself. Instead of running, though, the tiny insect turns around. It skitters toward the prone form of the exterminator, making a straight line for his head as if it were moving with intelligent purpose. This doesn't look like the frantic, stimulus response movements of an insect. The insect crawls over the slumbering man's face, hoisting itself over his chin, then lips, and then right up to his left nostril. With one sudden movement, the cricket slithers up his nose and disappears. The exterminator snorts and mumbles in his sleep, but the sensations of an insect wriggling up his nose does nothing to rouse him from his sleep. After a few minutes, the exterminator blinks his eyes open. He sits up with a groan and rubs his head. What the hell just happened? Did he pass out? How embarrassing. He looks around, finding his tweezers and his flashlight on the ground next to him. But no matter where he looks, he can't see the insect anymore. Where did it go? He returns to the crack in the wall for a second look, but sees nothing. Absently, the exterminator rubs his nose. He feels a vague discomfort in his sinuses, and he wonders if maybe his allergies are acting up but otherwise he remembers nothing about his bizarre experience. He probes his fingers into the crack and wiggles them around, hoping to find some evidence of the missing insect. There's nothing there. Well, at least he knows what he's dealing with, and it's definitely no cockroach. Eventually, he shrugs his shoulders helplessly and returns upstairs. Did you find the cockroaches? Asks the old woman when he returns to the top of the stairs. I know there are roaches down there. He shakes his head. Ma'am, I searched the whole basement and I didn't find any cockroaches. He explains to her that all he could find in the basement was a harmless cricket. The old woman starts to argue with him, insisting that what she saw in her basement was no cricket, but the exterminator has already made up his mind. This is annoying. He thought that she would be happy to hear that she doesn't have roaches, but now she just wants to make a fuss. He's not going to waste any more time on this nonsense, not when he has real work to do. He shakes his head as he repacks his equipment and prepares to leave. The exterminator returns to his truck and turns the ignition. As he pulls away, his mind is already mulling his next job. He doesn't give another thought to this crabby old woman and her paranoia about cockroaches. He doesn't stop to wonder what became of that strange cricket that he found. It probably just crawled back into the wall, he thinks. He certainly would have no reason to think that the cricket is still with him, a new and permanent hitchhiker inside his head. The exterminator had just acquired a new lifelong friend, a lifelong friend that we call SCP-2119. SCP-2119 is a biomechanical creature that resembles a small gray insect, ranging from 5 to 15 millimeters in length, with a segmented body, six-jointed legs, and protrusions from the head and abdomen that resemble antennae and ovipostors respectively. 
However, SCP-2119 does not appear to reproduce by any means known to man, so these oviposters are likely simply a form of mimicry, something added to give SCP-2119 the appearance of a common insect to make it less conspicuous to humans. Genetic testing has determined that the organic parts of SCP-2119 are largely identical to those of Gryllus rubens, otherwise known as the southwestern field cricket. One notable difference between SCP-2119 and the field cricket, though, is that SCP-2119, also known as the transmitting parasite, has six barbed hooks on the underside of its body. Strangely, SCP-2119 also contains mechanical parts, including silicon parts that do not match any known make and platinum wiring, leading Foundation researchers to assume that SCP-2119 is an artificial life form. At this moment, who made SCP-2119 and why remains a mystery. In many ways, SCP-2119 not only looks like a normal insect, but also acts like one. It apparently possesses extremely rudimentary self-awareness and intelligence, comparable to that of its insect brethren, being able to sense potential hosts or detect danger. It displays many normal self-preservation instincts common to insect life. If discovered by a conscious human, it will flee or hide, but it does possess one self-defense measure that no normal insect does. Any human who comes into the proximity of SCP-2119 will start to feel drowsy, eventually succumbing to unconsciousness within 3 to 8 minutes. Once a human subject is unconscious, SCP-2119 will enter their head, either through the nostrils or the ear canal, and eventually make its way to the subject's brain, where it will use its barbed hooks to attach itself to the corpus callosum, which are the nerve fibers that permit communication between the left and right side of the brain. The human subject will gradually wake up with no memory of the event. After waking, the subject will return to their normal routine and continue living just as if they were unaffected. It does not appear that infection with the transmitting parasite causes any physical, mental, or psychological damage to hosts or impairs their daily lives in any way. All attempts to physically remove SCP-2119 from a host's brain have so far resulted in the death of the host, as SCP-2119 appears to have some way of halting a host's brain activity when it's threatened. Once a host is dead, SCP-2119 will exit the host's head, again either via the nostrils or ear canal, when it determines that no other humans are in the area. Once SCP-2119 has taken up residence in a host's brain, it will start broadcasting a 514.1875 MHz radio signal with a range of approximately 3 kilometers, consisting of a tone lasting 0.05 seconds at 2 second intervals, possibly with the intent of locating other infected human hosts. Once a connection has been established, specimens will transmit a continuous stream of tones of variable lengths between instances, ranging from 70 Hz to 1,305 Hz, with wavelengths ranging from 480 cm to 25 cm. Foundation personnel have so far been unable to discern any pattern in the signal, so it is unknown if it is a form of communication or simply random. Most insidious of all, SCP-2119 seems able to spontaneously manifest inside human brains without entering through the ear or nose. Humans coming into the proximity of an infected host have a 14% chance of spontaneously manifesting an instance of SCP-2119 in their own brains. Since SCP-2119 has no visible means of reproduction, exactly how it does this continues to baffle Foundation scientists. SCP-2119 specimens are stored individually in hermetically sealed tanks composed of RF-shielded glass and only removed for testing. Tests are to be conducted in hermetically sealed chambers composed of steel-reinforced concrete walls to block SCP-2119's radio transmissions. All personnel handling specimens of SCP-2119 are required to wear Level 3 hazardous material suits to protect them from infection. SCP-2119 was recently updated from the Euclid to Keter designation after a peculiar incident where all known hosts suddenly ceased all movement, respiration, and brain activity, effectively dying. After 7 minutes and 12 seconds, the subjects revived with no ill effects from their apparent deaths and no memory of the incident. During the 7 minute interval though, the transmitting parasites ceased broadcasting their usual static noises and instead broadcast what appears to have been a casual workplace conversation between two technicians working for whatever entity manufactures SCP-2119. All subjects infected with SCP-2119 began to emit a strange, scraping noise from their throats, which agents later determined was the sound of a chair being dragged across concrete. After this, subjects broadcast a conversation between two technicians who appeared to be oblivious to the fact that their words were being transmitted. During this conversation, the two technicians complained about a person named Reich, 
whom the Foundation assumes might be their supervisor, and afterwards, one of the two was heard asking for and then drinking a can of Coca-Cola. The broadcast abruptly ended when one of the two technicians suddenly noticed that they were live and cut the feed. The name Reich is so far the Foundation's only clue as to who or what is manufacturing SCP-2119, but so far all investigations into determining Reich's identity have been unsuccessful. It is currently impossible to estimate how many people in the general population are infected with SCP-2119, but considering how contagious the parasite is, it is thought to be extremely widespread. Without any known means of deactivating SCP-2119 without killing its host, containment of SCP-2119 is impossible. Who knows, you might already be infected yourself. It's not as if you would notice. The flashlight beam cast demonic shadows that twist and shift with the trembling of his hands. It makes the feeling worse, seeing those shadows twitch against the walls like they're somehow alive. But shadows can't be alive, can they? Another noise, a creak that sounds distinctly like the weight of someone's soul against the floorboard. Now the man knows he hasn't been imagining it. The beam of light sweeps over the room towards the source of the noise. To reveal the source of his torment is nothing. There's nothing there. And yet every feeling, every instinct, tells him that his eyes are wrong. Listen closer. Someone's here. And yet, there's no one. Not a soul. The man sighs. He swears he thought someone had gotten inside. He decides to double check, creating more dancing, unsettling shadows with his flashlight as he scans the rest of the living room. Nothing again. Then the kitchen. Still nothing. Back upstairs to the landing. Nobody but him. And in the bedroom? He's alone again. But he doesn't feel alone. In fact, he feels the opposite. The undeniable presence of someone else there. Or something else. He switches the flashlight back off and stays still. There's no point in trying to sleep now. The uncertainty of it all is bound to keep him awake. So he stands there, surrounded by the dark and the silence, just waiting for the next sign. Another creak, breathing, a footstep, anything. Even in the dark, it's like he can feel the eyes on him. The back of his neck bristles, hair standing to attention like a breath passing over his skin. What if it is? What if it's right there, right behind him? The flashlight is back on in a second as he turns around. The light illuminates the space behind him, and there's still nothing there. But despite finding no sign of anyone else in the apartment, despite knowing for certain he's alone, the man doesn't feel alone. It feels like there's someone watching. In fact, it's always felt like there's someone watching. Has this ever happened to you? Of course it has. Most of us, if not all of us, have at one point or another experienced that same sinister sensation. You hear something move, only to see nothing out of place. What sounds like a footstep turns out to be just the foundations of your house settling. And all the while, you can't escape that uncanny and unnerving feeling that somebody's watching you. Could they be across the street, peering in through your window? Or maybe, just maybe, they're inside, right behind you, hiding in the only place you would never look. You might write this off as just paranoia, a primal, self-preserving instinct passed down from our earliest ancestors, going haywire as it keeps a lookout for imminent threats when there are none. But it's not that. Not at all. It's both out there and in your head, all around, nearly wherever you go. And it's always watching. They call it causal absent paranoia. At least, that's the official term. If you ever find yourself looking up the definition, then you'll most likely wind up reading words to this effect. The healthy brain overreacting to natural stimulus due to overindulgence, excessive stress, lack of sleep, and other such strains to the mind and body. But that's just the definition that the SCP Foundation wants you to know. And it's not hard to see why. After all, it removes that unsettling sense of mystery, the unknown factor of it all. Chalking it up to stress or overactive imagination, it reminds you not to worry and that it's all just your mind playing tricks on you. But it isn't. Your brain is working fine and is, in fact, warning you of danger. And that danger is SCP-3010. The Foundation's research has uncovered that the feeling of being watched stems from something very, very real. 
an undetectable entity that they have designated SCP-3010-1. You might be better acquainted with it as that brief dash of movement out of the corner of your eye or the noises you can't explain. In other words, the things that go bump in the night. But if you ever get that feeling, like someone else is staring at you, observing you against your will, then that's your best indicator. You're not alone. It's in the room with you. And it's watching. Always watching. It doesn't happen every time. None of us are going around constantly feeling like some unseen entity is watching us. At least, the lucky ones aren't. While manifestations of the entity are somewhat random and inconsistent, the SCP Foundation has determined that certain requirements can first be met in order to deliberately cause SCP-3010-1 to successfully manifest. These specifics relate to the space that a person is currently inhabiting. For starters, anything too small won't work. So that's any tight or cramped spaces, single rooms, or sterile environments that are shut off from the outside world, like hospitals or prisons. Foundation containment cells also fall into this latter category. But anything bigger, particularly in houses or living spaces comprised of at least 500 square meters in terms of floor space, are prime real estate for the entity, SCP-3010-1, especially if the lights are turned down low, if not switched off completely, and if there's only one living person present inside. Now, if you were expecting that the moment you're next home alone, that you could just turn out the lights and summon SCP-3010-1, then you'd be wrong. At any rate, we wouldn't recommend trying it. Little is known about the entity itself. It has hardly anything in the way of physical traits that the Foundation knows about. In terms of where it first came from, why it depends on stalking and observing humans, or even what it wants, there are no answers. The Foundation has, however, learned the following things about SCP-3010-1. For one, it is totally imperceptible. It can't be observed at all not in any perceivable wavelength of light. So put down the thermals and night vision goggles or the UV light, the only surefire way to tell, or rather, guess, where it is at any given time, is after any kind of reactive incident with the entity. Secondly, the Foundation has noticed that SCP-3010-1 interacts differently with human beings who display the symptoms of avoidant disorders. This can include those suffering from social anxiety or inhibition, or who are typically withdrawn, around a full half of people with these avoidant disorders will not react to scenarios wherein the entity manifests. In short, the reactive events caused by SCP-3010-1 often don't affect those with avoidant disorders, or at least 50% of those people. However, the half that the entity can interact with often feels the effects of SCP-3010 with a lot more intensity. The unnerving feeling of being watched becomes full-blown inescapable paranoia as for what exactly SCP-3010-1 looks like, the Foundation is at a loss. Given the entity can't be perceived, it makes getting a witness sketch or a mugshot somewhat tricky. However, there is one thing that the SCP Foundation knows for sure. It does have the limitations of a physical form. This isn't an incorporeal, ethereal ghost that it can phase through walls and other solid objects. SCP-3010-1 has a physical presence and it seems to have an awareness of this. It's for that reason it won't manifest in smaller spaces like single occupant rooms or particular places with no windows or doors like foundation containment cells. By avoiding these places, it can't be trapped. SCP-3010-1 remains passively hostile toward human beings, and it will only directly engage a subject when a certain number of set triggers are met. Those that inadvertently cause this to happen find themselves receiving a particularly grim fate. Those who actively seek out or attempt to hunt the entity, especially with the intent to destroy it, are more likely to cause SCP-3010-1 to manifest. Sometimes it's worth trying to ignore the ominous sound of creaking coming from deep within your house rather than going looking for what made it. Anyone spending a prolonged period of time around mirrors is also likely to trigger a manifestation. The same can be said for those in unlit or dimly lit rooms, along with those who endure a long period of isolated, continuous silence, or make any attempt to call anyone else for help. With enough of these factors met, enough space, a lack of lighting, and no more or less than one person in a room or house, SCP-3010-1 will manifest and trigger what is known as a reactive event. 
This can be achieved by doing anything that increases the adrenaline levels of an isolated person, from creepy noises to the instinctive sensation that comes from being directly watched. Those few who have managed to survive their encounters with the entity have described the symptoms of SCP-3010 coming from behind. They will experience the observation or presence of another being coming from directly behind them. Should they find themselves backed against a wall, they will feel compelled to avoid the nearest window or dark corner. Mirrors are also a cause of major aversion for these victims, often causing those experiencing causal absent paranoia to flee to other rooms without any reflective surfaces present. Anyone currently undergoing the effects of SCP-3010 additionally will not be able to just sleep it off either. The symptoms caused by the impending presence of the entity directly inhibit a person's ability to fall asleep, not just out of fear, but due to a fundamental function of SCP-3010-1. The entity can manipulate the areas of the human brain that are responsible for the production of melatonin, the induction of sleep states, and the regulation of dreams. The SCP Foundation has discovered this disruption to sleep is caused by a gaseous substance that is dispersed into the local atmosphere. In order to avoid detection by the public, this phenomenon has also been given a medical classification causal absent paranoia-induced insomnia. Being unable to sleep or escape the feelings of being watched, the observed victim will inevitably panic. This is what prompts the reactive event. Usually SCP-3010-1 will manifest through mirrors or windows. Upon manifestation, the entity then proceeds to kill its target. It extracts some vital material from their body, then sucks what is left of them into the breach that it emerged from. When a reactive event has been triggered, SCP-3010-1 deploys a cognitohazardous effect as well. This total memory erasure acts in the way you might expect. Any memories of the targeted person involved in an SCP-3010-1 manifestation will be quickly destroyed. Anyone who might remember them, might think to check on them if they've been missing for a time, will cease to have any recollection of said person. Once the entity has them, it's as if they no longer exist. Of course, this total memory erasure can be circumvented with enough written evidence of a person's existence kept at all times, or with a number of Scranton reality anchors active in the nearby area. Once it has successfully manifested, retrieved a target, and dispatched them, some Foundation researchers believe that SCP-3010-1 enters into a state of stasis. This is known to attract reflective surfaces in the surrounding area, making mirrors or windows appear opaque. Symptoms associated with SCP-3010 are also experienced by any and all human beings within a certain radius of the reactive event. So even if you start to feel like there's someone watching you and look over your shoulder to find no one's there, then you could still be in the clear. Although, that might mean someone nearby wasn't as lucky as you were. Following the manifestation, the immediate vicinity of the completed reactive event will undergo a rapid deconstruction. A spatial anomaly takes place, causing the room or location where the target has recently been taken from to expand into a number of tight, dark corridors and various small rooms that will each be filled with mirrors and other reflective surfaces. To date, the Foundation has only recorded a handful of these reactive events, and thankfully, the spatial anomaly that triggers in their wake will normally dissipate after several hours. However, the paranoid symptoms of SCP-3010 will persist in the local area, which has led some researchers to question the validity of the entity going into stasis. There are those who believe it doesn't take breaks. While avoidant personality disorders can either have an extreme repelling or extreme attracting effect on an SCP-3010-1 entity, those with an excessive compulsion for human interaction, in particular, sociopaths, produce a far different and far stranger effect on the entity. Sociopathy is a mental health condition wherein somebody will consistently show that they have a lack of regard for the moral notions of right and wrong. While not all are violent, many sociopaths will often ignore the feelings of others unless they are attempting to manipulate those feelings, for example, appeasing somebody else to make themselves seem more likable and thus garner validation. Interactions between sociopaths and instances of SCP-3010-1 will often lead to the causation of several severe anomalies. One such sociopath has been incarcerated under the SCP Foundation, serving as a member of D-Class, the disposable subgroup of personnel comprised of violent criminals who often find themselves acting as human test subjects for anomalous experiments. 
This D-Class, D17729, also known as Mike, is selected for testing involving SCP-3010. The SCP Foundation constructs a specialized dummy house designed to keep the entity trapped. Inside these dummy households, a D-Class is placed, typically one that exhibits extremely reclusive tendencies. They are not told of the existence of SCP-3010-1, nor are they told what the entities are capable of. The D-Class in these houses must each believe that they are well and truly isolated, abandoned alone with the entity. Mike, being one of the D-Class assigned to an SCP-3010-1 containment house, has a video and audio recording device surgically implanted within his body before he awakens inside the dummy house. Confused, he examines his surroundings, searching the area for signs of anyone else living in what he momentarily believes is a real household. He traverses from the bedroom down the hallways towards the staircase, leading from the upper floor down to a foyer. All the while, early symptoms of SCP-3010 begin to surface. Mike checks behind himself as though he's starting to feel like someone is watching him. He tries to convince himself that he's alone, there's nobody behind him. Making a move for the front door, Mike finds he can't open it. He's sealed inside the house. Over the course of the next three hours, he navigates his way across the entire containment cell, occasionally musing to himself. More rapidly, he begins to experience the unnerving symptoms of causal absent paranoia, developing an aversion to the darker areas of the house. A few days later, Mike finds himself keeping all the lights on and deliberately avoiding mirrors. He has to practically argue with himself that he's not afraid of the dark, just in order to go downstairs to the storage room for food. On his eventual way down there, he thinks he spots something in the house with him. Fleeing for his life, he locks himself in the storage room for an entire day, preferring to stay where there is food and light. Within a day, his SCP-3010 has become so bad that he's convinced there's something in the containment house with him. He fashions the shelving units from the storeroom into a makeshift barricade. Following his first whole week in containment with an SCP-3010-1 entity, Mike has stayed put in the storage room. He uses additional light fixtures to keep the room bright and begins tearing wiring out of the walls with the use of a makeshift crowbar. Thanks to his previous experience as an electrical engineer, after nine days, he then creates a makeshift suit covered in light fixtures powered by a portable, hand crank generator. Donning his light suit, Mike sets out to find and destroy SCP-3010-1, something we know only attracts it more. But after searching the containment cell for four hours, Mike falls asleep. This is incredibly rare in the presence of SCP-3010-1 instances, if not impossible. When he reawakens, he not only finds the storage room resupplied by Foundation personnel, but also that the lights have all been put out. Frantically, almost completely unhinged at this point, Mike looks for a weapon to fight any SCP-3010-1 he can find. The next day sees Mike rapidly searching through the containment house for SCP-3010-1 entities. Thinking he's found one, he rushes towards it while exclaiming he has light and for the entity to come out. When he approaches, an SCP-3010-1 reactive event starts, but unlike the other recorded instances, seems to fail. Three mirrors nearby start to produce a low level of light, causing Mike to investigate. The moment he makes contact with one of the mirrors, he screams. The connection to his recording device is lost, and the containment site undergoes a spatial anomaly. In the interest of recovering any evidence of this different reactive event and finding whatever remains of Mike, the SCP Foundation dispatches a team to investigate the ruined containment site. This unit is comprised primarily of the eight members belonging to Mobile Task Force 066, also codenamed Eight Blind Men. Led by their captain, the unit is also overseen by a Foundation researcher named Dr. Obrent. As the team enters the ruins of the containment house, they maintain a clear line of communication with Dr. Obrent via radio. With no idea what will happen once the team is inside, everyone is on high alert, told to look out for cognito hazards or any interruptions of their mental faculties. Upon entry, everything goes quiet. For ten long minutes, there isn't a word from the team. Then comes the eventual report from the captain. The spatial anomaly is in full effect. Dr. Obrent remarks on the long delay of ten minutes, but the captain insists that, from his and the team's point of view, it was only thirty seconds. 
they quickly reached the conclusion that the spatial anomaly triggered by an SCP-3010-1 reactive event has, this time, resulted in time dilation. The team navigates their way through a repeating series of hallways, finding themselves in a copy of the foyer of the ruined containment site. It's only then that the captain realizes something is wrong. The team is down a man, MTF-066-8, but his men are confused. They tell him that there are only seven members of MTF-066. Dr. Obrent concurs. The captain then points out that MTF-066-6 and MTF-066-7 are also both missing. Once again, the rest of the team insists they've never even heard of those people. Their team has always had five members. It's as if they can't remember, or their comrades have been erased from existence. Eight blind men were rapidly whittled down from five to three to just one. The captain was lost and alone, frantic and paranoid. His remains are never recovered. And before long, the Foundation is forced to accept that their mobile task force, the three blind men, have all been killed in action, with no sign of the missing D-Class, D-17729. But a series of unauthorized addendums have been left on the SCP-3010 file in the Foundation's archive. They seem to have been left by Mike, who recalls his old D-Class designation number. He describes being lost in a series of endless dark halls with only a few small rooms. He says that they probably hate it here because it's a waste of all their eyes. The entity has eyes. They've got eyes in the back of their head. They've got eyes in the back of their mouth. They don't like us, Foundation, but they watch us. They watch us for so long. Why do they hate us, Foundation? Why do they hate me? Why is it so dark? The addendum from Mike ends with him describing his entity coming out of the mirror. He says there's one for every room, right behind him, right behind you, right behind all of us. First of all, let's get one thing straight. He had never wanted to be a police officer. All the way through school, while the other boys were playing Guardi e Ladri, or Cops and Robbers in English, he had been inside reading. Forget playing games about criminals and pretending you're in a 50s movie. The man had always been obsessed with all things ancient, artifacts and archaeology. That was where his imagination lived. And yet now, he is one of them, a police officer, standing in a sweltering uniform under the baking Italian sun, staring at fishing boats through a pair of binoculars. Just get a degree in Latin and move to Rome. You'll be a historian in no time. What could be easier? Yeah, right. After two years of job searching, he'd given up. The police were hiring and said they liked the look of him. What they'd failed to explain was that he'd be trained in the Polizia Provinciale, his primary duties, enforcing regional fishing laws. The man sighs and lowers his binoculars. The job wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the uniform. Who was Eugenio who thought that a black uniform would be a good idea in this heat? The police officer's walkie-talkie crackles. Someone's requesting him specifically. He doesn't recognize the voice. Must be a mistake or another prank. He's definitely running out of patience for those. It is his job, though. He pushes the button down and responds. Reports of a dangerous individual wandering around in central Rome, near the Colosseum, threatening members of the public and acting erratically. The police officer replies, checking they've got the right person. What's this got to do with fishing law? He isn't even in Rome right now. It'll take him almost an hour to drive back to the city. There's a pause from the other end, then the voice crackles back through. You speak Latin, right? It was only a little thing, but it annoys the police officer for the whole drive back to Rome, his beat-up hatchback winding its way through the traffic with a siren blaring. You don't speak Latin. No one speaks it. It's a dead language. You study it, you read it, you can write it, you can speak it if you want, but no one speaks Latin like they speak Italian. Nice to use the siren for once, though. But sure enough, as he pulls up the handbrake, parking down a crowded side street, thank God for Polizia parking privileges, the voice he can hear yelling from nearby does appear to be speaking in Latin. The man must be very agitated. The officer can hear the shouts quite clearly even through his rolled up windows. It doesn't take long at all to locate the disturbance. Polizia vehicles, much shinier and bigger than his own, block off the entrance to the square. Officers with colorful berets stand shoulder to shoulder, blocking off members of the public and tourists who all swarm close, trying to get an eye on the commotion. The police officer wearily pushes his way through the throng. The officers blocking the way smirk at his uniform and point at his car parked down the road. The longer he tries to persuade them to let him through, the more he feels like he's being pranked. 
until suddenly, a senior officer with an even more colorful beret appears behind them and barks for them to let him through. The constable leads the police officer through the row of cars and into the square. It's mostly deserted. A few officers armed with tasers stand nervously in front of the various cafes and gelaterias, but everyone has eyes only for the man in the middle of the square. Brandishing a shovel, the man is yelling at the top of his voice. He swings it wildly at any little movement, and every few seconds looks down at his body in a state of total confusion. His face contorts constantly, fluctuating between savagery and utter fear. What is most strange about this man, however, is what is sitting on his head, an ancient Roman centurion's helmet. The police officer recognizes the helmet almost straight away. He remembers it from one of his textbooks at university. It looks to be one from the Marian reforms, roughly 100 years BCE. Go on, talk to him. The constable hisses in the police officer's ear. He's speaking Latin, isn't he? Speak to him. Sure enough, the crazed man is speaking Latin. His accent is rough, but totally natural. The words flow from his mouth as if he's been speaking the language all his life. But that wouldn't make sense. No one speaks Latin. The police officer steps forward and clears his throat. A megaphone is shoved into his hand. He raises it to his mouth and speaks into it. Immediately, the crazed man turns towards him and starts brandishing the shovel, wild panic distorting his face. The officer instinctively lowers the megaphone. The man's eyes follow the device. That was clearly a non-starter. The officer slowly lowers it to the ground and raises his hands, palms out to the man. He tries again. His Latin is rusty, very rusty, but he manages to introduce himself. The man's eyes meet his. The shovel stops swinging for a moment. When he speaks, his voice is a notch calmer, only a notch. Publius Cartifilius Aetius, Roman centurion, hero of the Yogurtine War. I serve under the command of the consul Gaius Marius. The police officer lets out a long breath. This is going to be an interesting day. He isn't sure what kind of drugs this grad student has been taking, but this level of delusion can't have just come from one too many all-nighters in the university library. The officer, hands still raised, holds eye contact with the man. He politely explains that Consul Gaius Marius is not here right now in what must be very formal Latin. That only seems to distress the man. He swings the shovel wildly round again, pointing it at the ruins of the Colosseum standing proudly over him. What has happened to my city? Which barbarous nation is responsible? I will slay every newborn male and have the mother stitch their scalps into a cloak. I shall wear it as I parade the streets of their capital. Maybe slight overkill. It was mostly just a few earthquakes that had toppled the Colosseum. Not entirely sure who he could take that up with. God, maybe? But the Romans had already had a go at slaying his offspring. What is so confusing about this man finally registers with the police officer. Well, aside from the obvious. The man is dressed in modern clothes. He talks like an ancient Roman, brandishes a shovel like a sword, is wearing a centurion's helmet, and yet, from the neck down, he's dressed in khakis and a polo shirt. The police officer asks the man where he's come from this morning. The man looks stumped by the question. The more he thinks about it, the more agitated he seems to become. The officer is about to divert the man's attention when he spies a pair of military police personnel approaching the man from behind, tasers at the ready. The officer cries out a warning, but it's too late. The barbs sink into the man's flesh, and the current flows through him. His muscles seize up, his body convulses, and he collapses to the ground. A sea of dark uniforms descend on him, obscuring him from view. All that can be heard are his screams. Several hours pass before the police officer gets a call back on his walkie-talkie. He spends the afternoon checking in with the station repeatedly about the strange man's situation. Before long, his requests are met with radio silence. But that evening, just as he is finishing up his shift, a call comes through. It is brief and tired sounding, but it tells him what he needs to know. The man is being held in a station nearby. By the time the police officer sits down across from the centurion again, it's clear that the man is exhausted. Bruises cover his arms, his lip is busted, and he has a nasty swelling pushing against the inside of his helmet. Apparently, the guards had tried to remove the helmet earlier, but the man had grown so violent that they decided it wasn't worth the effort. Where did you get that helmet? The officer asks, nodding to it. Barracks Commander Quintus Sextus Caiso gave it to me. That wasn't particularly helpful. The officer racks his brains, trying to think of how to get through to this man. He notices the soldier across from him keeps glancing up at the ceiling. He follows the man's eyeline and realizes he must be looking at the fluorescent tube light flickering slightly above them. The soldier is muttering something under his breath about dark magic. The police officer tries to explain that the light is essentially just a different kind of oil lamp. 
The soldier snorts derisively. He knows a cursed object when he sees it. Cursed object? The police officer studies the helmet more closely. It can't be a replica. There's no way. The nicks on the sides, the rusting around the edges, the oxidation of the bronze elements. It looks utterly authentic to what a 100 BCE helmet should look like. You've told me where you got your helmet. Where did you get your clothes? The soldier stops grumbling. His jaw clenches slightly. He does not answer for a long time. When he does, his voice has lost some of its bravado from before. These garments are not my own. I awoke wearing them. This body… The officer can piece together the rest of the sentence without the man saying it. This delusion must be running so deep that the man is completely disassociated from his own body. Then, all of a sudden, the soldier starts talking. He talks for several minutes without stopping for breath or interjections. At times, his voice swells with pride. At other times, it cowers with fear. But he speaks with a clarity and determination that goes beyond delusion. However impossible it may seem, the police officer has no choice but to believe that the man sitting across from him was, in fact, Publius Cartifilius Aetius. He'd fought in the Jugurtine War, a battle which the Romans had won, capturing King Jugurtha. Publius had been one of the centurions tasked with escorting the captured king back to Rome in chains. The soldiers had all drawn lots to determine who'd be on guard duty on which night. Publius had drawn the shortest straw and ended up guarding the king on the last night. The night of the Triumphus. The police officer took a second to remember what the Triumphus was. After a battle, on the final night, the Romans would throw a huge party celebrating their victory. While all of the other soldiers were out drinking and sleeping with the local women, Publius stayed up all night watching the king in silence. The king spent the night trying to bribe him, persuade him, flatter him, say anything to try and win his freedom. When nothing worked, the king grew frustrated, then angry. In a spitting rage, he started to curse the centurion. The soldier recounts the curse word for word to the police officer, who sits in stunned silence. A chill comes over the room as he speaks. Spirits of the underworld, I consecrate and hand over to you, if you have any power. Publius Cartifilius Aetius. Whatever he does, may it all turn to ash. Spirits of the netherworld, I consecrate to you his limbs, his head, his shadow, his brain, his mouth, his nose, his speech, his breath, his liver, his heart, his lungs, his intestines, his stomach, his arms, his hands, his knees, his calves, his heels, his toes. Spirits of the netherworld, if I see him wasting away, I swear that I will be delighted to offer a sacrifice to you, a king's sacrifice. Publius punched the king square in the face, but a sense of unease came over him over the coming days. As the king was dragged through the streets of Rome, humiliated publicly and executed, he had remained utterly calm, staring at Publius whenever he had the chance. Desperate to clear his mind, Publius went out drinking with his fellow soldiers. They had a raucous night, feasting, sleeping around, steadily losing consciousness, until Publius passed out in an alleyway. The centurion stops talking. His hands begin to shake, and his face contorts again. The police officer waits patiently, but the man does not continue his story. A single tear streams down the man's cheek, followed by a second on the other side. Then suddenly, both eyes are streaming, and he is shaking uncontrollably. A guttural cry fills the room. The police officer reaches across the table to take the soldier's hand. It's the wrong move. The soldier jerks back away from him, straining at the handcuffs holding him to the table. Panic fills his face again, the same panic that had torn at his face in the square earlier that day. He lunges for the police officer to attack him. At that moment, the door bursts open and a group of men charge in, restraining the soldier. They push the police officer back so hard he falls on the floor. These men aren't dressed in polizia uniforms at all. They're wearing totally unremarkable black suits. One of them removes the helmet from the man's head and shoves it into a containment box with the words SCP Foundation printed on the side. The others restrain the man, but he suddenly stopped resisting. In a daze, the man looks around the room, his face utterly bewildered but harmless. There's no fight left in him, no soldier. The police officer clamors to his feet and approaches the man. Publius, are you okay? The police officer says in Latin. The man stares blankly back at him. Where the hell am I? He says in perfect Italian. That helmet, referred to herein as SCP-1510, now lives in a much more secure box in the artifact containment section of Site-19. In order to prevent the helmet from rusting or undergoing any significant wear, it is kept in a waterless environment. 
The layer of blue-green oxidized bronze is not to be removed, as it acts as a protective layer for the unoxidized bronze underneath. As the police officer observed, the helmet bears no distinctive features at all that would distinguish it from any other artifact helmets from the same era. The notable exception, of course, being that the helmet is inhabited by the former centurion Publius Cartophilius Aetius, also known as SCP-1510-1. When the helmet is placed on one's head, the wearer's consciousness and body will be taken over by the soldier, who gains total control over their motor functions, thoughts, feelings, everything. However, this effect is not universal. Only males can be affected by SCP-1510, and they have to be aged between 28 and 35. It is theorized that this is to approximate the age and gender of SCP-1510-1 when he was alive in ancient Rome. Historical accounts seem to verify the account that this SCP gives of its life. While there are obviously few records remaining of 107 BCE, those that do exist align with his version of events, and nothing it has reported during interview sessions have seemed historically inaccurate as of yet. Interview sessions are held using D-Class personnel who don the helmet. While no noticeable long-term effects have been observed from wearing the helmet, long-term studies on the health consequences are ongoing. Initial interviews proved futile. SCP-1510-1 was immediately distressed at the point of aggression and violence for the first five sessions, attempting to attack the interviewers and fight its way out of the containment facility. However, upon the commencement of Interview 7, SCP-1510-1 was noticeably calmer. After apologizing for its previous behavior, the SCP was willing and able to share its life story and how it found its way into the head of a grave robber in modern-day Italy. The first part of the story is the same as that told to our police officer earlier, the point where SCP-1510-1 grew upset and violent with the police officer roughly corresponds to the ending of interview log SCP-1510-1-6, where the SCP requested a break to gather its thoughts. The next day, during interview number 7, the SCP told the rest of its story. It awoke in the alleyway after an indeterminate amount of time, still inhabiting the body of Publius Cartophilius Aetius. However, that body was now a corpse, having died in the street from unknown causes, possibly alcohol poisoning, choking on vomit, or a head injury. In a state of distress, SCP-1510-1 was conscious as its body rotted away, fully sentient and aware of everything that was happening as its body deteriorated before its failing eyes. The corpse was soon discovered by a pair of local beggars who, noticing it was still alive, summoned a Haruspex. A Haruspex was a person trained in the art of divination who would study the entrails of deceased animals to find meaning. Upon examining and cutting apart the corpse of Publius Cartophilius Aetius, the Haruspex concluded that the body was marked by the Furies, and was a herald of tyranny reborn. The beggars quickly carried the body away and buried it outside of the city in an unused grave. SCP-1510-1 describes the experience that followed as a kind of… fading. The helmet remained on the body, but the body deteriorated over time, steadily sapping the SCP of any sensations or stimuli. It appears the helmet needs a host in order to see, hear, smell, taste, and otherwise react or interact with the world. Removed from a host, it enters what it refers to as darkness, a time where it hovers between consciousness and unconsciousness, aware and thinking, but simultaneously resting in a kind of void, unable to observe the world or interact with it. For over 2,000 years, SCP-1510 remained in this state, until a sudden awakening. A grave robber in Italy, the man brandishing a shovel in khakis and polo who ended up sitting confused in the police station, was responsible. Local police interviews reveal that the man has a history of digging around Rome and across Italy, looking for ancient artifacts to sell off to the highest bidder. Upon discovering SCP-1510, this man had proudly put the helmet onto his head, not realizing the effect that it would have on him. Almost instantaneously, the man's body was taken over by SCP-1510-1, who, after centuries of darkness, now suddenly found itself in the bustling heart of Italy's biggest city. Electric lights, smartphones, cars, sirens, tourists, everywhere SCP-1510-1 looked, it saw technology totally alien and otherworldly, overlaid and built into a city it had once known. In a state of utter panic, the SCP grabbed the nearest weapon it could find, the shovel used to excavate it, and started to attack those around it. Not exactly the best wake-up call. Nowadays, however, SCP-1510-1 is highly cooperative, having had time to process the world that it has awoken into and the loss of the world it left behind. It holds on to a soldier-like sense of duty, 
SCP-1510-1 still worships the ancient Roman gods and as such, believes earnestly that Jupiter and Juno have a hand in keeping it alive. It has explained to interviewers on multiple occasions that there must be a purpose behind its continued existence, and that it is keen to work with SCP personnel in any way it can so as to achieve that purpose. While still being held in Latin, conversations with SCP-1510-1 are positive and at times jovial. It has a keen memory of its life in ancient Rome and can give very valuable insight into events that occurred at the time. This gives the Foundation vital intelligence in uncovering and tracing the origins of further SCPs that were theorized to have been present during the Yugurtine War in what is present-day Algeria. A young woman steps onto her bathroom scale. She holds her breath and squeezes her eyes shut, afraid to see the results as she listens to the dial spinning. When it slows to a stop, she opens her eyes and looks down. She balks at the result. 150 pounds? That's unacceptable in her eyes. She steps off the scale and examines her reflection in the full-length mirror. In truth, her weight is far from out of control, but when she looks at herself she can't help but see flaws. The subtle ring of pudge around her middle, the way her butt sticks out just a little too far for her liking, the very faint thickness around her cheeks and chin that hint at her history of snacking. As she leaves the bathroom, she reflects on her situation. Of course she's gaining weight, how could it be any other way? For the last two years, she's been in lockdown during a pandemic and she's barely left her apartment. She let her gym membership lapse, and instead of cycling to work, she's instead taking the easy way out by just driving. And it's not like she gets much exercise in her free time either. During these last two years of isolation, she's mostly stayed in and watched television. She's discovered a particular love for trashy daytime talk shows and court dramas. Intellectually, she knows that they're the equivalent of junk food, but at the same time, there is a certain mindless charm to them. She would be embarrassed to admit it to any of her friends, but she does enjoy just turning off her brain and absorbing some silly talk show about professional stunt dwarves or Satan-worshipping furry juggalos. That sort of entertainment has been a boon to get her through the tough times. Nevertheless, it's time to make a change. She promises herself that she's going to get into shape. Today, instead of vegging out on the couch, she's going to make an effort. She's gonna go out and get some exercise and, she tells herself, she's going to watch those extra pounds melt away right before her eyes. She hopes that her old gym clothes will still fit her. After all, she's definitely put on some extra weight since her last trip to the gym. After rummaging through her drawers, she finds what she's looking for, her spandex gym shorts and sports bra. She quickly changes her clothes and is relieved to see that, although they might be a little snugger than she would like, they still fit her pretty well. That's a good sign. She probably won't even have to work very hard to get herself down to her ideal weight. It's all a matter of willpower, she tells herself. I was fit before, so that means I should be able to do it again. All I have to do is avoid temptation. I'll just have to make sure I stay active instead of watching trash TV all day. After all, I don't want to rot my brain too much. On the first day, she actually does an admirable job of sticking to her plan. She cycles to work, enjoying the fresh air and the reassuring post-workout burn in her legs that let her know that she's making progress. She throws away all the junk food in her refrigerator and goes shopping for healthy fruits and vegetables. And, most important of all, she limits her television time. She knows that trashy TV is probably her biggest addiction, even more than junk food, so she needs to be careful of that. On the second day, though, she notices something strange. She starts off with a simple, healthy breakfast, just some granola and a glass of juice. It's barely enough to satisfy her, but she knows that she has to make sacrifices if she expects to actually lose any weight. After breakfast, she decides to go out for a jog. As she's out on the street, she's overcome with sudden hunger. Of course, that's to be expected. She's on a diet now, so it's going to take some time to adjust to these smaller meals. She puts her hand to her rumbling stomach and grimaces. She's never felt this hungry before. If she didn't know better, she would think that she hadn't eaten for a week with the amount of pain that she's feeling. In fact, she's actually starting to feel a little woozy and she has to lean against a light post to keep from fainting. She shakes her head to clear her thoughts. Okay, she thinks, I must have misjudged how many calories I need to get me through a morning. Her eyes stray to a nearby coffee shop. She sighs in relief. She thinks to herself, I'll just pop in there and get myself a small snack, just a little something to keep my blood sugar up. She walks into the cafe and gets in line. As she waits, she can't help but stare at the rows of pastries on display under the glass. They all look delicious, and she is really hungry. She fully intends to only get a bagel with a little smear of cream cheese, but when she gets to the counter, she finds herself ordering way too much food. 
I'd like two scones, three danishes, and a bear claw, she says. Also a large super raspberry frappuccino with extra syrup and whipped cream. The words just tumble out of her mouth, almost as if it's not her saying them, but rather some other voice speaking through her mouth. What the? I didn't say that, she stammers. The clerk behind the counter eyes her strangely, and the young woman feels too embarrassed to protest further. She steps aside and waits for her order, pondering the strange event that just happened. Is she possessed? She's not a superstitious person, but she can't think of any other explanation for what just happened. She can admit to herself that she has broken down and lost to temptation over a tasty snack in the past, but this? This is ridiculous. Eventually, when the clerk hands her the order, she rationalizes the whole thing away. I must just be having a hunger hallucination, she says to herself. Obviously, I need to be a little more careful about not being so strict about my diet. I'm sure if I just eat sensibly, I won't have an experience like that again. Her stomach grumbles again, reminding her of the original reason why she stepped into this coffee shop. She retreats to a table in the corner and tears open the bag. She wolfs down her pastries with gusto and slurps at her rich, creamy drink. When she's finished, she sighs in satisfaction, although the uncomfortable, full feeling in her belly reminds her of her predicament. She only meant to eat enough to keep her from fainting, but instead, she's eating herself silly, and it's only day two of the diet. This does not bode well. Okay, she tells herself, this is my last cheat. From now on, I'm gonna be serious about this diet. She stands up and leaves the cafe, ready to complete the rest of her jog. But then, something even stranger happens. On the television, the matriarch of the family is furious. She has forbidden her daughter from marrying the gardener because she believes that he is too low class for her high-born daughter. But what she doesn't realize is that her daughter is in love and that she is determined to make it work. The daughter and the gardener have eloped, and the matriarch is hiring a private detective to track them down. Meanwhile, the matriarch's long-lost twin brother, whom she thought died in a plane crash in the tropics, has actually been alive the entire time. He has been in a South American hospital recovering from amnesia, but now he returns to the family estate, ready to claim his share of the inheritance. These events are all noted by the family's shady lawyer, who has big plans to usurp the family fortune himself. Unbeknownst to the family, he is actually secretly working for their mortal enemies and business rivals to destroy them. The young woman laughs, shoving a handful of potato chips into her mouth. Oh man, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes now. That lawyer is playing them all like fiddles. Suddenly, she startles, as if she's just waking up. Where is she? Wasn't she just in that coffee shop? How is it that she's at home? And why is she eating potato chips? She was sure that she threw out all the junk food in the house. She must have bought a bag on her way back home from jogging, but she literally cannot remember it. And what is she doing now? Watching television and eating junk food? In disgust, she grabs the remote and shuts off the TV. She was supposed to be jogging, and instead, she's sitting at home and watching stupid soap operas. The thing that worries her the most is her apparent blackout. She remembers nothing about her trip home from the coffee shop, although the evidence of the potato chip bag indicates that she must have stopped at a convenience store or supermarket on the way home. How could she forget something like that? I really must be having a blood sugar issue, she tells herself reassuringly, even though deep down, she knows that can't be the case. She had the blackout after eating the pastries at the coffee shop, so that can't be the cause. But she really doesn't want to think about that, so she puts it out of her head with a renewed promise to commit to her exercise and fitness program. Over the next few days, she makes a valiant effort to keep her promise. She cycles when she can, she jogs when she remembers, and yet, the blackouts continue. And no matter where she is when she loses her memory, she always recovers in the same place. Back home on her couch, always in the middle of eating some fatty junk food, always staring at the television set. Sure, she's always had an unhealthy television habit, and she knows that trashy talk shows and silly soap operas are her biggest weakness, but it doesn't make any sense that she would be seeking them out when she's in some kind of fugue state, right? As the weeks roll by, the young woman finds that her weight keeps rising. When she steps onto the bathroom scale, she's shocked to see that the dial points to 200 pounds. She's doing everything right, she thinks. How is that possible? How is it possible that she's ballooned up an extra 50 pounds since deciding to slim down? She can't fit into her old gym clothes anymore. She can barely tug the spandex shorts up to her thighs, and even if she could, she's afraid that they're going to split apart. In desperation, she switches to an old stretchy sweatsuit. It's the only thing that she owns that still fits her. This is just a temporary setback, she tells herself as she stares at her bloated reflection in the bathroom mirror. I just have to work harder. And she does. Or does she? When she goes to ride her bike, she finds that it's no longer strong enough to support her weight. She can't perch on the seat comfortably and the steel body frame starts to creak when she rests her full weight upon it. She steals her resolve. 
Sure, it might be embarrassing to go out in public wearing an ill-fitting sweatsuit and riding a bike groaning under her bulk, but she really has no choice. This time, she's going to do it. And she probably did ride her bike to work, right? She's not sure. The next thing that she knows, she's back at home, spread across the couch, basking in the comforting glow of the television. The floor is covered in empty bags and cartons, and her face is slathered with crumbs and sauce. The last thing that she remembers is that she was just about to go for a bike ride, but now she's back at home, and it looks like she just completely ruined her diet. She lifts her arm with some effort and stares at her watch. She's lost almost a whole day. That's the longest blackout yet. She must have gone out cycling and made her way home where she decided to reward herself for her strenuous efforts with a little snack. That's the only logical explanation. She tries to reassure herself that maybe she's past the worst of it, but she finds that these mysterious blackouts keep happening. They happen while she's at work, while she's at the gym, while she's out cycling, but she always comes to in the same place, sitting on her sofa at home, in front of the TV, surrounded by the debris of a massive meal. Again, she wonders if maybe she's having some sort of reaction to her new low-calorie diet. Maybe she's been cutting back so far on her food intake that she's starting to have fainting spells. Maybe her diet food is tainted in some way. But that doesn't explain why she keeps gaining weight. The scale in her bathroom doesn't lie. It keeps reporting higher and higher numbers. And as much as she tries to reassure herself that it must just be broken, her ever-tightening clothes and ever-widening reflection tell her otherwise. Her trips to the gym become less and less frequent as she finds that other patrons have started to stare and whisper about her. Are they laughing at her for not being able to control her weight? Are they whispering about how her new flab is spilling from the confines of her sweatsuit? She can't even run on the treadmill for more than a few minutes without being completely winded, and she's too wide to balance on her bike now. The young woman has grown absolutely massive, to the point that she completely fills the whole couch. She chews her way through yet another bag of potato chips, her eyes never straying from the ever-chattering television set. She barely moves from this spot, her tremendous girth sinking into a permanent groove in the cushions as the couch springs groan. She barely notices, however, because she's much too intent on enjoying herself. She loves to eat, and every bite brings her untold joy, her taste buds tingling with delight. She is constantly full, so much so that she feels slightly sick, so bloated that she feels like she might just burst, but she's powerless to resist the siren call of junk food. She scarfs down entire boxes of cookies and cartons of ice cream without a thought, having turned into the very definition of a mindless eater. Only occasionally does she rouse herself from this stupor of gorging, to reach for her telephone, to order more takeout or more grocery delivery, always choosing the most calorie-laden options. Other than eating, her attention is completely devoted to her television set. She watches a constant stream of daytime talk shows, laughing along with the studio audience as the hosts parade out an assortment of society's biggest freaks. Sometimes she'll switch the channel to watch soap operas, becoming so wrapped up in the ridiculous plot twists and melodramatic acting that she completely forgets the passage of time. Her bicycle stands propped against the wall in the hallway, completely forgotten and untouched now for months. At this point, all thoughts of losing weight have utterly evaporated, and all that she cares about is satisfying her appetites for junk food and junk television. One day, she suddenly shakes her head and looks down at herself in horror, as if seeing herself for the first time. What the? She says in disbelief. She drops her half-eaten carton of ice cream and grabs at her fleshy middle with her hands, as if to make sure that it's all her and not some kind of crazy dream. Her hands sink deep into her new flesh, and she realizes to her shock that indeed she has eaten herself into morbid obesity. How is this possible? I can't be this big. I was only… only… Her words trail off as the sound of an organ sting from the soap opera on TV diverts her attention. Within seconds, her eyes have glazed over and her hands move to pick up the dropped carton of ice cream. Her worries about her growing size forgotten, she's now only concerned with watching until the next commercial break. It might seem unbelievable that someone could undergo such a startling physical and mental transformation, but what that young woman experienced has led to her being classified by the Foundation as SCP-2611. SCP-2611 is, as you might have expected, a young woman currently weighing approximately 500 pounds. Her mobility is limited due to her weight, although SCP staff encourage her to take light exercise whenever possible in hopes of preventing her mobility from deteriorating further. She also suffers from several health issues related to her weight and lifestyle, including diabetes, for which she is receiving treatment by Foundation personnel. Her awareness of her situation and surroundings is severely limited, as she spends most of her time in a stupor, but when she is lucid, she believes that she is in a special facility receiving treatment for her weight problem. In reality, 
SCP-2611 is under observation because of SCP-2611-1. SCP-2611-1 is a mass of sentient fat located on SCP-2611's left side. SCP-2611-1 has become integrated with several of SCP-2611's vital organs, making it too dangerous to attempt to remove SCP-2611-1 via liposuction or other means. SCP-2611-1 has gradually exerted increasing control over the mind and actions of its host, to the point that SCP-2611 is only fully conscious for one to two hours daily. The rest of the time, SCP-2611-1 is fully in control of its host's behavior. Prior to coming to the SCP facility, SCP-2611-1 influenced its host to consume massive amounts of calories, leading to the mysterious and sudden weight gain that we observed earlier. This was possibly an attempt by SCP-2611-1 to increase its own size and influence, but as of yet, its reasons, as well as how it exerts control over its host, are unknown. When in control, SCP-2611-1 can speak through its host, communicating in standard American English. SCP-2611's access to food has been limited since her arrival at the Foundation, so as to prevent her weight gain from accelerating to dangerous levels. Other than eating, SCP-2611-1's main interest appears to be daytime television. Attempts to communicate with SCP-2611-1 have so far met with little success due to the anomaly's limited attention span for anything other than the minutiae of daytime television. In a conversation with one researcher, however, SCP-2611-1 let slip that it preferred daytime television to the programming watched by, quote, that other guy, suggesting that it lived inside a different host before it eventually took up residence within the body of SCP-2611. At another point, while in the middle of a conversation about a court drama, SCP-2611-1 suddenly announced, Kill it! Kill it now! I don't care if I die! Staff believe that this might not have been SCP-2611-1 at all, but rather the voice of SCP-2611 trying to break through the hypnotic control of her parasite to call for help. At this time, no drastic action is recommended until further observations can be made. SCP-2611-1 does not appear to be contagious, and the way that it bonds with the host is unknown, so it is currently classified as safe. At the moment, SCP-2611-1 is the only known instance of its kind. However, considering rising levels of obesity worldwide, it is not unfathomable to think that there could be countless other instances influencing the behavior of other hosts to dedicate their lives to consuming food and television. Who knows, it's not like most of us would need that much convincing. Everyone in this school knows to step aside when the goth girl is on the move. She strides down the school hallway, confident that no one will challenge her as the undisputed ruler of this high school. It's not just her dark wardrobe or her black nails and eyeliner that intimidate the other students. Her domineering attitude and sharp tongue make her feared. She brushes past a gaggle of underclassmen who wilt under her devastating gaze. Beat it, dorks, she hisses, jerking her head to indicate that they should get out of her way. The other students disperse instantly, afraid the chance really getting an earful. Her terrible reputation means that no one ever makes trouble for the goth girl, but it's more than just her attitude that keeps her on top. It's also all those rumors around her. The rumors started last year, just after a new transfer student arrived in their school. She was a younger classman who shared the goth girl's same dark fashion sense and sensibilities. Students even saw the younger girl occasionally hanging out with the school's resident goth population, but it was no secret that the goth girl didn't like her. Maybe she felt like this younger girl was homing in on her territory, or even angling to take her place among the goth crew. Whatever the case, other students couldn't help but notice how the goth girl's lip quivered or her eyes flashed whenever the younger girl tried to worm her way into the goth gang's meetups. Then, one day, the younger girl didn't come home from school. The younger girl's parents reported her missing and organized a whole search party. The police spent weeks tracking down every lead, desperately looking for anything that might tell them what became of the missing girl, but found nothing. Rumors spread around school that the goth girl had something to do with it. After all, hadn't the younger girl been her biggest rival? Hadn't she always hated the younger girl? And if anyone at this school would have had the chutzpah to actually do something sinister, it would be her, right? Despite all the gossip, though, no evidence ever surfaced to link the goth girl to the disappearance. The police even interviewed her several times, but she always denied knowing anything. Yeah, I didn't like that little brat, she said in the police interview. She was always getting underfoot and thinking that she could hang with us. But that doesn't mean I did anything to her. I mean, 
It's not like I would have really wanted to hurt her. The goth girl concluded her statement with a knowing smirk, as if she was pleased with herself for getting away with murder. But you can't build a case out of a smirk. So even if the police suspected anything, they were forced to let her go. Eventually, life at school returned to normal. Other than a few fading missing child posters still fixed to telephone poles around town, most students eventually forgot about their missing classmate. But the goth girl's fearsome reputation persisted. Could she have actually had something to do with that younger girl's mysterious disappearance? Now that other students thought she might have actually killed someone, they naturally found her even more intimidating. The goth girl didn't mind, though. After all, she already thought most of the other students were normie losers anyway, so she liked that they gave her a wide berth. The goth girl walks toward the end of the hallway, pushing open a designated fire exit door and slipping out behind the school. Today, the other goths are hanging out behind the school building. They nod curtly as the goth girl joins them. What's going on, losers? She says, adopting an aura of bored detachment. I was just telling them that there's this haunted game you can download, says the goth boy. It's all messed up. Like, the game knows all your worst secrets, and the more you play, the more it taunts you. Then, when you finish, you just disappear. The other goths snicker at the story. None of them really believe it, but it makes for a fun, spooky tale to help set the atmosphere as the sun sets. But one girl is more skeptical than the rest, to the point that she's almost insulted by how obviously fake this story is. What do you mean you just disappear? Asks the girl. The boy shrugs. I don't know. I just know that no one ever sees them again. I don't believe that at all, says the goth girl. That sounds made up. No, no, says the boy. It's 100% real. It's called the Book of Tamlin. Okay, sure, whatever you say. And who exactly is Tamlin? The boy shrugs. I don't know. Clearly, I haven't played it since I'm still here. The girl rolls her eyes. That's ridiculous. I'll show you right now. She whips her cell phone out of her backpack and starts to thumb through the app store until she sees it. The Book of Tamlin. It's right there in the store. That just makes this whole story seem even sillier. She would expect that if there were a real haunted app. It would only be accessible via the dark web or maybe a strange glitch that randomly installed it into doomed victims' phones. But it's right here for anyone to download. With a skeptical smirk on her face, she punches the button to begin the installation. It's right here in the app store, says the goth girl. Any of you chickens gonna play? The other goths eye each other nervously. Sure, they were all pretty quick to dismiss the ominous story about this weird game before. But now that their friend is challenging them to actually play it, they don't feel quite so confident. The goth girl snorts derisively. She wonders why she bothers hanging out with these posers. They're the closest thing that she has to friends, since so few other students even dare approach her. But what does a bossy prima donna like her really need with friends anyway? She watches as the game loads up the intro screen, and then gameplay begins. She snorts again. The Book of Tamlin appears to be a hidden object game, where the point is to discover various objects hidden in a larger image. This is baby stuff, thinks the goth girl. Find the ten black cats in the cemetery! instructs the game as it pulls up a cartoony image of a graveyard. The goth girl's finger hovers over the screen, and she quickly taps it whenever she spots a black cat crouching behind one of the pixelated tombstones. Is this supposed to be scary? The screen fades, and an empty room with a pair of doors fades in. The goth girl intuits that she's supposed to pick one to advance to the next screen. Rolling her eyes, she selects the door on the left. The next scene looks familiar. Too familiar. It's a bedroom. Her bedroom, in fact. She recognizes the dark decor and the black clothing thrown on the floor. She narrows her eyes suspiciously. Surely that's just a crazy coincidence, right? She eyes the other goths, but they don't give any indication that they were expecting this twist. Are they playing a trick on her? Find the outfits that make your parents ashamed to be seen with you, says the instructions. She grits her teeth. What's the deal with this stupid program insulting her? She knows that her parents don't exactly approve of her fashion choices, but this stupid game can't know that. It's probably just guessing that any young person who plays a game will probably have had quarrels with their parents about the way they dress. That's pretty normal, right? Again, the empty room with the two doors appears. This time, the goth girl chooses the one on the right. The next screen after that is a picture of a pretty garden, and the instructions say to pick out ten pretty flowers. The next is a barnyard, with instructions to find five cows. The goth girl starts to relax. That weird screen with her room must have just been a fluke. Otherwise, this game seems pretty mundane. But the next screen makes the goth girl's face go as white as a sheet. Her eyes bug out of her head, and sweat starts to bead on her forehead. No. No way. 
There's no way that this next screen could be real. The image that appears is familiar to her. It's a real life place. She knows because she's been there. It's an image of a particular ravine deep in the local woods. People sometimes throw old garbage down there, so it's full of old washing machines and wrecked cars. Years ago, an old oak tree fell across the chasm, and now the dead log functions as a makeshift bridge. Sometimes kids dare one another to cross it. The instructions read, find the girl who wanted to be a part of your club. The goth girl doesn't need to search the image to know what she'll find. She knows deep in her heart that the hidden object that she's being instructed to find will be a broken body lying at the bottom of the ditch, half hidden under old blankets and debris. How could this game know? She was so careful. She remembers last school year when that younger girl kept trying to usurp her place in her clique. It made her so mad. But that younger girl seemed to look up to her, to think of her as the leader of the group and the one who she needed to impress in order to be accepted. That was good. The goth girl knew she could use that to her advantage. She told the younger girl to meet her in the woods by the old ravine late at night. Of course, it was nothing sinister. It was just for a little initiation test to prove that the younger girl could take her place as part of their gang. The younger girl was only too excited for her test. The goth girl was waiting at the ravine when her younger rival finally arrived. I came as fast as I could, said the younger girl. What do you need me to do? Listen, I see how you want to hang out with us, said the goth girl. But you have to prove yourself if you want to be part of our group. But you have to understand, us goths, we embrace the darkness. We're not scared of the void. We only take the coolest and the bravest, the kids who aren't afraid of death. So you have to show me that you're willing to look eternity in the eye. All you have to do to join us is to cross this ravine over that log over there. She pointed at the fallen log. The younger girl looked frightened, but she nodded. The goth girl half expected her to turn tail and run home, but she was surprised to see her rival make her way toward the log. Maybe she wasn't as much of a poser as the goth girl thought. The goth girl didn't mean for anything bad to happen. She really only wanted to scare the younger girl. Maybe she could freak her out enough that she wouldn't want to hang out with them anymore and then she wouldn't have to deal with that little pest anymore. The younger girl clambers up atop the log and slowly starts walking across the deep gorge, carefully placing one foot in front of the other. But the peeling bark of the old log is more slippery than it looks, and it's hard to keep her footing in the dark. The younger girl makes it almost halfway across the ravine before she loses her footing. With a yelp, she lurches to the side and falls down the slope, tumbling head over heels and landing amongst the garbage with a sickening crunch. The goth girl screamed in shock. She stared down in the ravine, seeing the younger girl lying still at the bottom, her neck bent at an impossible angle. It was obvious that the fall had killed her instantly. The goth girl knew she was in trouble. Or was she? Nobody knew she was out here. Nobody knew that she'd asked the younger girl to meet her here. All she had to do was keep her mouth shut, and nobody could pin this on her. The plan worked. She worked out her alibi and stuck to it during all the police interviews, never deviating, practicing her story until it sounded natural. The cops fell for it, clearing her as a suspect before moving on in their investigation. For a whole year, she had carried this terrible secret. Of course, it got easier over time. She gradually convinced herself that the whole thing was a terrible accident. It couldn't have been prevented. She had nothing to feel guilty about. And yet, somehow, this game knew. This game knew exactly what she had done. The phone slips from her palsied fingers and drops to the ground. The other goths look at her in confusion. They've never seen their leader in such a state of terror. What could have spooked her so bad? Which of you made this dumb game? She snaps. It must have been one of you. Fess up. We don't know what you're talking about, says the goth boy. I already told you, it's supposed to be haunted and... I don't know what you think you know, but you don't know anything, shouts the goth girl, hysterical in her fear. Has she been found out? Was this entire game just an elaborate ruse to trick her into confessing her guilt? Well, she's not going to fall for it. She's still the queen boss of this school, and if any of these losers think that they can knock her off her perch with a silly game, they're dead wrong. What do you mean we don't know anything? The other goths are murmuring amongst themselves. Of course, they'd heard the rumors about their leader as well, but they never really gave them much credence. She may be a little sharp, but that doesn't make her capable of murder. But the way that this game had freaked her out so much is really beginning to make them wonder. The goth girl is frantic now, seeing her control slip away as the other kids begin to mull the possibilities. She can't believe this. She wonders desperately if someone was there that night to see the whole terrible accident play out. Or maybe she let something slip without knowing. What other explanation could there possibly be? I'm out of here. Leave me alone. Don't follow me. 
she yells as she stomps away. The other goths don't make any move to follow, intimidated by the wrath of their leader. But when the goth girl throws open the door to head back inside the school, she's confronted with an unexpected sight. Instead of the long gray hallway lined with lockers that she expected, she instead sees a single empty room. It couldn't be, but it looks exactly like the empty room from the game, the one that she glimpsed between levels. This isn't supposed to be here, she cries. Behind her, the other goths stare in confusion. They too recognize the room from the game, but they can't figure out for the life of them how it's managed to appear in real life. What's going on? Is her guilty mind playing tricks on her? No, that can't be. The reaction of the other goths shows that they see it too. She doesn't think she can trust her senses, but she also feels an overwhelming urge to step into that empty room. Don't go in, calls the goth boy, but it's too late. Internally, her rational mind is screaming at her to stay out, but she can't control her feet. She steps inside, and the door swings closed behind her. The goth boy runs to the door and yanks it open, hoping to help his terrified friend. But beyond the door, he sees nothing but the ordinary hallway that's always been there. The mysterious empty room is nowhere to be seen, and the goth girl has completely vanished with it. Not many people would say that SCP-1590, better known as the Book of Tamlin, is any fun. SCP-1590 is a downloadable app that has been designated as Euclid, and seven copies of the game are currently held by the Foundation in a containment locker for experimentation purposes. Whenever the Foundation discovers new instances of SCP-1590, information technicians initiate an immediate DDoS attack on the hosting server, and an MTF is to be sent in to appropriate all hardware. Any systems that were able to download copies of the game before the DDoS attack should be infected with the COM AMA computer virus to prevent unwitting innocents from playing the game. SCP-1590 is a one kilobyte program or application designed for use with touchscreen hardware such as tablets. Attempts to view SCP-1590's coding reveal only the numbers 1 through 66,666 in numerical order, but on the front end, SCP-1590 plays as a mostly ordinary video game in the hidden object puzzle genre. Like other hidden object puzzle games, the player is given a list of objects that they must find in a scene within an allotted amount of time. What makes SCP-1590 unusual, though? is that as the game progresses, the scenes and hidden objects become more personal to the player, often referencing traumatic or unsettling events from the player's life. It is not known how SCP-1590 is able to gain such intimate knowledge of a player, but since some players report that SCP-1590 seems privy to personal secrets that have never been revealed to another person, it is unlikely that it's just due to very good research on the part of the game's designers. The game always begins with the same dedication screen, containing the message, To Joey, who taught me how to be cool. The dedication continues, listing another name who almost made it out. The second name changes with every playthrough, but is always the name of the previous person to play the game. The dedication screen is followed by an animated cutscene, with a humanoid silhouette standing on the deck of what appears to be an oil tanker. The screen turns bright white, then returns to the oil tanker. A yellow wall, larger than the ship, has been added to the scene. The wall's appearance causes a wave to crash over the ship, waving the humanoid overboard. The screen fills with bubbles, and the words, The Book of Tamlin and Start Game appear overhead on the bubbles. The significance of this animated sequence, as well as the title, The Book of Tamlin, if any, is currently unknown. When a player chooses Start Game, the title screen fades into an image of a cluttered room. The user is presented with a series of tasks, directing them to find objects hidden in the room image. The allotted time to find every object in a scene ranges from 1 to 12 minutes. Once the user finds every object in a scene, a set of doors appear on screen, and the player must choose one to progress in the game. The game continues through a random number of screens, labeled from 7 to 43. Eventually, if the user fails to find all objects in a scene within the time limit, the next scene will be an empty room. The words, you found out everything there is to find about the house, now all you have left to find is the way out, appear on the screen. At this point, the game ends and cannot be replayed by the same user. The actual length of the game appears to vary from player to player, but even players who appear to win the game, always finding all hidden objects within the time limit, will eventually be shown the same end screen and receive the same message. As strange as the game is, what happens next is even stranger. Within 72 hours of completing the game, whether a player has ostensibly won or lost, the player will encounter the final room from the game in real life. 
they will find that some ordinary door, possibly in their home or workplace, no longer leads to the room it should lead to, but instead leads to the empty room from the end of the game. If someone other than the player attempts to pass through the door, they will find themselves not in the empty room from the game, but instead in the room that the door normally leads to. If the player passes through the door, though, they disappear into the empty room. Any tracking devices cease to transmit after the user passes through the doorway. The Foundation currently has no idea who or what is behind SCP-1590 or how the game manages to access users' memories. It's also not clear what purpose the game solves, whether it's intended as a therapy device to help subjects work through hidden trauma or as an instrument of justice to punish wrongdoing. Either way, you might want to make sure you have a clean conscience before you download any new mysterious games for your phone. You never know when you might find yourself confronting the Book of Tamlin. Uncle S is the worst. Always has been. Every time the two of them go over to his house, he just sits in his room all day on his computer, he doesn't talk to them, just grunts occasionally, and never cooks them any food. The siblings have learned at this point to tell their mom to pack them lunch. Worst of all, though, Uncle S is just a little strange. He has all these posters up all over his house, some of them with underdressed ladies on them. The brother's little sister always covers his eyes to stop him from looking. But there are other posters, too, weirder ones, with these symbols on them and quotes written underneath. Neither of the kids can really read enough to know what the quotes mean, but their mom always gets very tense whenever they ask about them. She says they are something to do with politics, whatever that means. You know someone's weird when even their mom agrees. Uncle S is just weird. But there is a big upside to being at his house. The two of them can just sit downstairs in the lounge playing video games. He's got a big TV and a bunch of different game consoles, most of which are older than the two of them. This week, he's even got a new box next to the TV. It's full of old wires, controllers, and games. And when they say old, they mean old. It all smells of dust. The brother reaches inside and pulls out a big gray box. The top half of it is lighter gray and the bottom darker. There's some red writing along the front of it. He carefully spells it out in his head before saying the words out loud. He doesn't want his little sister to know that he struggles with long words. Nintendo enter, enter hey, entertainment system. His little sister huffs and sits on the sofa. She doesn't want to play that stupid thing. It looks old and the dust is making her sneeze. This whole house is dirty and gross. The TV and games consoles are the only nice thing in here. Why would she want to play with the gross one? The brother ignores her and tries to plug it into the TV. Wait, where's the HDMI on the back of this thing? He gives up pretty quickly. On the sofa, his sister switches on the TV and grabs the Xbox controller. The familiar cuphead music fills the room. They turn it down quickly. Can't be annoying Uncle S, who's sitting upstairs on his computer. Why does she always want to play cuphead? It annoys her brother so much, they can't even beat the first level. It's way too hard. She chooses two-player, and Cuphead and Mugman both appear in the field, Sunflower Men parachuting down around them. You're up! The announcer yells on the screen. His sister starts running along as Cuphead, but bumps into the end of the screen. They need to both play together for this to work, but the brother isn't interested today. He reaches into the Nintendo box and rummages around, finding something that fits perfectly into his hand. Something with a trigger. No way. He pulls the strange toy gun out of the box and holds it in the air triumphantly. It's gray, matching the NES console, with an orange trigger and the word Nintendo written on the side in that same red writing. A cord dangles out of the bottom of it. Immediately, he spins around and points it at his sister and shoots. Nothing happens. No noise, no lights. She just sits there and scowls at him. Fine. He gets up off the floor and grabs the second Xbox controller. They run past the sunflower men and shoot the toadstool, but die at the first purple flower. Great. The boy is sick of this game. He doesn't want to keep playing it every week. He wants to play with the gun. Imagine what games he could play with that. He picks it back up. Cuphead and Mugman respawn, and the music starts over again. Very carefully, he peers down the barrel and takes aim at Cuphead. He squeezes the trigger. Bam! A puff of smoke, and Cuphead turns into a red ghost, pink heart beating. Wait, how did that happen? His sister didn't run into anything. She yells at him. That wasn't fair. The brother is very confused. He looks back down at the gun. It wasn't even plugged in, and it wasn't an Xbox gun. So, how come it worked? 
He points it at Mugman and shoots. Bam! Another puff of smoke, and Mugman's ghost floats off the screen. The menu pops up, and the brother hits retry. The level starts again. The music kicks off, and the announcer yells, but Cuphead and Mugman aren't there. His sister wiggles the stick a few times. Nothing. The characters don't appear. What are you doing? Keep playing, she yells at him. But the brother can't see any characters left on the screen. Why is she pretending to see them still? Footsteps creak the floorboards above their heads. Uh-oh, now they've done it. Uncle S appears on the stairs, scowling at them both. Immediately, each sibling points at the other one and blames them. Uncle S doesn't say a word. Instead, he glares at them as he walks over and snatches away their controllers. He turns and goes back upstairs. No more video games. No fair. The two of them slump on the couch, arms crossed, not saying anything. The NES zapper sits between them. Looks like they'll just have to watch TV instead. It's the brother's turn to choose something. He goes on Netflix and puts on Avatar The Last Airbender, her least favorite show. The opening credits roll, telling them all about the Fire Nation's attack. His sister snatches the gun up from the seat and points it at the screen, aiming at all the characters that pop up. Her brother ignores her. She's just being silly again. The episode starts. Aang is in a city in the Earth Nation, walking around a market surrounded by... His sister squeals. He looks at the TV, confused. Nothing has really happened. The characters are just standing around at the market, talking. But his sister stares at the screen wide-eyed, almost a little scared-looking. What's she doing? She points at the screen in amazement and says that Aang is dead. She pointed the gun at him and shot, and now he's dead. Yeah, right. Aang is perfectly fine. He's standing right there talking to Katara. The brother snatches the gun back and fires it at the screen. Bam! A gunshot rings out through the town square, and Aang crumples to the ground. Katara screams and runs over to him. She tries desperately to wake him up, but there's no use. He just lies there dead in the square. No blood, of course. This is a children's show, after all. Katara starts sobbing desperately and looks imploringly at the screen. The brother's mouth hangs open. Seriously? That's how the show ends? He thought there were a bunch of episodes left. How are they supposed to defeat the Fire Nation now? Who'd be the next Avatar? He looks over at his sister. Her mouth is hanging open still as well. Very hesitantly, he raises the barrel again and takes aim at one of the market stalls. He pulls the trigger. Bam! A watermelon explodes into red mush. The characters all jump back and run for cover. Sokka peers out from behind one of the carts, staring straight at them before ducking away again. This show is weird. I don't want to watch it anymore, the brother says, throwing the gun back down on the sofa and pressing back on Netflix. He's going to pretend like that didn't happen. His sister snatches the remote out of his hand and goes across to HBO Max. She puts on Roadrunner and Wild E. Coyote. That's a safe option. They've seen every episode of that. No surprise endings, no characters dying, and most importantly, they both like it. The episode opens the same as it always does. Roadrunner is out running around the canyon. Wild E. Coyote has a new plan. He's going to paint what looks like a tunnel into the side of the cliff and make Roadrunner run straight into it foolproof. But suddenly, his little sister has snatched the gun up off the sofa and is firing it here, there, and everywhere at the screen. But that look of horror is gone. She's laughing. No fair, he can't see what she's enjoying so much. It's just a normal episode. So he snatches the gun back from her and points it at Roadrunner. He squeezes the trigger. Bam! But Roadrunner just sidesteps the bullet and gives his trademark, meep meep. He fires again. Bam! 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 But every bullet seems to miss Roadrunner entirely, who dashes off into the sunset as out from the bush creeps a very injured Wild E. Coyote, bullet wounds all over his body. He scowls at the brother and trudges off down the road, walking straight into the fake tunnel he painted. After a moment, the brother breaks out in laughter too. This gun is amazing. What should they watch next? Who have they always wanted to shoot? What if they shoot a hole in the dome around Sandy the Squirrel's house? Or kill the Shredder? Could Sonic outrun a bullet? Or what about all those silly children's shows his sister watches? Could he finally get those characters to stop singing all the time? He's laughing so loud, in fact, that he doesn't hear the footsteps coming down the stairs. He doesn't realize Uncle S is there until the shadow falls over him. Having fun? The brother tries to explain as best he can, but the gun is already out of his hands. The TV is off, and the remote disappears into Uncle S's pocket. In a grump, the two children sit there bickering quietly until their mom comes to get them an hour later. 
That evening, Uncle S is doing the same thing he always does. He lies on the couch, feet kicked up, instant ramen in his hands. The news is on, running a lame story about the president visiting some kindergarten in the run-up to the next round of primaries. What a joke. Uncle S lies there seething, thinking to himself, as if that guy cares about any of those kids. If he did, he'd be clamping down much harder on the borders to stop foreigners from coming and ruining their futures. How are these true-blooded Americans going to have any chance in life when their own country is being overrun? He switches over the channel. There's some cartoon playing. He hates cartoons even more. He holds the NES zapper aloft. He's been carrying it around all afternoon for some reason. Imagine if it was a real gun. Without thinking, he points the zapper at the TV and pulls the trigger. Bam! A gunshot makes him jump out of his skin. Was that outside? He looks back at the TV. The cartoon character is ducking down at the bottom of the frame, a bullet hole in the wall behind him. Oh, thank God. He was just in the show. Not a real gunshot. The character wags a finger at the screen. Careful now, the character says. If you keep doing that, the SCP Foundation is going to come and get you. Huh? SCP Foundation? That sounds dumb. This is why he doesn't watch cartoons. Animation is for kids. He flicks back over to the news. The president is still surrounded by children. Imagine if he could just point this gun at the president, right between his smug little eyes, gently squeeze the trigger, and bam! The shot makes him jump so violently that he spills boiling ramen all over his chest. He howls and leaps to his feet, trying to shake all the noodles off. Great, that was his last t-shirt. He's been wearing it for four days now, didn't even need to wash it yet. What was that noise, anyway? He glances up at the screen, and his jaw drops. The President of the United States is lying dead at the front of the kindergarten classroom. Blood trickles out from under his body. Secret Service agents swarm around him, shielding him from view and yelling at the cameraman to shut that thing off. The news cuts back to a distressed anchor. She's trying to talk, but is so overwhelmed by what she's just witnessed that the words aren't really coming. A breaking news headline crawls across the bottom of the screen. Breaking, the President of the United States assassinated. No way. Uncle S drops the gun and stands there panting. He didn't do that, did he? No. No, of course he didn't. That was a coincidence, all it was, just a coincidence. If it was real, then he would point the gun at the anchor right now, pull the trigger, and bam! Her head rocks back. Blood sprays the back wall of the newsroom. The feed cuts out, and an ad break starts. It's some stupid infomercial. Only, the actors in it keep glancing nervously at the camera and slightly hunch behind tables and objects when they get the chance. Uncle S just keeps standing there staring at the screen all the way through the night. Two weeks later, Uncle S is running out of food. He ran out of ramen a couple of days ago, beans yesterday, and today he's having the last scraps of moldy bread. He hasn't left the house in all that time. He can't anymore. He's the most wanted man in the United States. Every night, the news is the same. His mugshot was plastered on the screen appealing to friends, families, witnesses, anyone to come forward and identify this man. Somehow, nobody has yet. His sister tried to call a handful of times, but he didn't pick up. Before long, he just disconnected his phone line entirely. The silence is better, helps him focus on his work. He's drawn up a list. In fact, he'd started to draw it up before he'd ever discovered the gun. On it are the names of every politician, business owner, media puppet, fake news spreading Illuminati shill he can think of. He just sits there hopping between TV channels, gun at the ready. He's got his laptop down here, too, and he just spends most of the day searching through YouTube for different videos of people he's been wanting to kill. He'd be lying if he said there weren't a few annoying YouTubers that had made the list, too. You know the ones he's talking about. The world is starting to fall apart out there. With the president gone, along with half of Congress and most major propaganda peddlers, it's all starting to unravel, just like he'd always wanted. The military is being drafted in to suppress riots across the country, but doing little to contain it all. Random shootings keep breaking out, leading to more and more chaos. It will be painful for a while, Uncle S knows that, but in time, they'll learn their lesson. He just wonders how long he'll have. He can't keep getting away with this forever. Something's gonna give soon. It's got to. They have his mugshot, they have his name, and yet, no one is surrounding his house. He knows that because he set up webcams all around the perimeter of the house. He has the live feed open on his laptop. If anyone comes within 20 feet of the property, they're getting a neat little hole in the front of their head and getting the back of it blown into a hundred red, pink, and white chunks to give his weeds a bit of iron. In fact, he knows they'll be on their way soon. He knows that 
because some rat from his blog will have told them. He's been documenting everything on here. Masking his IP address first, Uncle S has been recording and boasting about each and every kill anonymously as green text. At first, he kept it coy, writing in riddles and rhymes about the public figures he was murdering. But now, he is up to such a high tempo that they're just a bullet point list of names. Of course, his posts have all been flooded with trolls acting like he hadn't done anything at all, pretending like the president is still alive along with everyone else, photoshopping screenshots to make it look like they were getting new photos of these people. Great trolling, they almost had him doubting his own eyes at times, but every night, the news channels didn't lie. Another 232 public figures dead, shot through the head by an unknown gunman. But tonight, they'll be coming for him. The SCP Foundation. They'll be on their way. The characters on the TV have told him all he needs to know about them. He can't hide here forever. He almost wants them to come, really. He very explicitly made a threat tonight. A threat about a deadly surprise under the stadium at the Super Bowl. They're not going to ignore that. Any moment now. He's ready for the shootout. He has his webcam set up to cover every inch of his surrounding yards. Any SWAT team or SCP agent that gets close will get gunned down immediately. Their only option would be to hit him with a drone strike. And what a way to go that would be. No one would ever forget him. He'd be a martyr for the cause. They'd build statues in his honor. He licks his lips and stares at the feed. Nothing. For almost 45 minutes. Nothing. There, a shadow crosses the corner of the frame. Then another. A gun points into the shot. They're here. A team of them by the looks of things. He can see their shadows lining up along the sidewalk out by the front of his house. He'll wait. He's gonna wait for them to all line up nicely in the shot, then open fire. He's been practicing so much that his aim's gotten pretty good. Clean shot to the head, one by one. Now! Bam! 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 The gunshots ring out one after the other as he fires at the laptop screen. He catches each of the SCP agents cleanly through the head, one after the other. A couple break for cover, but there's no hope. Bam! 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 He picks each of them off. He makes sure to shoot the last man in the leg and sits quietly for a moment, watching him crawl across the lawn. Uncle S raises the barrel and points it at the man's head. He squeezes the trigger. Crash! The front door flies open and Foundation field agents flood his house. But how can that be possible? He just killed all of them outside the front door. He watched them die. How are they still here? He looks incredulously out of the front door into the yard. No blood, no bodies, no evidence of what had just happened. The SCP agents swarm around him, guns raised and barking orders. He snaps back to reality and panics, throwing his arms in the air and letting the toy gun drop limply to the floor. I did it. I killed the President of the United States. It was me. He starts crying as they handcuff him and press his face into the carpet. The agents question him, confused. What is he talking about? The President is alive and well. He's in the middle of his next election campaign, doing better than ever in the polls. I killed him. I killed them all. It was me. Again, the agents are perplexed. As the uniformed men drag him outside and throw him into the back of the van, he can't help but wonder why everything seems so peaceful out here. Where has his apocalypse gone? The doors slam shut. In this moment, I am very much hoping that no one viewing this video is in possession of SCP-674, or an equivalent weapon currently unknown to the Foundation. You see, while SCP-674, otherwise known as the Exposition Gun, poses no threat to me in the real world, it could have a nasty effect on your perception of reality. The Exposition Gun appears to be an entirely normal Nintendo Entertainment System zapper. As far as the Foundation can tell, it matches up perfectly with other models released in North America from around 1985. You can take the zapper apart, examine each plastic and electronic component individually, reassemble it, and you will fail to see anything out of the ordinary for this video game peripheral. And yet, if you were to hold this gun up to your screen right now, point it at me, and fire, you would hear a gunshot ring out and watch me collapse in my chair, dead. For the rest of the duration of the video, you would watch me sit here in silence. Videos would continue to upload to this channel, but each of them would probably just show my corpse as it slowly rots away in this chair. To anyone else, however, it would be business as usual as I uncover more horrifying, unnerving, fascinating, and bizarre tales from the SCP Foundation. The exposition gun only works on its user, forever altering the reality they perceive through whichever digital screen they fire at. 
If they shoot the president, as Mr. S did, then in the continuity of any news program they watch, the president will forever be dead. The same applies to fictional shows as well. If the main character dies off, a sidekick steps in to take their place, and the story changes accordingly. It is to be noted that each show or movie follows its own internal logic, however. The children were unable to shoot Roadrunner because he always gets away. But in classic cartoon fashion, all of their missed bullets ended up hitting a very forlorn Wile E. Coyote. In this context, however, the gun was proved not to be fatal, as in the universe of that show, explosions, electrocutions, falls from cliffs, and drownings can never kill the coyote. So of course, a gunshot would be no different. What is most interesting, however, is the gun's apparent awareness of the SCP Foundation. Users who fire the gun into the camera frequently will find characters soon breaking the fourth wall and warning them to stop it soon for fear of being caught by the Foundation. Perhaps most chilling and still unexplained to this day was Mr. S's ultimate demise. Between rounds of questioning, he was locked in a cell with a lone security camera watching him. Mr. S was observed conversing with the camera frequently, apparently hearing replies, though none could be heard in any of the recordings. Over time, these debates grew more and more aggressive until, all of a sudden, he was shot down in his cell. Researchers and agents rushed in, but were too late. Three 38 caliber bullets were lodged in his chest, with no evidence of a shooter in sight. The man died on the scene, and researchers have since been wary about experimenting too much with the exposition gun. The store manager had heard of crazy customers, but this was something else. A mob comes barreling towards the store, visible through the display windows as they charge down the street. They all look crazed, much closer in appearance to rabid animals than human beings, frenzying, foaming at the mouth. A few of them stumble in their haste while rushing for the automatic sliding doors. Some fall to the ground, only for others to clamber over them, leaping like athletes going over hurdles, with all the same speed but with none of the grace. To the staff inside the store, they look like a pack of zombies, all apparently infected by the same virus that had given them such a ravenous hunger. For savings! I thought Black Friday was a week ago, the trainee remarks as the doors slide open and the first of the mob spills inside. Welcome to the Mattress Madness Megastore, everyone. If you could kindly form an orderly... Within seconds, the trainee vanishes as a tidal wave of Madden Mattress Store customers starts to pile into the store. Each and every one of them is deranged. That much is clear, even from a distance. Across the store, the store manager watches as his colleagues are shoved and tackled out of the way, just from their misfortune of standing too close to the entrance. It's only as one of the mob wanders closer that the store manager notices their eyes. Both lids stay shut, somehow closed, despite the crazed customer standing upright. They aren't screwed tightly. It's clear this person isn't forcefully keeping their eyelids clamped down. Instead, they're gently sealed as if the customer is still asleep or sleepwalking. The whole situation was astounding. First thing in the morning, just at opening time, a horde of sleepwalking customers barged their way into the Mattress Madness megastore, moving and fighting retail staff as if they were all still awake and fully aware. And as if that isn't bizarre enough, it quickly turns out these people aren't here because they're eager not to miss out on great deals on their bedroom furniture. To the store manager's horror, the mob has come to the Mattress Madness Megastore for breakfast. He watches an elderly woman, eyes closed, shuffle up to a luxury cashmere pillow top California king-size mattress and proceed to eat it. And not bite by bite either, not even ripping off pieces to chomp through like so much cotton candy. In a far more horrifying fashion, the old lady eats the mattress whole. The store manager feels his blood run cold at the sight of her mouth widening unnaturally unhinging like a snake eating its prey. Except in this bizarre, unaired nature documentary, the snake is a human being, and its meal is a perfectly good bed that moments before had been resting on a stylish ottoman frame. The same exact display of confusing carnage is unfolding all over the Mattress Madness megastore, people devouring entire Egyptian cotton mattresses. Some had even already devoured their respective meals and were already moving on to any accompanying pillows or cushions, feeding on them in much the same way. The few members of staff bold enough to try and intervene couldn't seem to wake the sleepwalking shoppers up, no matter how hard they gripped each one by the shoulders and shake. Nothing could deter them from devouring divans and munching on memory foam. A sudden, terrifying, and inescapable thought cuts through all the confusion, striking the store manager with an even greater fear. The stock room. 
Behind a series of doors, marked with signs reading, Employees Only, are shelves upon shelves of new units. The Mattress Madness Megastore being a much bigger outlet means that there's additional inventory to replace any mattresses on the shop floor that gets sold, and more mattresses mean more food for the mob. The worry that these sleepwalkers might soon develop a taste for human flesh never occurs to the store manager. He hurriedly races around the store, gathering up as many of his surviving staff as he can, and urges them to help him defend the stock in the back room. Some are already abandoning their posts, ripping name tags off their polo shirt uniforms and rushing to leave the store. They aren't willing to die for $7.25 an hour. The Mattress Madness Megastore has insurance. It'll cover the damaged stock once the crazed customers have feasted on feather beds, but the manager urges them to stay. The store's insurance covers stock that is damaged in transit, not mattresses that are eaten by hungry lunatics. A few stay, using the manager's desperation to leverage pay raises and more annual vacation days in exchange for their help during this crisis of cashmere carnivory. With his resistance force gathered, the store manager commands the remaining employees to charge for the door at the back of the store, but some of the nearby mattress eaters overhear in their sleepwalking state. The staff freeze, uncertain whether to bolt for the stockroom and risk being chased by the hungry customers. They need a distraction, a sacrificial lamb to grab the horde's attention. And with a solemn expression, the store manager realizes what he must do. This isn't a fight he'll make it out of alive. He leaps up onto a twin inner spring and calls out to the crazed customers. Attention, everyone, he bellows. I'd like to announce that all our mattresses are half off for the next five minutes. The crowd goes even more rabid, all eager to eat the pillowy pedestal the store manager is standing upon. His staff flees in the opposite direction, rushing to barricade themselves inside the storeroom while their boss meets a grisly demise, and the crazed customers devour every remaining mattress in sight. But what on earth could have possibly caused such a scene to unfold? What was the inciting incident for this unprecedented act of mass matricide, the Devon destruction, and combination carnage? All it took was one seemingly innocuous image, an unassuming online post, to stir over 7,000 people into a featherbed feeding frenzy. It's December the 3rd, 2020, almost an entire day before the deranged events that would soon unfold at the Mattress Madness Megastore. And just like he does most days after college, the student is trawling various internet forums in search of things to laugh at. He's procrastinating and, through inaction, allowing himself to be buried under a veritable avalanche of assignments, all with rapidly approaching dates that they're due in by. But he doesn't care. He can always do them tomorrow. As far as he's concerned, there's plenty of time for him to waste doing, well, very little. But no matter where he looks, nothing brings with it even the smallest hit of dopamine. It's been hours since he stopped checking the clock at the bottom right-hand corner of his computer screen, instead wearing out the muscles of his finger as it spins the scrolling wheel of his mouse. His social media feed is all the same, more doom and gloom, and despite his searching, he can't find anything funny to alleviate his ongoing existential nightmare for so much as a second. If anything, seeing every anxiety-inducing post about the state of the world or dour headlines of reposted news articles only makes everything worse. That is, until the fateful link appears in his inbox. It's from one of his friends at college, living in the dorm across campus. The pair of them constantly swapped links and exchanged memes over direct messages, sometimes while sitting in the middle of important lectures. So the student quickly opens up the latest message from his friend, pleased to have something to relieve the monotony instilled by the prior several hours worth of mindless scrolling. Sure enough, his friend's message sits waiting to be read in his inbox. It's just a single blue hyperlink, with no additional context offered. Nothing to indicate what the link is, or what website it leads to, or even why the student's friend bothered to send it. They're long past the need to provide context for the memes they send each other. The link redirects to a familiar corner of the internet to the student, the deep-fried meme subreddit. Just seeing that written in the hyperlink is enough to spur an enthusiastic click. It's like going home back to somewhere warm and welcoming, where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came, and where the student knows he's bound to find something to entertain himself. A deep-fried meme is usually a heavily edited image with a number of different filters added to it. Its contrast is boosted, the picture is oversaturated and distorted, all to the point wherein the colors are unnatural, and the image appears as a grainy, washed-out mess of pixels. And they're one of the student's favorite subgenre of funny posts. Opening up the link sent by his friend, 
he finds one such deep-fried meme staring back at him. It depicts a man, long-haired and wearing dark clothes, presumably a fan of heavy metal music. In front of the metal head is a table with a chessboard placed neatly atop it. The pieces on the board are distributed in such a way that places the metal head in checkmate, and his opponent? Directly opposite him at the table is a glass bowl filled with water and a goldfish aimlessly swimming around. And to top off this Louvre-worthy masterpiece is text, seemingly cut and paste from various different places, judging by the alternating fonts and styles. The words have been placed into a sentence that reads, Tell me your secrets, fish. And the student explodes with laughter, as if answering his prayers for some humorous entertainment to avoid working on his college assignments, his friend had appeared out of the blue and delivered a perfect deep-fried meme. But that momentary boost in serotonin levels quickly subsides, and the student knows how these exchanges work. This has to be reciprocal, a mutual trading of memes, like for like, akin to swapping trading cards in the playground at a younger age. And so he searches the subreddit for a token worthy of returning to his friend. He clicks on a search filter, sorting the results from the top posts of all time to the most recent posts of the day. These were fresh, hot off the presses, or out of the deep fryer in this case. And the newer they were, the lower the chances that his friend had already seen them. Scrolling through, the student is met with a few underwhelming attempts that weren't worthy of the prestige expected by the deep fried meme subreddit. They'd be better suited for posting on R cringe. But then, it appears, the perfect, deep fried, crispy golden brown cooked to perfection picture to send back to his friend. The distorted image is a photograph of a bed, specifically a king-size mattress on what looks like a polished wooden bed frame, although it's not easy to tell thanks to just how grainy the picture has been made. Whoever edited this meme knew what they were doing and has nailed the absurdist, bizarre humor that the student and his friend thrive on. A label over the mattress simply reads, King Size, and the meme is captioned in a classic top text, bottom text format with the phrase, a feast fit for a king. And the piece de resistance, the crowning touch that makes this meme worthy of the student's lofty standards, is the title given to it by the original poster. It sums up the meme perfectly, succinctly in three words, eat your mattress. The student erupts into uncontrollable fits of laughter, so much so that tears start to stream down his face his stomach almost feels like it might explode at just how fine he thinks the post he's found is. Through giggles that hit like the aftershock of an earthquake, he copies the link to the Eat Your Mattress meme into a message and hits send to share the hilarity with his friend. Little does he know, he's just condemned his friend to the same fate that now awaits him. As soon as he falls asleep, it'll happen. And the student and his friend aren't the only ones either. The post spreads, either sent directly from one person to another or seen by those just browsing the deep fried meme subreddit and happening across the Eat Your Mattress photo. Not all of them find it funny. They don't have to. They aren't even required to share it, to pass it on to someone else and help the post spread like wildfire. They've looked at it and that's enough. Come the next day, an estimated 7,000 people across the world have seen the same meme and it affects them all in the exact same way becoming a directive, a command planted in their subconscious, one that they will act on without even realizing. It's been only a few hours since all the carnage erupted at the Mattress Madness Megastore, but by now, the SCP Foundation has swept in and taken control of the scene. A cordoned section of multiple blocks under the cover story of a dangerous gas leak, it's enough to keep civilians and prying eyes away without asking too many questions, but as for the Foundation personnel themselves, they've got plenty of unanswered questions of their own. Two members of the cleanup team are reviewing the store's security footage, baffled by the sights of the chaos that unfolded there earlier that same morning. On the screen, frenzied customers are eating entire mattresses, stretching their mouths wide open and swallowing them whole. They watch as the store manager appears to make an attempt at a noble sacrifice to distract the horde of ravenous customers so his employees can rush towards the storeroom. But the manager is fine. Once the horde has eaten all the mattresses out on the store's main floor, they start trying to break into the stockroom out back, where the other employees have used layers upon layers of cellophane-wrapped mattresses to barricade the door. By the time the Foundation arrives, the customers have already forced their way into the stockroom and have devoured around half of the mattresses while exhausted employees try to wake them from their sleepwalking state. The Foundation sees to it that everyone affected is rapidly administered with memory-wiping amnestics to forget all about the ordeal. 
Their next job is to try and track down the source of whatever caused this unprecedented outbreak of mattress eating. But being experts in all things anomalous, it doesn't take the Foundation long to start pursuing possible explanations. Having already confirmed this wasn't a viral anomaly, their next course of action is to investigate possible mimetic causes, and sure enough, a common factor quickly presents itself. The mob that attacked the Mattress Madness megastore, along with subjects who have engaged in similar acts of mattress eating across the world, all have one thing in common. Each one has been exposed to the Eat Your Mattress post on the Deep Fried Meme subreddit. It takes some deduction on the Foundation's part to figure out the cause, after all, the meme in question is similar to a number of others posted in the same subreddit. As a result, the Foundation's online detection software, or web crawlers, initially fail to flag the mattress meme as an anomalous image. Once they do, it is designated as SCP-5126. But with a cause established, the pieces start to fit together. The Foundation's researchers soon realize what the image does. Another reason it was initially missed is that its effects only occur once the subject that has seen it falls asleep. The student is one such subject who lived through this. He dozes off in his gaming chair well past the middle of the night, hours after he's first seen SCP-5126. While sound asleep, without waking up once, he starts to seek out his mattress, laying unoccupied on his bed on the other side of his cramped dorm room. He and all the others who have seen SCP-5126 then consume their mattresses, including in many cases their pillows, any cushions, and even plush toys. Their bodies stretch unnaturally to accommodate the meal, only to return to normal once they have done the deed. Having returned to normal, the student and the others like him remain unaware they've just eaten a mattress. But the Foundation is left puzzled. There's still one question that hasn't been answered. Their examination of the several hundred customers at the Mattress Madness Megastore revealed that the consumed mattresses aren't digested like food ordinarily is. They vanish without a trace. So this naturally begs the question, where are all these eaten mattresses going? Well, the Foundation quickly comes up with an experiment to find out. They place tracking devices inside of the cell of a member of D-Class personnel and expose him to SCP-5126. Sure enough, the meme takes effect, and once asleep, he eats his mattress. The experiment is going exactly as the Foundation planned. Now they can follow the signal from the tracking devices to pinpoint the destination that all the consumed mattresses are disappearing to. And after several sweeps of the Earth's surface, their satellites discover a ping coming from a remote location in the state of Montana. MTF Sigma-16 suit up, ready to head out to the location. This mobile task force operates under the code name Slumber Party, and it's up to them to investigate. They come across a large structure. It looks a lot like a medieval castle, but it has been built out of mattresses and large cushions. It's the ultimate pillow fort. It even has pillars and all the fortifications you'd expect from a real historical castle, all made out of even more pillows. The slumber party team enters the fort and quickly discovers that the structure is able to anomalously reconstruct itself. Sigma-3 kicks over a stack of pillows and plush toys arranged to resemble a statue and watches as it reforms after collapsing. The team ventures deeper into the pillow fort and is quickly met with humanoid entities that are also made out of pillows. An entity swipes a pillow arm at Sigma-1 but she ducks out of the path of the attack. Drawing her firearm, she fires, causing a plume of feathers to spray out of the pillow person. The entity is unfazed, and several additional shots do nothing. Even a taser is ineffective. The pillow entities are exhibiting extreme resistance to damage, but Sigma-2 has an idea. She grabs a pillow from one of the walls and uses it to bash the entity attacking her teammate Sigma-1. The pillow person collapses into a pile on the floor, inanimate, and just like that, the mobile task force has a way to fight back. They all grab pillows and make quick work of their attackers before they move on to explore the rest of the castle. Then they encounter the king. There is a man sitting atop a large stack of cushions, wearing a nightcap and pajamas, eating feathers from an expensive brand of pillow. Scattered around him are empty pillowcases. Trying to ignore the smell, the slumber party team attempts to interrogate him. He claims to be the king of cushion, obsessed with pillows since a young age. Their smell, taste, and texture inspire him to create a kingdom of plush, his masterpiece of mattresses. It doesn't take very long for the Foundation operatives to realize that this man is insane. 
They question him about how SCP-5126, the Eat Your Mattress meme, works. How is it able to make people consume entire mattresses and send them to the king's cushiony castle? And why? Well, the king explains that buying mattresses is expensive, so in order to build his castle, he's outsourced the gathering of building materials. As he sees it, he is offering people affected by the meme a delicious meal in exchange for their beds, spreading the world of pillows so he can gather resources for his kingdom. Suddenly, he challenges the slumber party team to a pillow fight for having tracked him down. The King of Cushion takes up a pillow in one hand and charges towards the mobile task force, armed and ready to do battle with them all. He is quickly incapacitated by Sigma-1's taser and drops to the floor defeated. Now designated SCP-5126-A, the King of Cushion is transported back to the SCP Foundation for analysis and containment. Their testing reveals he possesses no anomalous properties whatsoever, and the king actually requires his stomach to be pumped thanks to the copious amounts of pillow feathers he's been eating. The Foundation gets to work dismantling his pillow fort and moving all the components into storage. And as for the Eat Your Mattress meme itself, the Foundation's web crawlers are keeping an eye out for any other posts of the anomalous image. And don't worry, if you find yourself giggling at a funny deep-fried image that jokingly implies you should eat your mattress, the Foundation will ensure you don't remember it happening, and they'll even throw in a replacement for your swallowed mattress at no added cost. Now that's a bargain. What is it that you want? Not just what you want in this moment. That's fleeting. You get it and move on. Or you don't, and you forget. No. What do you want? What do you yearn for? That humming dissatisfaction that underscores every moment of your life. The constant rumbling, always beneath the surface, that you can never put your finger on. Behind your computer monitor, at the bottom of your $4 coffee, that quiet moment when you go to the toilet at a friend's wedding and look at yourself in the mirror, asking, why am I not happy yet? This moment, this object, this feeling that I was looking forward to, why does it feel empty? A night in with your best friends, a promotion at work, a new car, a new house, all empty. So when I ask you again, I want you to be serious. None of that fake surface level fleeting drivel. What is it that you want? What will genuinely make you happy? The words buzz around the student's head. He hasn't listened to a word of this lecture, not for a moment. Last night's therapy session had clearly struck a bit too close to home. He'd never expected this new therapist to be so direct. What was it that he really wanted? The student looks down at his laptop. He'd really wanted that. He'd spent months researching it, holding off on buying other models, waiting and saving up for the perfect computer. And here it is, with the same old boring lecture notes on the screen as his old one. Within a week, he'd been back online looking up new phones. Here he is, 21 years old already, and studying for a degree he doesn't really care about. Surrounded by happy, smiling students who are all clearly going to be far more successful and happy than he'll ever be. Beautiful people everywhere he looks. People who know how to dress well, know how to have a conversation, how to smile and laugh with friends, how to have friends in the first place. His therapist is right. What's he got to be happy about? That dissatisfied humming running through his life is steadily turning into a roar. What would actually make him happy? The more he thinks about it, the more the sense of dread creeps in. What has he actually got to look forward to in life? What can fill that void? The lecture is over. He hadn't even realized. Everyone around him is already on their feet, putting notepads and laptops into bags, chatting away with their friends. The student doesn't have anyone else in his row. He's somehow picked the only row in the lecture hall with just one person in it. No, that's not the case. This is the only row in the lecture with just one person in it, because he picked it. His only company on this row? A fly. A fly that had been following him around all week. What's the point? He looks at his laptop screen. Empty. His phone buzzes. It's his mom. He declines the call. Swinging his bag onto his shoulder, the student makes his way to the door. A group of guys up ahead are chatting loudly as they open it. One of them half glances back over his shoulder. 
He stops in the doorway, holding the door open. The student looks around. No one else was with him. Who's this guy holding the door open for? You okay? The guy asks, looking straight at the student. His eyes are very blue. The student rushes through the doorway, muttering a thank you on his way through. His phone starts to ring again in his pocket. He sits up alone that night. He does the same most nights. Even if he wanted to, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Sharing a house with seven other people, there's a party happening in one part of the house pretty much every night. The thumping bass is the only sound to reach the student as he sits quietly at his window, looking out at the bags of trash lining the street and the couple across from him arguing on their porch. The little fly in his room is the only one keeping him company, not buzzing around or trying to escape through the glass, just sitting there next to him, watching the world go by. What is it that you really want? The words ring around in his head again. Tell me what will make you truly happy. What is it? I think… I think I just want someone to love me, the student says quietly. He sits quietly by the window for a few more minutes, not noticing as the little fly next to him catches fire and rolls onto its back, legs curled in the air. The student just goes to bed. Nothing's ever going to change, is it? A week later, the student is back in that same lecture again. He arrived early this week, sitting down and unpacking his stuff a good 15 minutes before they were due to start. Surreptitiously as he can, the student glances over at the door every time he hears it swing open. It's the usual procession of beautiful, happy people, each one dressed exactly how they want, personalities, goals, and aspirations filling each of them. He looks down at his outfit. Gray. The lecture starts, but the student still can't quite focus. He keeps his head half-turned towards the door the whole time, waiting. Ten minutes go by. Nothing. He slumps down in his chair and starts taking notes, just as the door softly creeps open behind him, making a gentle hushing noise on the carpet. The student turns. There he is, the guy from before with the blue eyes. The student tries his best to swallow his grin. He's the only one in his row. If he can just get the guy's attention, maybe he'll come and sit with him. But no, that's a stupid plan. Why would anyone want to come and… The bag lands in the seat next to him. The student turns to see those same piercing blue eyes. Anyone sitting here? The guy whispers. The student opens his mouth to reply, but the words get stuck. After a second, he manages to shake his head. The guy with the blue eyes grins and sinks into the seat. After a moment, he asks if he can borrow a pen. That's funny. The student can see a pen right there in the side pocket of the guy's bag. Why would this guy choose to sit with him? There are plenty of free seats in this lecture hall. They're everywhere. One thing's for sure, the student definitely can't talk to this guy afterwards. No way. He's too weird, it'll be obvious. No one ever wants to have a conversation with him. Everyone he talks to is always sidling their way out of the room after just a couple of minutes. Besides, what if this guy finds out what he's really like? That he's been seeing a therapist. Not just a therapist. That would be pretty normal. Normal people do that. No, what if this guy found out that his therapist was a fly? A fly that had been following him around, that he'd been talking to every night before bed. A fly that had been asking him what his deepest desires were. A fly that he'd woken up to find dead and burnt on his windowsill this morning. Nope, no way is he going to have a conversation with this guy. It would just be a disaster. There's no other option. He has to call his mom. As soon as the lecture is over, he'll call her and deal with whatever it is she has to say. He takes the phone out of his pocket and stealthily gets his mom's contact details up, ready to hit the call button as soon as the lecture finishes. There, the final slide. The student hits dial and immediately turns away from the blue-eyed guy next to him, getting up and putting it to his ear. He shoulders his bag and marches out of the lecture hall, not looking back until he reaches the little square of grass outside where he sits. His heart doesn't stop hammering until he's sitting there. His mom takes a long time to pick up. When she does, it's clear that she's been crying. Not this again. The student swallows and prepares for her to start ranting. Only she doesn't. Instead, she just asks where he is and if she can drive over and get a coffee with him. He says yes, hangs up, and looks down at the phone, brow furrowed. What she got to say to him this time? A shadow falls over him. Turning, the student just sees two blue eyes. The guy is holding out the borrowed pen, a gentle smile on his face. His mom doesn't come for coffee in the end. Instead, she invites herself over to his house. It's the first time she's visited. As they make their way up all the flights of stairs to his floor, the student holds his breath, waiting for her to start complaining about the cigarette butts, ashtrays, and pizza boxes lining the hallways. But she doesn't. She doesn't say a word. He closes the door to his room behind her and she lets out a sympathetic little sigh looking around. 
He probably should have tidied first. Here it comes. He can feel it. She's about to start lecturing him on his dirty clothes, leftover dishes, his unmade bed. But no, she just quietly picks up a sweater and starts folding it. Then another. As she tidies his room, she shoots him a sad little smile. This house really won't do. He explains to her that it's all he can afford at the moment. Well, then let me help you so you can find somewhere better. What's going on here? He doesn't know how to react. This is surely one of her games. Any second she's going to lash out at him. But no. She just gently brushes the dead fly off the windowsill into the trash and turns to him. They stand across the room from each other, the same way they always have, eight feet between them, plenty of space, not too close. She closes the distance and pulls him in for a tight hug. As his mom buries her head in his chest, he notices for the first time how short she really is. Has she always been that height? Didn't she used to tower over him? Her muffled voice speaks into his chest, right into where his heart is beating. I'm so sorry for how I responded before. I didn't know what to say. You're my son, and I'm proud of you. I always have been. You love who you love. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Even your silly old mother. For a long time, the two of them stand there, crying together. It is a busy week moving everything into his new apartment. It's still a pretty basic place, but at least it's his own. The neighbors are quiet, the street is clean, and there are no flies. By the time the student sits down for his lecture, he's completely exhausted. He barely registers the bag landing on the floor next to him and the guy sitting in the seat. He's so tired, in fact, that the conversation catches him off guard. He hadn't prepared anything to say. But suddenly, they're talking. About the weather at first. It's sunnier now. Then about the class. Then why they chose to study here. Then their teenage years. Then their homes and families. The lecture starts, but the two of them keep muttering away to each other in hushed tones. The student cracks a joke, and the guy with blue eyes laughs. Properly laughs, he isn't just being polite, he actually found it funny. So funny that the lecturer tells the pair of them off, which just makes them laugh more. Is this what it's like? To be one of the beautiful, happy people? Days go by, and the student wakes up every morning expecting it to be over. He's going to wake up any minute now and he'll be back in his old house with a talking fly waiting for him by the window. But he doesn't. It's sunny, day after day, week after week, no flies in sight. He calls his mom. He doesn't just pick up the phone to her, he actually starts to call her. He goes to parties, discovers he likes white wine, and finds out what it's like to have a bit too much of it. He has his first kiss and opens his eyes to see a pair of perfect blue ones staring back at him. He makes friends, more friends than he can count. Friends who text him asking to hang out, who help him move house, then move house again, and who fill up rows and rows of seats the day he gets married to the man he loves. The man who loves him back. Is this what it feels like? Is this happiness? Maybe, just maybe, this is it. Until one day, the man wakes up. Everything's perfect. The sun is still shining, he can hear his daughter's squeals from downstairs, his world is still happy. Except for one thing. His ear hurts. Not that much, but there's a little something, a kind of dull itch deep in his ear canal. The other ear starts to hurt as he makes his morning coffee. He should probably go to the doctor about it. He'll book that this week. But by that night, he knows he probably shouldn't wait any longer. He lies awake deep into the night, feeling his lungs tightening. You're not supposed to feel your lungs, are you? But it's not just his lungs, it's his throat too, and his bowels. All of a sudden, his stomach starts convulsing. He throws off the sheets and rushes into the bathroom, not quite making it to the toilet. His vomit splatters across the tiles. He must be getting delirious. That can't be right. It looks like his vomit is moving, wriggling, and crawling. His husband appears behind him, switching on the light. The two of them stare in horror at the writhing maggots covering the bathroom floor. The x-rays and MRIs paint a grueling picture. Each progressive scan over the next couple of days looks worse than the last. What had once been healthy flesh and organ tissue steadily has deeper rivets chaotically eaten into it. The maggots work their way through the man's throat, lungs, stomach, sinuses, ears, bowels, and urethra. In some places, they run out of flesh and end up burrowing their way out of the surface of his skin. By the time the maggots mature into flies, the man is on his deathbed. Excessive blood loss, organ failure, and multiple infections have worn his body down to a husk. There's nothing left to be done for him. All that the man's husband, children, mother, and countless friends can do is stand by and watch, as one by one, thousands of flies emerge from the body of the man they'd once loved so dearly. Heartbreaking as it may be, 
This is the sad reality of what you sign up for when you make a deal with SCP-3063, known informally as The Fly. This SCP on the surface seems like one of the most harmless that the Foundation has encountered, taking the appearance of a common house fly. It has no extraordinary physical properties, nothing apparent to distinguish it from any other fly, and yet, it is one of the most powerful entities with an apparent ability to somehow alter reality itself. It is believed that SCP-3063 only exists in one instance at a time, though this is very difficult to prove given the sheer number of flies that exist around the world. As soon as one instance of SCP-3063 dies, a new one seems to manifest in a random location. Naturally, this makes studying the fly very difficult indeed. As far as the Foundation is aware, the fly communicates with its human target telepathically. It interrogates them, trying to discover what they want most in the world. It will then offer the individual that exact thing. If they refuse, it will make increasingly grand offers, tempting them with greater and greater promises until they accept. When I said this was one of the most powerful known SCPs, I was not exaggerating, because this fly does not make empty promises. Do you want to become a millionaire? You might wake up tomorrow to a number of anonymous bank transfers or a handful of lottery tickets pushed through your letterbox. Do you want to become an opera singer? The next time you sing in the shower, you'll find a whole new voice coming from your chest. Who knows, you may have left the window open and a superstar agent could be strolling by your house at that exact moment. Whatever it is that you tell the fly that you want, it will be granted. The little insect will catch fire and die straight away, appearing somewhere else in the world, ready to start talking to someone else. Your answered wish may not always take the form you expect, but it will be given to you. Just like our student finding love everywhere he went for the next six years. Or, to be more precise, 2,376 days. You see, as soon as you make a deal with this fly, the clock is ticking. For 2,376 days, you will be free to enjoy your dream coming true, no strings attached. Until one day, you wake up with a little bit of discomfort, like something growing inside of you. Eggs, anything from 5,000 to 20,000 in number, will suddenly appear throughout your body. In your digestive system, respiratory system, and even your muscle fibers, small maggots will be born comprising all known to Terra species. They will steadily eat away at your body, feeding their way out of you and growing into regular adult flies as they emerge. Most individuals die from multiple organ failures during this stage. It can often be difficult to identify the exact cause of death as the attack on the body's central systems is so absolute, devastating, and swift. If the individual dies before the 2376th day, then the process is halted and the flies die along with them. Attempts to contain SCP-3063 have all proven unsuccessful. To date, six members of SCP Foundation personnel have been targeted by the fly. Each of them have tried to make a different wish to contain the fly, but each has had a loophole exposed. Senior researcher Elizabeth Gao requested the death of SCP-3063, which the fly interpreted as the death of that manifestation, combusted and returned in another instance. Senior researcher David Roberts asked for the permanent containment of SCP-3063. The fly then stood totally still, allowing itself to be taken into secure containment below Site-63. But sure enough, after 2,376 days, the researcher died and the fly was discovered to still be manifesting around the world it again had interpreted its containment to refer to just that current instance of its body. A later researcher requests knowledge of how SCP-3063 functions, at which point the fly combusted and a document containing all known information about SCP-3063, everything I am telling you now, appeared before the researcher who later died. The penultimate test conducted by SCP personnel proved to be the most chilling. Dr. Patrick McGann asked the fly if it could provide clear, understandable knowledge of SCP-3063 other than knowledge currently possessed by the SCP Foundation. The results of that exact experiment and the next one were provided for him, including details of his own death, which he immediately fulfilled. Either the fly has some precognizant abilities or is able to directly control events in the world, or both. The final experiment was conducted even though the fly had already provided the results in detail ahead of time. Dr. Jonathan Mabry simply asked, is there even a choice, before suffering a severe pulmonary embolism and dying on the way to the hospital. Research indicates that SCP-3063 has been operating for over 4,000 years, with evidence of instances being discovered as far back as early Canaanite settlements. However, many theorize that the fly has been with us a lot longer than that. 
Unless future containment efforts are more successful, SCP-3063 will likely remain one of the most powerful and prolific entities outside of containment. So next time you see a fly buzzing around your room, it might be in your best interest to leave it alone. A woman runs through a house, screaming and crying for help. She looks behind her and catches a glimpse of a shadowy figure in the next room, and it's coming towards her. She screams again and runs in the only direction she can to get away from it, up the stairs. She runs into the bathroom at the top of the stairs and locks the door behind her. She is breathing heavy as she quickly takes stock of her situation. There's a window, but it's much too small for her to fit through, and even if she could, she'd probably break her neck trying to drop to the ground below. There's no way out. She's trapped. But she has an idea. She takes a deep breath, giving herself a brief moment to gather her courage before she unlocks the door and opens it. She steps onto the landing and spots what she's looking for, a telephone on a small table. But then she also sees the shadow of the thing chasing her coming up the stairs. She runs to the phone and picks it up before running back into the bathroom again. She shuts the door behind her and starts dialing 911, but just as she's about to dial the last number, the phone is ripped out of her hands and slams against the door. She runs to pick it up again, but when she does, she finds that the cord has been cut. There's got to be something else she can try. She rushes to the medicine cabinet and starts searching for anything she can that might help her. She frantically looks for something, anything, but is startled by a loud noise. She turns to see the door bulging on its hinges again and again. Her pursuer is trying to kick it down. She goes back to searching the medicine cabinet. There must be something she can use. The woman closes the medicine cabinet, and for a second, time seems to stop. She stares at herself in the mirror, a look of confusion on her face. She mouths the words, help me, to herself in the mirror. The door suddenly bursts off the frame and slams to the floor. The woman spins around holding the only thing she could find, a toothbrush. Her pursuer steps through the now empty doorway. He's a large, terrifying looking man with wild yet focused eyes, and he's holding the biggest knife she's ever seen. The man approaches and the woman cowers in fear. He pauses for just a moment, admiring himself in the medicine cabinet mirror and smiling, seemingly very happy with how this entire scene has unfolded. The man then raises the knife above him as the woman holds up the toothbrush as if it will somehow protect her but it can, and the man brings down the knife again and again and again. This murder may have occurred over 40 years ago, but its memory is more alive than you might think. Sometimes what happened in the past doesn't stay there and finds a way to repeat itself again and again and again, though maybe not in the way that you expect. So join me, Dr. Bob, and find out exactly why SCP-987 is known to the SCP Foundation as the Gruesome Gallery. SCP-987 is a collection of 13 different wall-mounted mirrors of varying shapes and sizes, which have been designated as SCP-987-A through M. Over half of the collection consists of medicine cabinets, but the others range in size from small makeup mirrors to full-length mirrors, with the largest measuring one by one and a half meters. The aesthetic style and materials used indicate that all the mirrors were produced between the 1940s and the 1990s, and there's nothing about their construction or immediate appearance that would give the impression that they are anomalous at all. Photos and video of the mirrors also show them to be perfectly normal mirrors, with the surfaces reflecting exactly as you would expect. In all, it appears at first glance that these are completely normal mirrors, though more in-depth research into the mirrors has been made difficult. You'll see why later. SCP-987 mirrors will finally reveal their strange and unnerving characteristics when a person stands directly in front of them and looks at their surface. When they do, they won't see their reflection as they expected, but an image of a completely different place. It was theorized by researchers that these locations being shown were the mirror's previous location, and research into the origins of the mirrors have revealed the original locations of mirrors C, K, and M, which confirmed this theory to be true. But the mirrors don't just show a static location. When someone looks directly into the mirror, they will see an entire scene play out, one that always depicts someone's extremely violent and or gruesome death. Each mirror depicts a different scene and location, though most of them appear to take place in a bathroom of some kind. The scenes shown vary in length, with the shortest being just 48 seconds and the longest running for over four minutes. 
after the scene finishes, it will simply start again like a video that has been set on repeat. But the strange qualities of SCP-987 don't stop there. After the video loops and repeats itself twice, the images will start to change. The person in the mirror who is about to suffer a horrific death will seem to become aware that someone is watching them through the mirror. They will often begin soundlessly pleading with the viewer to help them, growing more emphatic as the scene evolves. If there is an aggressor present in the scene, they too will sometimes seem to become aware that they are being watched through the mirror, and may even appear to interact with the person who is watching them by making hostile gestures or writing on the surface of the mirror. Three of the victims portrayed on the glass of SCP-987 mirrors have been identified, the previously mentioned SCP-987-C, K, and M mirrors. SCP-987-C depicts a well-to-do 62-year-old male in the bathroom of his California home in 1968. The man is bound and kneeling on the floor when a young Asian woman dressed in lingerie enters the room and proceeds to strangle the man to death. The scene will repeat one time and then begin to change. In this instance, the woman will usually stop at the mirror after she enters the room to reapply her lipstick. She will then kiss the mirror, leaving a red imprint on the glass before asphyxiating the man on the floor. When looking into SCP-987-K, the viewer will see a 34-year-old man in the hallway of his home which has been identified as being in Maine during the early 2000s. The man is standing on a ladder while he installs a new chandelier in the ceiling. After a moment, the man loses his balance and becomes entangled in the elaborate lighting fixture. As he struggles to compose himself, he accidentally pulls a length of electrical wire from the ceiling that becomes wrapped around the man's neck as he falls from the ladder, leading to him being simultaneously strangled and electrocuted. When the scene repeats and starts to change, the man will appear to become more and more apprehensive about his task, and his final moments will become more and more painful looking. His wife will sometimes enter as well to find his dead body suspended from the ceiling before the scene ends and starts to repeat. SCP-987-M shows a 20-year-old woman in the bathroom of a hotel room in New York City in 1978. The woman is seen to be reacting to an aggressor who is outside the view offered by the mirror. The woman looks afraid and will try to run out of the room, but a man in a denim jacket rushes the woman, stabs her in the abdomen with a knife, and flees. The woman falls to the ground and dies almost instantly. When it repeats for the third time, the woman will attempt to communicate with the viewer prior to the aggressor entering the scene, but she will appear inebriated and will struggle to communicate clearly. If SCP-987 was simply a collection of mirrors that displayed the final moments of individuals and changed on repeat viewings in odd and frightening ways, that would be strange enough. But there's even more to this bizarre SCP. In addition to the mirrors is SCP-9871, commonly referred to within the Foundation as the Curator. SCP-9871 is an invisible entity, visible only to heat-sensitive cameras that takes up roughly the space of a two-meter tall person. The area it occupies is endothermic, meaning it drains the heat from nearby objects, in this instance from ones that are roughly one to two meters away. It has also demonstrated the ability to manipulate objects up to eight meters away that weigh as much as 150 kilograms. SCP-9871's primary behavior is to move along the ground, going from mirror to mirror in an apparently random pattern. It stops in front of each mirror for roughly 30 minutes before moving on to the next. It only engages in this behavior when alone, though, and if anyone is present, it will maintain at least a 3-meter distance from them at all times. The only exceptions to this occurred when staff attempted to do anything to the mirrors other than gently clean them. If the mirrors are tampered with in any way, SCP-9871 will react quickly and aggressively, making any physical research into the mirrors difficult, if not impossible. Both SCP-9871, as well as the collection of all 13 mirrors, have been classified as Euclid, and are currently contained at Research Site 14 in an airtight 5 by 12 by 3 meter chamber with concrete walls that is itself enclosed in a Faraday cage. The chamber is monitored at all times by both standard and thermographic cameras, but despite this, there have been several instances of SCP-9871 seeming to breach containment and disappear for short periods of time before reappearing in the containment cell. On at least five known occasions, SCP-9871 dissipated from both the normal and thermal imaging cameras. In each of these instances, when it reappeared, a new mirror materialized as well which has led to the Foundation's original collection of 13 mirrors growing to 18 in total, 
and it seems likely that this number may continue to increase. While in most cases, SCP-9871 returns with a mirror that depicts a death that occurred long in the past, in one especially chilling instance, the 9871 entity disappeared a full 15 minutes before the death took place. When it returned, it had the mirror depicting the freak accident death of a man being killed by his own chandelier. Whether SCP-9871 had any hand in this death, or perhaps even all of the deaths, is currently unknown. What does seem likely is that the presence of the mirrors in Foundation control is the only thing that keeps SCP-9871 in containment, at least most of the time. But be careful the next time you're performing a dangerous task and notice that a mirror is in view. You never know who, or what, may be watching. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, and be sure to subscribe as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.